Okay, good morning to everyone, and welcome to this morning session of the conference, uh, Materials of Empire. Let me first of all thank uh, Simona Troilo and, and uh, Beatrice Falcucci for the kind invitation to chair this morning of, uh, of works, and I pass immediately to introduce you Matilde Segalas. Uh, Matilde is a PhD candidate for the University of Geneva. She is doing a thesis on the history of the archaeological excavations in Ur from 1922 to 1934 by studying the relationship between the circulation of the antiquities discovered and the development of appropriation narrative to the description made of the objects in Great Britain and in the United States at the time. She is also a collaborative member of the research project Rockefeller Fellows as Heralds of Globalization, working on the archives of the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, Matilde will present us a speech about the antiquities of war, circulations, imperialism, and appropriation during the interwar period, 1922-1934. So please, Matilde. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being here, and thanks for the organizers for the invitation. So my communication today will be uh, on the antiquities of ore circulations, imperialisms, and appropriations during the interwar period, 1922-1934. I will try in the time that I have to demonstrate the imbrication between circulation and imperialism of both uh, men, women, and antiquities, and uh, that it represents a first step into the appropriation narratives that will be developed around the objects while integrated them into Western Museum collections later. I will mostly focus on the British side of the expedition, uh, and I will open a bit to uh, the US at the end to bring further topics of my research that I also consider related to imperialism. Uh, archaeological excavations uh, during the interwar period were organized cyclically, at least for ore, and every year was following a similar timing. I will organize my presentation by tracing back these cycles, first with a focus on the team and the fieldwork, then on the antiquities and their circulations, and finally on the strategy of appropriations. So first, a few words about ore. Um, Ur is a site situated in southern Iraq. Uh, it is considered as the city of origins of Abraham with an important biblical and imperial signification. It is one of the reasons the museum selected it for the uh, expedition. Its geographical position was an advantage to circulate uh, from both Baghdad and uh, Basra. And the site was excavated by the British Museum in London and the University Museum in Philadelphia. The time frame of the excavation was 12 years from 1922 to 1934, and it covers the period of the British mandate and the early uh, years of independence of the country, uh, in, uh, which was in October 10, uh, no, third, sorry, 1932, uh, which generated important changes in. Um, yeah. Uh, in uh, terms of regulations of the antiquities regarding the exportation of uh, the objects. The director of the expedition was Leonard Woolley, uh, and the rest of the team was changing almost every year according to which part of the site uh, they were excavating and whether they needed an architect, an epigraphist, uh, or a cuneiformist, for example. And Leonard Woolley was the one who produced most of the written archives um, around the excavation, and it, it is on this corpus that I am basing my research. So the first important thing before getting uh, any permit authorization to dig a site in Iraq um, and to go there was to gather enough funds to go and uh, cover a few months of excavation. British Museum and University Museum were sharing the budget. Uh, the University Museum was paying uh, two-thirds the first two years because British Museum was offering financial advantages related to the mandate and the empire. And I will explain this all along to, uh, into my presentation. But after 1924, they decided to uh, share equally the budget. And once the budget was ready, uh, the team um, would travel from the United States and Europe to be at or at the beginning of November or the beginning of December for the last seasons. The seasons were from November, December until uh, March, mainly for weather reasons, because after dust, um, not allowed to, to dig. They were most of the time traveling separated, apart from uh, the Woolies. 
and would convene together on a specific date in Beirut or Aleppo or directly in Baghdad. The team was using different types of transportation to reach the excavation site, alternating between train, boats, and car. They were um, embarking in London by boat, then from France take a train to Marseille, taking a boat again to Beirut, um, and then taking a car to cross the desert from um, either passing by Aleppo or direct to Baghdad, and then taking the bas Baghdad bus la railway line um, to Or Junction, uh, which was the stop to get to Or, and then the car uh, again into the desert. So it was a long, um, a long way to, to get into the excavation. And also uh, they were hiring some um, four Arab foremen who were commuting from Jerablus in Syria uh, to um, Iraq six months a year. So the team was coming from a lot of uh, different places. And in his memoirs, Max Malawan, senior assistant uh, of the Ur excavation from 1925 to 1931, described his first arrival at the site by train. He pointed out that he traveled for 12 hours from Baghdad to Ur Junction in, I quote, a Pullman car on Indian type rails. Once there, he recounted his impression of the archaeological site and of meeting all the members of the team, including, a, I quote again, a drunken Indian cook who seemed to belong to the community of Catholic Indians settled in Ur Junctions. The presence of an Indian community in southern Iraq can be explained by the involvement of the British Indian Army on the battlefront in Mesopotamia in World War I. And it also related to the British imperial expansion attempts over southern Mesopotamia at, and the Persian Gulf during the 19th century by the establishment of a massive network of merchants, both British and Indians, and in several strategic cities to secure informal domination over Mesopotamia and to protect India that way. And this has been uh, demonstrated in scientific literature by uh, Priya Sadia and Guillemette Cruze, this imbrication of imperialism uh, and the beginning of uh, the British mandates. So British, man, uh, British domination over the region became official with the mandate of the League of Nations. Um, and we can observe in the daily life management of the archaeological excavation that it has um, implications and it brings a lot of advantages. So the city of Basra, for example, was an ideal geographical location to maintain connections with Delhi and London. The city represented a strategic point um, within the commercial, transport, and communication networks between the different regions of the British Empire. Having become a military base between 1914 and 1918, yes, sorry, the authorities decided in 1919 to transform and extend the infrastructure to make it a commercial port and boost the economy in Iraq. And the port of Basra was administered by a directorate under the aegis of the government of India, which was responsible for the maintenance of a large majority of the ports of the Persian Gulf in the interwar periods. These port facilities linked Iraq to numerous sea and land routes, and it was one of the advantages uh, for ore. First, it was easy to connect, to connect through the mail services, and communication uh, with London and Philadelphia was really important uh, with the excavation because, because it was a long one, 12 years, but also because um, Leonard Woolley was sending at the end of every month a field report, and this field report is the start of uh, the communication around the antiquities. And because he was producing a lot, you can see the evolution of his own narratives about the objects between the field report, the newspapers, and then the scientific articles. And so the communication while on the field is, is the first way to describe the objects that were discovered, but also to, to um, satisfy the museums with the discoveries. And something that we've seen a lot uh, since yesterday um, are photographs or uh, the objects and the antiquities. And sometimes we forgot that it, these photographs are related to a lot of material to transport and bring. And on these slides, you have um, an example of bills that have been purchased in England and sent to Basra. And this is 
uh, Norton and Gregory Limited Company. It's sta stationary. So it is all the materials to draw the objects and make the catalog and bring the colors uh, because you were having the index card to represent uh, the objects and then the catalogs that was uh, both um, uh, drawings and, um, sorry, um, I have th um, the way they were registering the objects, and it was uh, catalogs that were uh, um, given at the end to <clears throat> the Department of Antiquities in Iraq, to London, and uh, to Philadelphia. But I didn't have managed to find one <laughs> uh, since the beginning of my research. But you also have another bill, yeah, for. Um, I don't know if you see, but case of photo plates to take the pictures on the site and to be able to promote the antiquities and to send the photographs to the press. And this is something that is also related to the materiality of the objects. It's how they were, uh, they were, uh, the diffusion was organized around them. But to get back to the transportation, uh, transportation was also used on the site itself. Once established in the Iraqi desert for several months, the team was using locally a car, which was a second-hand Ford Vanet, so American cars reached Iraq before World War I, and they were mostly remaining uh, because of the war. And uh, the um, Woolley got recommendation from one of the owners of the Nairn company to buy a car in Iraq rather than Syria because it was cheaper. And the Nairn company was created by two Australian brothers who set up in the Middle East to develop convoys of cars and trucks for the transport of goods and people and were covering the overland motor routes and the expedition team was using their services to travel from time to time but also to get a car on the side. So you have all these little elements of the whole British Empire having, um, having settled uh, in the Middle East. And I would like to comment this, uh, the picture you have here uh, for a few seconds because you can see on it rails and uh, carriages at a close distance from the dig. So these rail rails have been installed on the site under concession of the Iraq railways. We were honorary agents of the excavation with the Anglo-Persian oil company. These two honorary agents represent, in a way, this British evolving imperialism from the railroads and the way they have been established before the war to the influx of oil companies in the 1920s. So you have oil for the car, rails for the carriages, and the purpose was to help the transportation of the earth and uh, the antiquities fur further away from the site, close to the expedition house where the objects were stored uh, until the end of the season. So what I wanted to show with this first part on the field um, was that um, the whole infrastructure of the empire and its extension, while the mandate um, with the mandate was serving the discovery of the antiquities and their exportation. Um, I will continue now by focusing on the objects themselves, how they were selected and how they went out from Iraq. And the study of the circulation of antiquities highlights these infrastructures as well, as well and reinforces the idea that um, some sectors have, um, of the mandate served new purpose with uh, ar archaeology. So the antiquities were discovered under the law of antiquity of June 1924. The law was written by Gertrude Bell, the first and British director of the Department of Antiquities in Iraq. It took up two years for the law to be ratified because of the opposition of Iraqi ministers. The law was stipulating that an ancient site should be excavated by a scientific team, not only individuals anymore. Um, and under an official permit. But the main problem was related to the division of the items um, and their exportation. Gertrude Bell, who was serving Iraq, but also British, um, suggested an equal division by half, one half for the archeologist and then the museum, and one half for the Department of Antiquities. The Iraqis were against it uh, and more in favor to keep the previous law under the Ottoman Empire, which bans the exportation of any objects. Um, and the law of antiquities, in a way, is an example of continuity and ruptures with two empires at stake, one in dismantle and one who's trying um, to survive because it's, it's the beginning of the decline of, of the British Empire at the time. And the law was finally ratified under the terms of Gertrude Bell with a division by 50. Um, 
and the division was organized at the end of each season in March. The director of the Department of Antiquities was coming from Baghdad with another person who was supposed to play a neutral part in case of disagreement regarding one pieces. Um, and from 1922 until 1931, the directors were British. Uh, 1931 to 1934, uh, they were German before the first Iraqi, Sadi al was appointing in 1934, uh, after the independence of the country. The neutral person, when his identity was mentioned, was also British, which means that the antiquities were selected by free European individuals who had the power to decide which objects would represent the best future Iraqi heritage. In one of her letters to her family, Gertrude Bell, at the time director of the Department of Antiquities, wrote in 1926, after four seasons of division, um, yeah, um, I'm getting much, uh, quote, I'm getting much more knowing with practice. I now can place cylinder and other seals at more or less their comparative date and value so that I don't choose widely according to prettiness but can take my full share of the best thing I list, I hope so. Um, so this example echoes in a way the theory of Alice Stevenson about the minor antiquities with uh, the fact that archaeology, who by knowing better the scientific and economic value of the objects, might have played down during the division to get the most valuable objects more easily and would recognize their actual value later once the antiquities were secured for exportation. And so we can see that the, the antiquities for Iraqi side have not been chosen based on their history meaning or their scientific um, signification. And the division of the antiquities was subject subjective according to the director deciding and Iraq have, might have lost many objects during the first decade of the mandate that they would have preferred to keep. And for example, a decade later in 1934, Sadi al was dividing the antiquities on the side of Tel Asmar and had an argument with uh, the archeologist. Sorry, I forgot to say something. Uh, what I wanted to say is that um, once in 1934, Gertrude Ball was dividing at Kish, and she gave a milking scene to the director, Langdon, saying that she was already having one from Orr. And coming back to my example, 1944, um, the argument was uh, about the fact that the Iraqi museum was already having seven examples of bullheads from Ur, and Sadi al uh, replied to Henry Frankfurt in Tel Asmar that each head was different and deserved to be in the museum, and so they, they would not uh, leave Iraq. So we can see a difference between the approach and the way uh, heritage was uh, selected and, and embodied something. And the Iraqi Museum opened in 1926 in Baghdad uh, and the antiquities taken by the Department of Antiquities uh, were um, put in it and for Ur they were traveling from Ur Junction until Baghdad by train and um, at the end of, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but um, it is written that the most valuable um, antiquity of, of that season have been taken uh, by the director, not to be sent in boxes, but put in linen and used as a pillow to protect it in the train. So you, you have yeah, th these kind of uh, things happening. So once the division was over, the antiquities were packed into boxes. Uh, the material necessary for the preservation of the boxes during transport was providing um, as an annual loan by the Royal Air Force for the wooden boxes uh, and by the British Cotton Growing Association for cotton to protect the objects from possible shocks during the various embarkations and disembarkations. In the archives, there is monthly statement of accounts and um, the ones of February and March have an additional item related to the cost of the packing. The cost was most of the time less than five pounds, but for example, in 1927, there's a massive discovery, a lot of antiquities circulating, and thus the cost uh, is up to 20 pounds, for example. And um, they were not paying uh, a lot to the transport from Ur Junction to Basra by train. Then the boxes were stored in the docks until they were loaded into a ship bound for uh, London. From Basra, the expedition did not pay any fees to the Iraq government for the exportation of the antiquities by sea. Um, the passage was free and uh, they were only paying for the cover insurance. 
The company that was most of the time taken was um, Mrs. Uh, AFC Strict and Company Limited, mostly because they were having safe room on their boats that could give another security to the objects. This company was also recommended by Crown agents who were using um, it when objects had to be watched for diplomatic reasons. This could explain the choice of moving the boxes um, of antiquities by ship rather than the mainland by train. And I, I don't know if it's clear enough, but um, on the document on the, on the left, uh, you can see the different places the objects travel. So from London to Basra, um, but also from Bristol to the British Museum, from Baghdad to Orr. And what I really try to, to, to do with my research is to emphasize the circulations in poor old way, rather than just focusing on exportations because the objects were traveling a lot and not, and even Iraqi objects went to London to get restoration, also for loans. Um, you cannot see, but there's an item for airmail, um, airmail uh, uh, expense, because sometimes for, for loans they were using the diplomatic airmail to, to be sure the object would not have um, any damage, because it would have a lot of uh, consequences for the relationship between British and Iraqis, because the the Iraqis were more and more doubting about the, um, the authenticity of the objects that were coming back to Baghdad after all these, um, these uh, travels. So the multilateral trajectories are really important to understand why and how the, the, the narratives around the antiquity and how people starting to, to care for them um, and develop some, some appropriation feelings um, is part also of, of the sorry transport, transportation is also part of, of the of the of the story. Um, so sorry. <laughs> At the end of the fieldwork opened a new period of time for the team um, and the antiquities. The team was reaching England at the end of March or beginning of April, while the antiquities were arriving in London in May or June. And as I just said, this time difference is important because the team would prepare and advertise the arrival of the antiquities. And I will now get, now get to my third point about um, the narratives. As the organization of the season was uh, following a cycle, it was the same for communication around the antiquities. The six months out of the field work were very active. The team was working on the objects, either to restore or to study them, to prepare exhibition and publication. First thing to know is that Leonard Woolley was having exclusive contract with some newspapers in the UK, especially the Times and the Illustrated in London News. In the US, the articles were shared with, the, with press agencies, but New York Times and Philadelphia newspapers would have the priority to publish them. Um, the articles, I used the word, the word that they were shared because Leonard Woolley was sending the draft to the newspapers, so he was writing two to three version of, um, of content, a short one for press agencies and longer one for the Times or for the exclusive newspapers. And the directors in London and Philadelphia was, would receive them and coordinate on a release date for the news to appear at the same time, sorry, both in the UK and the US. So the newspapers were starting to release articles on the discoveries at or from January while the work was still going on until May or June. By writing himself the draft of the newspapers, um, articles, Woolley was in a way controlling the content of what was shared about the excavation and the antiquities and when. It is through the newspapers' articles that the populations will have a first idea of the antiquities and will develop an imaginary around them before they would maybe go see them at the temporary exhibition who were also advertised on the radio and on the newspapers. Woolley had an interest in to arouse the curiosity of the public and create attachment to the objects and the stories, something he was making by modifying the field reports into newspapers' versions. So the story of Ur relies on, on ancient empires with nu numerous kings and dynasties from uh, Sumer and Akkad. And the narratives in the newspapers were oriented to this content, to the story of who were the people from Ur, where, who the objects were belonging to, and to reinforce this link between ancient and new empires. Um, on the left, 
the article of the Times were published under the Imperial and Foreign News section. So the, archaeologist, the archaeological research in Iraq was, was advertised under an imperial uh, thing. Um, archaeologists would spray this imperial vision that combines modernity as a mean of uh, reviving the splendors of the antiquity. And archaeology represents the association of material culture, imperial power, and rereading the past in the modern era. The choice to explore biblical archaeological sites and to provide, through the antiquities discovered, traces of Sumerian and Akkadian empires for ore was based on the will to maintain a strong imperial consciousness about the British. That is, it's something that has been um, theorized by Billy Millman, and I quite agree with, with this when you study all the newspapers. Um, and the antiquities on display in museum in the United Kingdom would embody the evidence that empires have endured for centuries and millenniums in case of Mesopotamia, and the desire for the British Museum to do the same. In the US, uh, the focus was more on um, the biblical aspect from the draft to the published version of the articles. It is possible to observe the difference and to notice that the US newspapers were modifying a lot the content to have something very sensational and advertising. And you can see obviously the difference between the choice of titles. This is something that Leonard Woolley was never suggesting. The newspapers were free to decide uh, which element would be on the headline and British and uh, United States were not um, thinking of a title the same way. Um, with a little um, deeper analysis, there's way more superlatives and biblical uh, themes in, in newspaper in title from the New York Times from that rather than from the Times. But aside from the press, Leonard Woolley was, uh, would also uh, lecture and even broadcast story about or during the summer, a temporary exhibition was taking place at the British Museum, and he was the one writing um, the, the catalog for it uh, to, to uh, help the visitors to, to discover the objects. The team would organize private tours to important individuals um, and supporting the excavation, such, such as the trustees or the patrons. And at the end of the summer, the exhibition was over. The antiquities would leave for the US to Philadelphia uh, to have the temporary exhibition as well during fall and winter. The shipment of the antiquities from the UK to the US was no more under imperial advantages and university museum would pay the bill to get the uh, antiquities uh, over the Atlantic. In September, the new season was starting for the fields um, and the cycle would follow on. Uh, but because the team was studying the antiquities over the summer, the scientific articles would be published in journals only in October and December. That way, from January until December, something was constantly published around or either scientific or popular. And that way, the, um, your curiosity was aroused um, all over the year. <clears throat> Sorry. Finally, to understand the importance of the two cycles I've just described, the circulations and transportation and the communication, um, which are obviously related, it is important to look at the financial aspect of the expedition. The two museums were relying on donations and private contributions uh, to what was called the Joint Mesopotamian Fund. The budget was established on a yearly basis, which means that once the season was over, the institution were searching for money to secure the year after. Woolley himself was under a precarious status. He was not employed, but got a mandate from the museums, which means that uh, once the excavation uh, was done, he would have not any income anymore. And it explains a lot why he was continuously producing content about um, or during 12 years to secure the renewal of the excavation and to secure as well his position. So you can see among the private contribution two emblematic patrons uh, over among others, uh, G.R. Ogden for the UK and John D. Rockefeller Jr. for the US, both very much into religion and biblical faith. And the scientific literature, um, some historians of archaeology are considering biblical archaeology as another form of imperialism. In that sense, patrons and their expectations might have influenced the, nar the narratives built up around the discoveries and the antiquities to be biblically related, to be sure that they would send money the year after for the excavation to follow on. 
And there is this famous example of Ur with Wooly visiting the site of Kish, I already mentioned, and having a conversation with the director of fieldwork, saying that he was reaching a new stratum and was wondering whether the humid aspect could be related to the flood. In the end, a week later, Wooly went to dig that deeper in his own site at Ur and declared that he found evidence of the flood and Noah's story. The press got viral. It has been proven since that the evidence was wrong and that it was just more a sensational thing rather than a really scientific uh, proof. So to conclude, uh, by tracing back the chain of actors, patrons, team members, transportation, insurance companies, curators, and more involved in the excavation of Ur, the aim is to recontextualize the setting of the excavation and how the discoveries and the narratives around the antiquities might have been influenced by external factors and expectations, which means that today we are still remembering Ur for its biblical signification while it might have been biased from the very beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matilde, for your very, very interesting relation and that showed that the, the, in the deeper the, the aspects of the, the organization of the, um, and the communication of this, um, this incredible um, archaeological adventure. I think it will be a lot of discussion over this paper. Thank you very much. And now um, uh, I, I call please to the desk uh, Stefan Anastasio. Um, Stefan Anastasio is uh, um, uh, an archaeologist of near eastern archaeology. He is uh, now keeper. I'm doing them. Simultaneous translation, per, uh, apologies, uh, of the archaeological deposits and um, of the catalogation and digitalization of the photographic archive of the Superintendenza Archaeologia Belle Arti e Paesaggio of Florence. Uh, did a lot of um, excavations and field surveys in Italy, Toscana, Sardinia, even outside of Italy, Syria, Turkey, Jordania, and published the various monographies over and articles on the uh, Iron Age ceramics and of um, um, archaeology or architecture and on the history of the research in Italian research in the Near East. Now is preparing the publication of the photographic archive of Islamic architecture um, of uh, Creuswell in Creswell, sorry. <laughs> um, that's now is in the Beganser Library of the Harvard University in Florence. Uh, we, he will present a paper uh, or about the expedition Italian, archaeological Italian expedition in Transfer of Dania, 1927-1938, archaeology and um, uh, um, policy in Italy during the fascist regime. Um, f there is a synopsis, an English synopsis, the paper where the speech will be in Italian. If you need the English synopsis, you will find there at the corner of the desk. Thank you, and thank you. Solo due parole per i colleghi stranieri. Uh, yes, I, I'm going to talk in Italian, but uh, I've prepared a synopsis. Uh, you should already have it, uh, and uh, it is organized according to the slides, so I, I hope it helps. Detto questo, ringrazio Simona Troilo e Beatrice Falcucci e tutto lo staff della conferenza per la possibilità di essere qui oggi a parlarvi degli archivi della prima spedizione italiana in Transgiordania. Eh, ho scelto questa immagine di copertina perché secondo me è molto significativa, contiene tutti gli elementi chiave per capire il contesto in cui si sviluppò questa ricerca. È una fotografia scattata nella primavera del 1930 sulla cittadella di Amman in occasione di una visita agli scavi da parte dell'emiro Abdallah che vedete qui, da poco re del neonato regno di Transgiordania. È una fotografia interessante perché tutti i personaggi occupano delle posizioni che di fatto riflettono il loro ruolo nella vicenda. Infatti l'emiro si vede la ah, non si vede qui l'indicazione. Comunque l'emiro è al centro, ma di fatto solo perché è circondato da tutti gli altri personaggi e in particolare i due che rappresentano gli interessi europei nella regione 
cioè il dottor Fausto Tesio vestito di bianco, il direttore dell'ospedale italiano ad Amman e Sir Reginald Head, un ex ufficiale britannico agente in quel momento formalmente dipendente del Dipartimento delle Antichità, si trovano proprio sullo sfondo come a sovrintendere, a controllare la scena. C'è anche l'archeologo Renato Bartoccini che però vedete è un po' in disparte, un po' separato dal gruppo. Ed infatti l'archeologia in questa, come in altre spedizioni simili del periodo, paradossalmente non giocò un ruolo da protagonista, come vedremo. Ora, conviene forse molto brevemente ripercorrere le tappe di questa eh, attività archeologica italiana nel Medio Oriente nella prima metà del, del secolo scorso. Un primo tentativo di organizzare una spedizione archeologica in Mesopotamia si ebbe già nel 1910, quando venne preparato lo scavo di Ctesifonte, questa importante località vicino a Baghdad. Tutto era pronto, ma nel 1911 scoppia la guerra italo-turca e quindi il progetto non viene mai portato avanti. Per avere uno scavo archeologico ufficiale in Mesopotamia dovremmo aspettare vent'anni con lo scavo di Kilizu, vedete qui, nel Kurdistan iracheno, ma di questo parleremo poi. Esiste un'altra spedizione archeologica italiana importante nella regione, precedente a quella di Bartoccini, che è la spedizione in Anatolia, spedizione dalla storia lunga, complessa, qui basti dire che negli anni 10 del Novecento l'Italia decide di, di lanciare una grande spedizione in Anatolia con base ad, ad Alia, oggi Antalia, sulla costa de, meridionale. È una spedizione molto lunga, complessa, però alla, fi alla fine non si concretizzò mai nessuno scavo archeologico ufficiale. Poi nel 21 con la salita al potere di Mustafa Kemal, il nazionalismo turco, il cambio degli equilibri politici, venne definitivamente abbandonata. Veniamo quindi alla spedizione in Transgiordania. Questa fu di fatto la prima italiana a effettuare eh, scavi archeologici regolari nel Medio Oriente. Inizia nel 1927 con una spedizione guidata da Giacomo Guidi e poi subito dall'anno successivo viene diretta da Renato Bartoccini, che vedete qui sullo scavo, fino al 1938, quindi sono 11 anni di missione. La prima domanda è, ma perché uno scavo italiano in Transgiordania? Allora, dalle carte di archivio appare chiaro che i motivi principali di questa scelta furono due. Da un lato la possibilità di lavorare in una regione archeologicamente poco affollata, proprio c'è scritto, rispetto ad esempio alla Palestina, dove c'erano molte spedizioni, soprattutto britanniche, già operavano. Poi il nuovo regno di Transgiordania, nato nel 1922, sembrava un territorio promettente per Roma, per, per un'espansione comunque economica, commerciale, quindi la spedizione archeologica era vista principalmente come una pripista di questa presenza italiana nella regione. Ed era una missione totalmente controllata dal Ministero degli Affari Esteri. Questa dipendenza è evidente nelle carte, per esempio qui vi ho riprodotto un telespresso, una nota mandata dal sottosegretario del Ministero degli Affari Esteri a Roberto Paribeni, che era il direttore del servizio di spedizioni archeologiche nel Levante, e si riferisce proprio alla alla nomina di Bartoccini a direttore della missione. Sentite cosa gli dice? Gli dice «Nessuna missione all'estero può essere fine a se stessa, ma specialmente oggi deve, a mio parere, servire forse più alla politica generale che alla sua finalità tecnica. È per questo che credo doveroso dare preventivo avviso di quanto sopra, onde sia ben chiaro al nuovo dirigente della campagna archeologica e questi possa qui giungere senza alcuna erronea concezione della sua missione». Difficile essere più chiari di così. E Bartoccini lo capì benissimo, perché fu un fedele esecutore delle indicazioni del Ministero degli Affari Esteri. Bartoccini fu, oltre che un archeologo, un grandissimo fotografo. Eh, siamo negli anni in cui la fotografia, che è arrivata sugli scavi archeologici già dalla metà del secolo precedente, però in questi anni inizia a essere utilizzata sistematicamente per documentare gli scavi. E Bartoccini è uno di questi pionieri. Eh, ha lasciato più di 2000 fotografie del, di questa spedizione. 
si trovano in un archivio oggi conservato all'Università di Perugia, un archivio tra l'altro che curiosamente è sempre stato noto, sempre stato conosciuto, fu donato dalla figlia all'Università, però era sempre rimasto ignorato. Qualche anno fa con una collega Lucia Botarelli l'abbiamo studiato, catalogato e pubblicato. Ed è un archivio molto interessante perché è variegato, contiene molti documenti scritti, i diari di scavo, gli appunti, ma anche lettere, poesie, e poi mappe, disegni e soprattutto fotografie. Quindi è un caso studio veramente utile per ricostruire la storia di, questa, di una spedizione come, come quella in Transgiordania, che comunque è simile a altre che si sono avute nella regione. E gli scavi si concentrarono ad Amman, nella cittadella, nell'acropoli, che probabilmente alcuni di voi hanno, chiunque sia stato in Giordania, eh, difficilmente non l'ha visitata, perché è una delle mete turistiche principali che eh, si trova nella capitale. Qui vedete in questa foto de, della Royal Air Force, la cittadella proprio nel periodo degli scavi, vedete si... si in primo piano è in un paesaggio quasi semidesertico, quindi una situazione leggermente diversa da quella attuale in cui, vedete, la cittadella ormai è inglobata, affogata nella metropoli moderna. Bartoccini scavò praticamente tutti gli edifici, tutti i monumenti che ancora oggi vedete se visitate la cittadella, tranne la grande moschea che fu trovata dopo, tutti gli altri vennero scavati dalla missione italiana il Tempio Romano, il Palazzo Maya dell'Islamico, una bellissima chiesetta bizantina e così via. Io però non vorrei parlare qui eh, dell'aspetto prettamente archeologico, perché non mi sembra il tema principale. Faccio un'unica eh, eccezione per farvi vedere un monumento. Questo, ah, no, tra l'altro vedo ora che non si vede la... forse facendo... ok, scusate il Tempio Romano, il Palazzo Maide, ecco questo edificio che forse intravedete qui, ma che vedete meglio in questa diapositiva, è un edificio interessante, cosiddetto Audience Hall, era praticamente una sorta di anticamera al Palazzo dell'Emiro. È, è un edificio importante anche nella storia dell'archeologia giordana, perché è stato il primo islamico, cioè non romano, o medievale crociato, il primo grande, importante, ad essere restaurato per i turisti, per i visitatori. E infatti all'inizio di questo secolo una missione spagnola ha operato un restauro filologicamente accuratissimo che ha prodotto questo, che però è qualcosa di diverso da quello che era effettivamente giunto dall'antichità. Nella foto sopra vedete l'inizio dello scavo, lo stesso lato, la stessa facciata. Io penso sia sempre utile far vedere queste fotografie perché mi sono reso conto che L'opinione comune è che il maggior rischio che corra un monumento archeologico è sempre legato alla sua distruzione. Però chiunque abbia lavorato sul campo sa che accanto a questo rischio innegabile c'è anche quello della ricostruzione, anche se è un termine che non viene mai usato perché il restauro è comunque più elegante. Però ecco, i risultati sono anche questi e peraltro questo è un restauro filologicamente accuratissimo. Comunque, come vi dicevo, io non vorrei parlare dei monumenti, ma del rapporto politica-archeologia. Allora, da questo punto di vista io penso che ancor più che, le, che gli scavi siano interessanti le ricognizioni effettuate da Bartoccini in, in questi dieci anni. Lui fece almeno tre gite, proprio le chiama, probabilmente almeno quattro però, e non solo nei dintorni di Amman, ma anche in Siria, in Palestina, in Libano, fotografando, fotografando, fotografando. Le fotografie di queste ricognizioni si trovano per lo più all'Università di Macerata. Qui vedete una mappa dei siti visitati, l'elenco. Quella che interessa a me adesso è Petra. Petra, conoscete tutti, il sito archeologico più famoso della Giordania, era famoso anche negli anni venti. Qui vedete una foto attuale di uno dei monumenti e accanto in bianco e nero la foto scattata da Bartoccini, che infatti effettuò dei sopralluoghi nella regione. Qui invece vedete una mappa redatta da Carlo Ceschi, l'archeologo dell'architetto della spedizione, con la zona principale. Si tratta di un progetto di cui tra l'altro si era persa completamente memoria, è stato recuperato solo grazie alle carte dell'archivio. E nell'archivio cosa si, si, si capisce? Si capisce che alla fine del, nella seconda metà del 1938 
Roberto Paribeni, quello che vi ho citato prima, col benestare se non con proprio la, la spinta del Ministero degli Affari Esteri, propone a Bartoccini, che a sua volta coinvolge Ceschi, un progetto faraonico, cioè il rilievo sistematico e la catalogazione di tutti i monumenti di Petra, cioè una cosa impressionante, che chiaramente avrebbe dato lustro all'Italia, ma poneva delle, delle difficoltà pratiche non indifferenti. Ora, quale sia stato l'atteggiamento di Bartoccini non è chiaro, comunque Bartoccini non era personaggio da discutere in alcun modo ciò che gli veniva detto di fare da Roma. Ceschi invece, che aveva un carattere, insomma si capisce dalle lettere, ben, ben definito, diciamo così, e soprattutto aveva una competenza d'architetto straordinaria. Ecco, l'archivio di Ceschi sarebbe un archivio veramente da studiare, anche perché lui non ha lavorato soltanto a Petra. E cosa succede? Praticamente gli chiedono di produrre questo progetto e lui lo produce. Ed è un progetto straordinario. Io mi occupo dell'archeologia e dell'architettura, vi garantisco, è un progetto modernissimo, è articolato in 4 o 5 campagne con una fase preliminare di studio e di documentazione, sopra luoghi ben calibrati col lavoro poi di laboratorio, anche alcune idee assolutamente innovative, ad esempio si prevede una campagna fotografica sistematica a colori, che oggi può sembrare banale ma per il 38 non lo era, ma perché si capisce che il colore è fondamentale poi per qualsiasi intervento di restauro. L'unica cosa che trovai subito strano, un po' sorprendente, erano i costi. Questo progetto costava tantissimo. Mi ricordo la prima attività di, di documentazione preliminare veniva a costare 60.000 lire. Insomma, siamo qua nel 38, siamo in pratica già quasi in un'economia di guerra. Però leggendo il resto dei documenti si capisce perché. Ad esempio, qui vi ho riprodotto una lettera che Ceschi scrive a Bartoccini. Sentite cosa gli scrive. Carissimo Renato, ti accludo copia della relazione che ho rimesso oggi a Sua Eccellenza Paribeni, perché tu ne sei informato e possa regolarti in merito. Ho cercato di far capire che non si tratta di una bazzecola e che è inutile parlare di un primo apprezzabile risultato. Un'impresa simile o si porta a compimento oppure è meglio non cominciarla neppure. E poi ci vogliono quattrini, personale, perché non ho nessuna intenzione di andare laggiù a grattarmi. Se parlerai su eccellenza per i beni, fagli capire anche tu che tra il lavorare ad Amman, dove si pranza al ristorante, e il lavorare a Petra c'è una bella differenza sotto tutti i lati. E inoltre che le difficoltà dei rilievi in verticale su facciate di grandi dimensioni sono ben superiori a quelle che possono presentare i rilievi di scavi e ruderi praticabili. Quest'ultima parte, meno pittoresca, ma densa di significato per chiunque conosca il lavoro, poi siamo nel 38, quindi non è che facevano le ortofoto o cose del genere. Quindi in pratica cosa succede? Roma vuole questo progetto, Ceschi lo produce, lo produce anche bene, ma cerca in tutti i modi di far capire che forse sarebbe il caso di lasciar perdere. Ora, quali sarebbero stati gli esiti di queste manovre non lo sappiamo perché di lì a poco l'Italia entra in guerra e quindi la missione viene abbandonata. Però mi sembra interessante questo aspetto, cioè di un Ministero degli Affari Esteri che è, come dire, più realista del re e, e propone agli archeologi dei progetti di archeologia che gli archeologi stessi cercano di, di frenare. Quindi abbiamo visto, sia pure molto velocemente, le tre grandi spedizioni nel Medio Oriente di questo periodo, quella in Anatolia, quella in Transgiordania e quella a cui ho appena accennato in Mesopotamia. Può essere utile confrontarle, perché in fondo sono nate più o meno nello stesso periodo, sicuramente con gli stessi obiettivi, simili risorse, simili strumentazioni. Hanno avuto anche simili risultati? Ecco, da questo punto di vista, dal mio punto di vista, no, assolutamente. E questo non tanto per le differenze leggere nei contesti, nella cronologia, ma soprattutto per il diverso atteggiamento dei singoli archeologi impegnati nelle ricerche. Eh, quella in Anatolia, dal punto di vista dei risultati, fu la più evanescente, non che non abbia prodotto niente, però co considerando anche la sua durata, il finanziamento che ha avuto, il numero di archeologi e architetti che si sono eh, occupati di questa missione, alla fine ha prodotto qualche assistenza archeologica a ricognizione dell'Istituto Geografico Militare, qualche scavo clandestino che è servito solo a irritare le autorità turche che infatti non hanno mai rilasciato una concessione di scavo e poi sì, vabbè, 
la, il restauro della porta di Adriano ad Antalya, qualche altro monumento, però rispetto all'impegno è, è, è un po' poco onestamente. E il motivo di questo è chiaro, cioè che in, nel caso di questa spedizione tutti gli archeologi e gli architetti coinvolti furono fedeli esecutori delle indicazioni del Ministero Affari Esteri, cioè l'aspetto archeologico era molto ridotto. Per questo mi sembra esemplare il passaggio della prefazione che Biagio Pace, vedete la foto qui a sinistra, che è stato l'archeologo più rappresentativo di, quelli, di questa spedizione. Sentite cosa scrive Biagio Pace nella prefazione di un libro dedicato alle ricerche del 1915. Dice... Io, che ho potuto percorrere con una certa larghezza la regione, reputo pertanto mio dovere di cittadino contribuire modestamente a questa conoscenza. E dichiaro subito che, sebbene abbia visitato il paese per studiarne gli avanzi delle antiche civiltà, vi parlerò il meno possibile di cose antiche e molto invece come meglio proprò di cose moderne. Ora, se questa è la, la prefazione di un libro sulle ricerche dell'archeologo più impegnato, poi uno non si meraviglia in fondo se se i risultati sono stati dal punto di vista archeologico quelli che sono stati. Molto diversa invece è la situazione relativa alla spedizione in Mesopotamia, su cui mi soffermo poco di più anche perché offre degli spunti e dei confronti maggiori con la Transgiordania e oltre al fatto che avendola studiata la conosco meglio. Eh, lo scavo venne organizzato qui, vedete, a Chilizzo, il nome antico di una località che si trova vicino a Erbil, nel 1930 con una prima ricognizione destinata a individuare le località da scavare, le località da scavare, che poi si, si concretizzò appunto nello scavo di Chilizzo svolto per un'unica campagna nel 1933. In questi anni è professore di lingue semitiche antiche a Firenze Giuseppe Furlani, questo vedete sulla, sulla sinistra, massimo esperto dell'argomento, che quindi viene eh, designato direttore della spedizione. È un linguista, è un filologo e quindi gli viene affiancato per il lavoro sul campo un giovanissimo Doro Levi che vedete qui sulla destra, destinato nel dopoguerra a diventare uno dei maggiori archeologi italiani e che a quel tempo era ispettore alla soprintendenza dei Truri a Firenze, lavorava all'archivio all fotografico dove appunto ho lavorato anch'io. Ed è lui che conduce la ricerca sul terreno, ed è una fortuna, perché Doro Levi, oltre a tanti altri meriti, fu un grande pioniere anche lui nell'uso della fotografia sullo scavo. In questo fu molto simile a Bartoccini. Ed è una fortuna perché la documentazione dello scavo e della ricognizione è andata perduta durante la Seconda Guerra Mondiale, con una storia tra l'altro molto particolare, che però ci porterebbe lontano. E ciò che resta e che ci permette di ricostruire qualcosa di questa spedizione sono proprio le fotografie scattate da Doro Levi. Eh, pochi anni fa ebbe la fortuna, proprio fortuna, praticamente quindi ci sono inciampato sopra, su, di ritrovare l'album fotografico originale di Doro Levi di questa spedizione, che era illeggibile perché coperto dal fango alluvionato nel 66, però dopo un lavoro di restauro magistrale compiuto dai colleghi della Biblioteca Nazionale ha restituito più di 200 fotografie di questa spedizione che venne effettuata in tutta la Mesopotamia. Vedete qui vedete una pagina, poi ho fatto vedere solo lo ziggurat di Ur, ho scelto questa anche per riallacciarmi alla presentazione precedente, come era nella foto del 30 di, di Levi, come diventa poi, questa è una foto del, degli anni 70, sempre il solito discorso fatto prima. Le foto sono importanti anche per lo scavo perché appunto sono conservate a Firenze e hanno sul retro tutta una serie di indicazioni scritte in brachigrafia, quindi sono state complicatissime da interpretare, ma che permettono di ricostruire tutte le provenienze, le associazioni dei vasi. Allora, la cosa interessante di questa spedizione è che Levi visita tutti i monumenti noti dell'Iraq e alla fine indica, c'è una lettera conservata al Ministero Affari Esteri, una serie di località ideali per lo scavo e queste sono tutte nel sud, sono vicine alla capitale, raggiungibili, hanno resti romani che sono quelli che interessano. Lo scavo, eh, con buona pace della sua ricognizione, viene organizzato invece a Chilizzo, che si trova nel nord, in un posto irraggiungibile, non c'è traccia di resti romani e già questa è una, 
è una, una cosa che sorprende. La campagna di scavo però per fortuna è ehm, ricchissima, viene scoperta una necropoli anche con resti d'età romana, cioè partici quindi interessanti per quelli che erano gli scopi della missione e nonostante questa dopo un anno viene chiusa, anche lo, lo scrive proprio Mussolini, si autorizza la seconda campagna ma senza finanziamenti, quindi praticamente, e tra l'altro è interessante perché c'è una lettera di Furlani grondante retorica e anche coraggiosa a Parigi perché gli scrive lamentando il discredito che l'Italia avrebbe avuto nei confronti delle altre potenze europee che malgrado le difficoltà continuano mentre invece noi abbandoniamo l'impresa e nello stesso tempo Paribeni scrive al console italiano a Baghdad dicendogli di mandare qualcuno di corsa alla baracca a vendere pale picconi e carriole senza avendo cura di non coinvolgere lo Stato italiano per questioni di decoro. Quindi c'è proprio una fuga precipitosa da questa missione e uno si può chiedere perché. Allora, secondo me la risposta si trova negli archivi dell'ENI, l'ente nazionale idrocarburi, che contiene il fondo dell'AGIP, Agenzia Generale Italiana Petroli, l'agenzia che si occupava delle ricerche petrolifere in quel periodo. Ora, molto velocemente, anche perché comunque è stata una ricerca che non ho potuto approfondire quanto avrei voluto, comunque dalle carte dell'archivio si capisce che nei primi anni 30, non prima, l'Agip decide di tentare un progetto di trivellazioni petrolifere nella regione in cui si trova Chilizzo. Ecco quindi che malgrado la, la, il lavoro faticosissimo fatto da Leli nel 30 nel deserto per individuare tutte queste altre località viene mandato a scavare nel nord allo stesso tempo è noto il fatto che nei primi mesi del 34 quando la situazione in Iraq è peggiorata e eh, comunque l'Agip credo trovi un accordo con gli inglesi con, per abbandonare insomma, questo suo progetto il progetto di trivellazioni viene chiuso, ecco quindi che anche eh, malgrado i risultati ottenuti, malgrado l'aspetto scientifico, la missione viene chiusa immediatamente. Qui vedete tra l'altro la foto di un album che per me è molto interessante, perché è la foto dell'album fotografico di Carlo Zammatti, personaggio importante della nostra storia economica, perché poi fu il direttore generale e il liquidatore dell'Agip, che però a quel in quegli anni era un tecnico che compiva le ricognizioni ed è quello che va a fare le ricognizioni petrolifere e realizza un album fotografico interessante anche per i monumenti rappresentati che è in tutto e per tutto simile a quelli di Doro Levi. Quindi qui una situazione opposta ad esempio a quella del progetto di Petra, di là c'è una spinta del Ministero Affari Esteri a fare anche più di ciò che l'archeologo vorrebbe fare, qui invece c'è l'archeologo che riesce a ottenere risultati strabilianti ma la ragione di Stato diciamo così, chiude immediatamente la porta alla ricerca. Quindi sintetizzando cosa possiamo dire? Possiamo dire che la ricerca archeologica italiana nella prima metà del secolo nel Medio Oriente è una ricerca certamente subordinata in tutto e per tutto alla, alle ragioni di politica estera, che però in modo diverso, in misura diversa, a seconda dei casi, a seconda dei personaggi coinvolti, produce dei risultati, produce dei risultati scientifici, ora non l'abbiamo visto, ma insomma gli scavi soprattutto in Transgiordania e a Chilizzo hanno offerto dei dati fondamentali e produce una documentazione importante nelle fotografie e non solo. E sono quindi risultati che sono alla base di quello sviluppo dell'orientalistica archeologica italiana che nel dopoguerra, soprattutto a partire dagli anni 60, ha dato vita a una stagione di scavi molto importanti. Ebla è probabilmente il più famoso, ma non è certo l'unico. Ora, questa stagione, chiaramente ne, ne, negli ultimi anni, si è, se non proprio interrotta, estremamente rallentata. Ora c'è una ripresa, ma insomma c'è stato uno stop. Noi dobbiamo immaginare, dobbiamo sperare però che col mutare della situazione questa possa riprendere. Da questo punto di vista il mio auspicio personale è che certamente riprenda eh, con l'entusiasmo che ha avuto, ma magari con un entusiasmo un po' più moderato per l'attività di scavo e un po' più attento magari alla, allo studio e alla valorizzazione di ciò che è stato scavato, perché chiunque scavi sa che una campagna di scavo produce 
tantissima documentazione che poi va a arricchire i depositi, gli archivi e non necessariamente i tempi dello studio della, della pubblicazione seguono quelli degli scavi. Quindi poi noi ci ritroviamo ad avere depositi, archivi pieni di documenti che restano inutilizzati. E per quanto sia vero che, ad esempio, studiare in un archivio con, ti regala sempre delle, delle scoperte, è importante tutto quello che si vuole, però è anche vero che più passa il tempo e più diventa comunque difficile ricavare tutto il potenziale di informazioni che vengono da queste ricerche. E ricerche che invece sono, come dimostrato da queste altre spedizioni, importanti, non solo per le informazioni che ci danno utili a valorizzare il patrimonio archeologico delle regioni, ma anche per gettare luce sulle dinamiche, sui rapporti fra ricerca scientifica e politica in un periodo così cruciale della nostra storia recente. Grazie. Thank you, Stefano, for your interesting relation in a speech that uh, um, highlights the, 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 the strict relationship between policy in, the, in those times and the archaeological research. And even is in the same year of the Ur excavation, the, the, the close difference between the two uh, organizations, the, the, the support and everything. So I, I think we can open the discussion now. And I ask um, um, the speakers, please, to, to come to the desk. We will start with the speech of Matilde Sigalas. Have you any question of this interesting relation over the Ur excavations? because I, I appreciate really a lot your board, um, the presentation, um, even because I am very convinced that the social and cultural history of archaeology can give us a lot of uh, information and, and a lot of uh, problematization about the um, uh, construction of imperial hierarchies, imperial knowledge, uh, and uh, um, in imperial culture in general. Uh, what I want to ask to um, uh, Matilde is, uh, um, Have you found uh, um, images, the popularization of these uh, uh, archaeological finds in Europe um, did pass also through a culture, uh, a visual culture of uh, archaeology? Um, images, representations, uh, drawing, because uh, I, I think it's really important to, uh, to pay attention on the, um, the archaeological visual culture. Um, I think it's a way through which uh, Europe appropriate this kind of uh, materials. So I wonder if you have found this kind of sources. And for uh, Stefano, uh, it's incredible that, uh, it's only a comment, but it's incredible that uh, um, uh, all uh, along the, the, the long uh, uh, archaeological history of uh, Italian, of Italy, um, the question of money, funds, are constant. I mean, um, from the creation of the Missione Archeologica di Creta, which I've studied, to uh, the uh, missions that you have studied, the, the question is always the same. And um, it's um, um, incredible uh, the strict link that uh, there is uh, um, between uh, uh, this reclaim of funds and um, the fear that uh, the honor of the nation and of the nation state could fail. Uh, in the case that this found could not um, arrive, and it's a it's a constant for the archaeology for the Italian archaeologists. Quite impressive, this. Thank you very much for your question. Um, yeah, there's images um, for for the the kind of articles that I showed. Um, for example, for the time. The images were published in the in the images section. So all the articles would have a reference on page 14 or 18, and all the images would be put there. So you have a um, few photographs from or in the middle of ancient um, in the middle of polo event and stuff like this uh, for the times. 
uh, and then the, um, the images were um, to the Illustrated London News. They were having um, illustrated articles um, and the, the images were included. But the interesting thing is that the Times um, signed a contract to be sure that they would be in control of the photographs that would be released even in Europe. So they were selling the photographs they wanted to, to newspapers in Europe. Yeah. And um, about representation, uh, there's um, a good uh, example because one of the most, the, the, the beautiful, the most beautiful discoveries was the, the headdress of Queen Puabi. Um, and the last picture I put it was the, the bust. And because uh, she was a queen, uh, and because they discovered human remains on the site, they uh, did a reproduction of the queen herself, um, what she could look like. So when you're going to the museum, you, you have a queen with a headdress. Um, and they based the, 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 the face of the queen on the skulls they found to be close to what, what they were shaping at the time. Um, but the US didn't agree on the work that has been done, so they did themselves their own representation of the queen. And so you have, um, it's plaster, and they, they did it in plaster to uh, expose the, all the jewelry, and to have something you, you could um, look, look at, to have um, a person. So yeah, there's, there's this kind of representation that were happening for both um, new and exhibition. So I'm, unfortunately, I can show how many documents there are, especially in the expedition of Mesopotamia, about the, the founding of the expedition. And uh, what is really interesting in Italy is that uh, the situation changes radically. So at the, until 1936, 37, there is a lot of money. And then uh, it decreases uh, absolutely. And um, in one year, for instance, in 1935, the expedition had to start. But at the very end, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs says, stop, because we want to build a house, just to, so to have a, a spot, a station, so for, for And so they don't go on with the excavation. And uh, Bartocini is surprised because I think that um, these people was uh, used to have a lot of money until that time. And then uh, the founding decreases uh, dramatically uh, because we are going to the war and so on. And in fact, there are many other projects. There was a project for Iran. And this pro the preparation for this project goes on a lot. But then at the very end, it stops because the, there's no money. Yes. No? Thank you for your presentations. And it's very interesting talking about funding and money, how the situation for the Italian Archaeological Mission in Egypt is completely different, because it's clear that there is no interest from the state. Uh, so uh, it's really amazing, because Caparelli already in 1894 has the concessions, well, it's given a word by the Director General of the Services Antiquité to excavate everywhere, but there is no interest from the Italian state because, of course, there are interests in the, in the Near East, in Turkey. Uh, and so, at the end, it's the Crown giving the money. It's Victor Emmanuel III, uh, because both the Ministry of Public Education and Foreign Affairs is not. But your lecture was so interesting to see, well, what are the real interests, not only political, but even economically. And so, probably, in this matter, Egypt was something else. And they didn't even want, probably, to compete there was not ever a wish to be present and to establish an Italian archaeological school, uh, while the other, well, the IFAO and uh, um, the Germans were so present. And uh, it's, it's quite interesting to see this parallelism that's um, really due to politics. So, uh, and 
I mean, your lecture was so interesting because of the value of economics and economic development, which is something we should consider as well. I would like to add that especially as far as the expedition in Transjordan, the real, there is a real instruction to the archaeologists to be far from the British, especially. This is the reason why they want to go beyond the Jordan, just because you have to be far as much as possible for the British because their presence is too, fo too strong, so probably this is the reason why also Egypt is not considered. They wanted to go in uh, Anatolia, they wanted to go in Transjordan, uh, they, they wanted to work uh, outside and, uh, because they understand that uh, it would be very hard. So I, I don't know if you have something to add. There was a question. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so I have a question for both of you. Um, Mathilde, um, this has sort of been picked up on already, but it's, it's like 100 years since the discovery of the team of Tutankhamun this year. There are very clear parallels. It is happening around the same time. But uh, there are parallels with sort of the role of the times, the role of publicity. I just wondered if there was you could talk about the comparative aspect of your project a bit more, if you think it's something that's worth picking up on, that would be analytically helpful. Um, Stefano, I just, um, sorry if I missed this with my bad Italian, I may have missed something. I wondered if the Italian oil company was sponsoring, sort of connected, not sponsoring, but connected perhaps to any other survey archaeological work. Um, just a factual thing. Thanks. Um, sorry, your question was if, if I was planning to do comparison with uh, the... Oh, um, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I thought you were, because you said 100 years ago, I thought you were talking about the fact that they're coming back to Ur this year, but no, okay, um, yeah, this is something that um, I, I explore into the explanation of how archaeological research has been shaped in the Middle East after World War One, because uh, the law that have been established in Iraq was co-written with Syria and with Palestine to have the same uh, legislation, and it's different in Egypt. Um, also because the service of antiquities is already established since a long time. Um, this is not the core of uh, my demonstration, but I obviously mention what what is happening because it has a lot of diplomatic implications also in between the, the powers. <laughs> so, yeah. As far as the AGIP, Agenzia Generale Italiana Petroleum, is concerned. Unfortunately, I had just a quick survey of the archive. So, but I think it was the only one um, real uh, involvement. Also, because the Italian didn't carry on uh, uh, petrol uh, researches. Then, in the 50s, in Iran, there was. Uh, but this is another story. So, this is the only one. It's only that. Um, I, I, I feel empathy with Doro Levy, which was the, the only one very real archaeologist. If you see the papers by Bartoccini, by, pa by Pach, etc., they were something else. But Doro Levy went in Iraq, and of course, then he escaped to the United States. Of course, he was not a um, fan of the fascist regime, but he was very serious. And the expedition in Mesopotamia was... Um, very tiring work. He also went uh, in Syria more time uh, at the time of the organization of the Mostra Augusta della Romanità. It, it would be a very interesting topic of research because it, an archive of uh, thousands of photos of the Near East was uh, organized for this uh, exhibition and, and Levy had to go there again just to make photos and so on. 
but then at the very end he writes a, a, a very detailed report uh, saying I would like to excavate uh, Saleuchak, Tesiphon, because, 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 and then they send him uh, to Kilizu. That was uh, something terrible at that time. And uh, his work was, um, uh, was lost in some way. But, uh, the, uh, as far as the um, petrol companies, I think this is the only case, uh, at least uh, to my knowledge. Some other question? I can try to put a question to um, Mat uh, Matilde. Um, at the end of your presentation, has appeared the Bible. And I'm wondering if we could find a deeper ideological reason for the individuation and the choose of Ur as site of excavation in this problem. I, I was thinking that the, the, the British Museum had since a century, at the end of the, at the beginning of the 19th century, the, 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 the excellence of classical antiquity, the Fidia marbles. And then now to put the end over the Bible could be this, uh, for me, linked to the strategy of communication. Could it be this the deeper reason of the choose? Um, yeah, uh, re linking to that, there's there's few explanations um, about the, the Bible interpretation. Um, something that I didn't mention is that Wuli himself was supposed to become a priest before he, he switched to to, um, <laughs> to archaeology. So he was himself very much convinced of proving the scriptures and, and the texts. Um, and there's... Um, there was a, a fun testimony of Agatha Christie who went to Orr and wrote her novel about it, saying that she preferred to visit the site with um, Burroughs, who was the epigraphist, rather than Woolley, because Woolley would always link everything to Abraham. And you would not really uh, know what or what were the meaning or so uh, this is already also a reason why the, the Bible has been um, a lot uh, into Woolley's article, but about the British Museum, um, yeah, there's there's also this this question of um, past war, um, past World War One um, revival of religion, and uh, the fact that a lot of uh, people um, went back into faith, and also the um, the trustees of the British Museum were very much believing in that. So um, yeah, I think. Because one, um, once the, 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 the relief in, in Nimrud were, were discovered, it was written that classical antiqui antiquity would be soon um, overcome by, by Mesopotamian stories. And this is what happened. And um, yeah, the, the reason is also the, the possibility to, to dig and to have the legislation that was written by them uh, because the Ottoman Empire was um, way more restrictive and Greece changed the law as well. So this is, I think this is all related. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some other question? I can, we can pass to the break and start again. In 15 minutes. Thank you. Let's start again and let me now introduce someone who needs no introduction because he's our host here today. Uh, everyone of you know Simona. Simona is professor of contemporary history at the Department of Scienze Umane at the Università dell'Aquila. Uh, works on the field of imperialism, colonialism, the history of Italian archaeology from the 19th century to fascism. She is uh, author, among other volumes and works, of Pietre d'Oltemare, Scavare, Conservare, Immaginare l'Impero, 1899-1940, published by La Terza in 2021. Her articles have published in national and international journals, including Journal of Modern Italian Studies, Nuncius, Contemporanea, Memoria Ricerca, Passato e Presente. Simona will have the speech, uh, Romanità e Bianchezza, Cultura Visuale, Immaginario Archeologico nel Colonialismo Italiano. Um, uh, Simona will have the, her speech in Italian, but I remember you, there is a synopsis, an English synopsis at the corner of the desk. Finished, there are no more English synopsis. <laughs> Oh, 
Allora, grazie mille eh, per la presentazione, vado subito a... Penso di dover parlare qui però. Ah, ok. Vado subito allora alla presentazione. Dunque, in tempi recenti il mito di Roma e più in generale il tema della romanità hanno ricevuto particolare attenzione da parte degli storici, soprattutto in relazione al fascismo, che, lo sappiamo, attinse a piene mani alla costellazione simbolica plasmata nel tempo attorno all'urbe, l'urbe eterna e universale. Una nuova attenzione ha ricevuto anche la dimensione materiale della romanità, cioè il ruolo giocato dai resti e dalle rovine di Roma nel rappresentare le ambizioni imperiali dell'Italia liberale prima e di quella fascista poi, all'insegna di una continuità, quella appunto tra Italia liberale e eh, Italia fascista, che ci dice molto dei processi di costruzione della italianità. Meno indagati risultano invece oggi la cultura visuale e l'immaginario archeologico connessi alla romanità coloniale, a quell'ambito cioè nel quale le vestigia di Roma funzionarono da catalizzatori di identità, di catalizzatori di identità capaci di generare sensi di appartenenza che sono tipici della dimensione imperiale e della dimensione della bianchezza. Oggi vi parlerò appunto di questo, anche se il mio, la mia relazione rispetto al titolo iniziale si concentra sì su alcuni aspetti dell'annesso romanità-bianchezza, ma restringe il contesto e l'arco cronologico alla Libia e al fascismo e amplia invece il discorso alla fruizione bianca dei resti coloniali eh, dell'archeologia. Nella prima parte del mio intervento cercherò quindi di mostrarvi come a partire dalla fine degli anni 20 e poi con più forza negli anni 30 il nesso romanità-bianchezza emerse con forza nella fruizione e nel consumo culturale delle rovine romane della Libia. Questa fruizione e questo consumo um, eh, avvenne, eh, presero la duplice forma del contatto diretto con le rovine e del contatto indiretto. E che significa contatto indiretto? Un contatto mediato da alcuni dispositivi comunicativi. Quindi due forme di confronto con le antichità che permisero vari esercizi identitari ad una moltitudine di individui, una moltitudine di individui che, come vedremo, al proprio interno è parecchio sfaccettata. Mi concentrerò quindi prima su questa esperienza di fruizione e consumo e sui soggetti che la sperimentarono, evidenziandone alcuni aspetti in relazione alle pratiche, alle esperienze e, e, e soprattutto al modo in cui appunto questi oggetti vennero sperimentati. Nella seconda parte invece del mio intervento cercherò di mostrare come il nesso romanità bianchezza, che è proprio dell'esperienza culturale delle rovine, alimentasse delle esclusioni e dei confini rispecchiando la dimensione di potere propria della situazione coloniale e propria dei processi di razzializzazione dell'altro coloniale. Quindi eh, la costruzione del nesso romanità bianchezza in Libia assume la propria specificità a partire dagli anni venti, quando il regime fascista assunse il controllo pieno della colonia e inaugurò una politica delle rovine incentrata appunto sui resti di Roma. Volendo riassumere possiamo dire che lo scopo di questa politica fu innanzitutto celebrare la forza e il prestigio del regime, evidenziare i legami storici e culturali tra la colonia e la metropoli e soprattutto affermare la natura millenaria della stirpe, la stirpe italica e, so e ancor di più il potere della razza nostra nel Mediterraneo. Il regime fascista eh, vedeva nei resti romani diffusi sia nella penisola che in colonia uno strumento potente di legittimazione delle proprie ambizioni e al tempo stesso un mezzo per plasmare un immaginario storico in cui diversi piani temporali si fondevano e si mescolavano. Questi piani temporali intrecciavano in maniera molto oh, come dire, articolata, presente e passato, antico e moderno, e iscrivevano nell'antica Roma quello che sarebbe stato il destino dell'impero fascista. La politica delle rovine quindi portò eh, a grandi investimenti nell'archeologia, all'inaugurazione di nuove campagne di scavo, alla eh, realizzazione dei siti archeologici, alla monumentalizzazione eh, dei resti e soprattutto alla popolarizzazione delle antichità, che iniziarono ad essere fruite e consumate dal punto di vista culturale, come vi dicevo, da, da una varietà di soggetti davvero interessanti. Soggetti che ehm, si recavano in Libia ad ammirarle, o le ammiravano da lontano, cioè eh, dalla, dalla penisola, grazie alla produzione di testi scritti e visivi divulgati attraverso appunto vari media. 
Ora, chi erano questi fruitori delle rovine romane e in che termini si confrontavano con esse? Erano in primo luogo oh, viaggiatori, viaggiatori che attraversavano il Mediterraneo seguendo rotte in parte ereditate dal Grand Tour, in parte invece aperte grazie alla nascita di colonie, di mandati, di possedimenti, di protettorati che incrementavano la presenza europea eh, nel Mediterraneo anche in termini turistici. Navi, piroscafi e poi più tardi eh, aeroplani di piccola e media dimensione consentivano ad un'elite colta e culturalmente omogenea di attraversare il mare, facendo scalo in porti spesso di, di recente costituzione, di recente realizzazione, per ammirare i resti monumentali appunto delle grandi civiltà. L'Egitto, l'Algeria, alcuni paesi del Medio Oriente rappresentavano le mete quindi di un turismo archeologico alimentato da un crescente interesse per la storia e da un crescente interesse per le antichità e soprattutto alimentati da una pratica, quella del viaggio, che veniva considerata una pratica importante della modernità. Un'esperienza che eh, era, eh, consentiva di distinguersi in quanto moderni. Turisti di varia provenienza geografica approdavano anche in Libia, appunto nella Libia fascista, in gruppi organizzati prima da agenzie private e poi con l'ampliarsi del controllo da parte del regime sulla colonia dagli enti fascisti istituiti per orientare e per incrementare i flussi e le presenze appunto nel contesto africano. In Libia i visitatori potevano ammirare i resti di eh, Leptis Magna, potevano ammirare i resti di Cirene, potevano ammirare i resti di eh, Sabrata, tornati alla luce appunto grazie al lavoro degli archeologi italiani e ad un processo di monumentalizzazione che spettacolarizzava la storia, esaltando i luoghi. E per luoghi intendo non soltanto i siti archeologici, soprattutto questi tre eh, che avete visto, ma anche i musei, spesso allestiti attorno a questi eh, siti e attorno ai quali appunto esibire oggetti e reperti rinvenuti negli scavi. Qui avete il Museo archeologico di Tripoli e qui il Museo archeologico di, ehm, di Cirene con ehm, la fotografia di Mussolini eh, lì sulla parete. Furono quindi questi soggetti ad approdare per primi in Libia, dove la fruizione delle rovine significò per loro il contatto diretto con la magnificenza di Roma antica e anche con la modernità della Roma fascista. Perché? Perché in Colonia appunto il fascismo garantiva degli approdi comodi, degli alberghi nuovi, nuove strade, nuovi spazi per l'intrattenimento e il divertimento. Dalla fine degli anni venti anche molti italiani si recarono però in Colonia, grazie non solo ad associazioni culturali, ad esempio il Touring Club italiano, la società Dante Alighieri, eh, associazioni archeologiche amatoriali, ma anche dalle, associazioni, da, eh, or, dalle organizzazioni del regime, che inviarono in Libia Balilla, questi sono appunto come vi dicevo i primi turisti italiani che approdano in Libia grazie alle associazioni, e poi abbiamo gli avanguardisti, abbiamo le giovani donne fasciste, abbiamo i guf, abbiamo gli insegnanti, abbiamo i lavoratori appunto organizzati dal dopolavoro. E questi sono materiali visivi appunto, che ci raccontano dell'esperienza delle rovine da parte di soggetti italiani spediti in colonia anche appunto, per ammirarne le rovine. Chi sono questi soggetti? Beh, sono um, soggetti, ceti professionali, praticanti della storia, amatori dell'arte, uomini e donne borghesi che condividevano con gli omologhi uh, stranieri la pratica moderna della scoperta e del viaggio. E dall'altro c'era l'interesse del regime di promuovere il contatto diretto eh, di varie fasce sociali con la colonia africana. Portare i gruppi di italiani ad ammirare la grandezza di Roma serviva ad accrescere in loro la consapevolezza di sé in termini appunto nazionali imperiali. Ma serviva soprattutto a fornire materiale alla macchina del consenso. E infatti questi testi visivi sono fondamentali appunto perché servivano a generare consenso. Questa macchina della propaganda immette le rovine nell'ambito appunto di una connessione italianità-romanità che è di grande rilievo. La visita a rovine infatti era ripresa, era fotografata, era filmata e di conseguenza era organizzata fin nei minimi dettagli, era organizzata e disciplinata, proprio perché costituiva quella materia su cui il regime poi avrebbe potuto costruire le proprie rappresentazioni. Accanto a questi soggetti abbiamo poi eh, altri italiani che sono gli italiani d'Africa, coloro cioè che erano stati inviati in Africa per la colonizzazione demografica della colonia. 
Anche per loro la fruizione dell'archeologia fu in larga parte organizzata con un obiettivo ancora più stringente, rafforzare il legame con il territorio e soprattutto il loro senso di appartenenza alla razza dominatrice. La visita avveniva nell'ambito di gruppi organizzati ad esempio dalle scuole, qui abbiamo gli, gli alunni italiani eh, che vivevano in colonia e che vengono appunto invitati a quello che era definito il bagno di romanità, abbiamo eh, visite eh, organizzate dal dopolavoro e eh, che assumevano poi la forma anche di celebrazioni religiose, ma abbiamo anche gite domenicali appunto di eh, soggetti che si recavano a visitare il sito archeologico in autonomia. Cosa abbiamo in tutto questo? Abbiamo innanzitutto indottrinamento, ma abbiamo anche svago e intrattenimento e queste tre dimensioni caratterizzavano l'esperienza diretta delle rovine da parte di un'umanità piuttosto eterogenea, un'umanità che popolava i siti archeologici, visitava i musei, i monumenti e fruiva di materiali riconducibili appunto alla romanità. Tutti questi soggetti erano eh, appunto caratterizzati da un unico tratto e cioè la bianchezza. Gli schiavi archeologici di Libia divennero nel giro di qualche anno luoghi riservati al consumo culturale di soggetti specificamente bianchi. A loro era indirizzato la celebrazione della romanità, il sensazionalismo della lettura del passato, il discorso dell'impero e il discorso della civilizzazione. A questi soggetti era cioè rivolta una politica delle antichità finalizzata al riconoscimento e all'autoriconoscimento in un gioco di specchi in cui ci si rifletteva all'insegna delle logiche ideologiche e culturali dell'impero. A questi soggetti era indirizzato anche altro, era, indirizzato il, la, era indirizzata l'amplissima produzione di testi visivi che popolarizzavano le antichità facendole circolare al di fuori della colonia, consentendo sia a chi ci sarebbe andato, sia a chi invece non avrebbe potuto farlo, di conoscerla e di consumarla anche da lontano. Come abbiamo visto già dalle immagini che vi ho mostrato prima, tra gli anni 20 e gli anni 30 i materiali archeologici furono fotografati e filmati da operatori cinematografici, da fotografi mandati appunto direttamente dal regime e questo permise una loro ampia circolazione nella metropoli dove altre forme di appropriazione potevano appunto avvenire. Questa circolazione avvenne, avvenne nell'ottica della transmedialità e questo è un tema molto, molto forte per capire appunto quanto poi risulti di successo questa diffusione, anche perché la transmedialità consentiva al regime di raggiungere appunto pubblici molto diversi. A partire dalle prime campagne di scavo fu poi la stampa a diffondere notizie, informazioni e soprattutto fotografie di quanto l'archeologia andava realizzando in Colonia. Dalla fine degli anni venti poi il mercato editoriale si arricchì di libri, guide, periodici, riviste più o meno specialistiche in grado di moltiplicare appunto la uh, circolazione delle, delle rovine eh, nell'ambito appunto di contesti anche molto diversi l'uno dall'altro. Si tratta in questo caso di testi agili eh, affollati di molte immagini che consentivano anche chi non era uso, abituato a, a frequentare la storia antica in qualche modo di captarla o comunque di, eh, di conoscerla. Um, a partire dalla proclamazione dell'impero, cioè a partire dal 1936, il repertorio di immagini delle rovine di Libia si fece sempre più uniforme, grazie appunto agli strumenti dell'industria della cultura di massa che irrompe nel panorama promuovendo altre forme di eh, consumo e di, eh, ehm, e di fruizione culturale delle rovine. I monumenti di Roma in Colonia diventano delle icone delle icone in grado di condensare dei significati che sono ormai scontati, sono sempre più ripetitivi, ma che vengono prodotti attraverso appunto soluzioni grafiche nuove, attraverso eh, fotomontaggi, attraverso collage fotografici, attraverso appunto innovazioni che mobilitano l'immaginario dell'antico attraverso tecniche e sperimentazioni che possiamo definire all'avanguardia. In questo contesto di popolarizzazione un ruolo specifico lo ebbero i filmati prodotti dall'Istituto Luce, che immisero l'archeologia in un circuito comunicativo in grado di raggiungere pubblici ancora più differenziati. Se vedere l'impero diventa negli anni 30 uno degli strumenti fondamentali per accrescere la coscienza coloniale, vedere la romanità imperiale divenne il mezzo attraverso cui rendere ancora più comprensibile il discorso della stirpe colonizzatrice. L'Istituto Luce non produsse soltanto i filmati eh, che vi ho fatto vedere prima, 
filmati appunto che testimoniavano la visita eh, di turisti e colonie e siti e la immettevano nel, nel circuito della propaganda. Ma eh, l'Istituto Luso produsse anche documentari e cine giornali in cui le rovine avevano molto spazio. Anche in questo caso il passaggio tra gli anni 20 e 30 è un passaggio decisamente significativo. Perché? Perché in pellicole come quelle del 26, quindi abbiamo un esempio, Ritorno di Roma, eh, um, vediamo appunto un impero che si fa, che si sta costruendo e quindi l'immagine a cui si fa riferimento è l'immagine dell'antico impero romano che eh, man mano si colora appunto in, questa, in, questa, in questi fotomontaggi che si susseguono mostrando poi quelli che erano i resti che erano oh, lasciati in eredità da Roma nell'ambito appunto della, del, del passaggio oh, tra i vari secoli con il passare del tempo le cose cambiano e eh, l'Istituto Luce comincia a produrre dei documentari in cui ehm, il tema delle rovine diventa, e delle rovine della Libia diventa appunto un tema fondamentale per procedere con la loro icono, iconizzazione. Eh, negli anni 30, eh, lo sappiamo, le, le cine attualità mute, quindi filmati muti, lasciano lo spazio a narrazioni sonore che sollecitano poi la... Ehm, Altre, altre forme di soggettività da parte degli spettatori attraverso appunto l'attivazione di altre forme di, ehm, oltre a quella, di altri sensi rispetto a quello della, della vista e la dimensione acustica è una dimensione che accompagna appunto questa narrazione delle rovine per cui le pellicole si fanno più sofisticate i contenuti si arricchiscono di nuovi temi le scenografie e le riprese acquisiscono una maggiore complessità grazie a direttori artistici che abbiamo appunto Franchina che in qualche modo um, producono uh, dei um, materiali visivi estremamente interessanti che trasformano i siti, vedete queste immagini sono molto diverse da quelle che vi ho fatto vedere all'inizio come luoghi appunto pienamente fruibili da parte di una comunità, come vi dicevo, bianca ora la fruizione e il consumo culturale del patrimonio archeologico coloniale e mettevano chiaramente in luce come lo spazio, i materiali e eh, i testi visivi e scritti dell'antico delimitassero un confine, un confine entro il quale i soggetti non bianchi non trovavano cittadinanza. L'esaltazione e la monumentalizzazione della romanità, insieme alla cancellazione o alla marginalizzazione di altre vicende storiche non riferibili immediatamente all'impero, consentivano di erigere una barriera ulteriore tra il noi e gli altri, i colonizzatori e i colonizzati, gli eredi e gli estranei alla civiltà latina. Questi ultimi, considerati alieni ad una vicenda storica che non gli apparteneva, ne venivano allontanati in maniera radicale. Prima di essere fruiti, infatti, dalla comunità bianca, questi spazi, i suoi luoghi, quindi i siti archeologici, erano ripuliti della presenza indigena, erano delimitati, spesso recintati, erano comunque sottratti all'uso e alla fruizione da parte della popolazione locale. Questa popolazione venne rimossa dagli spazi, eh, dagli spazi in cui la, la sua presenza veniva considerata un sopruso. E questo è un tema molto, molto, molto interessante perché questa percezione, la percezione dell'abitante locale come intruso rispetto al proprio territorio, viene plasmata da vari attori. Viene plasmata in primis dagli archeologi che ad esempio sostenevano la necessità di liberare eh, le rovine della romanità dalla presenza degradante di soggetti altri, di soggetti che appunto non, non potevano riconoscersi in quel passato ma anche ovviamente dagli attori politici che ehm, spinsero per, perché questo avvenisse. Ehm, alla domanda dell'ispettore agli scavi Guidi di allontanare chi viveva nel sito archeologico di Cirene e di sostituire la presenza degli indigeni con piante e fiori che avrebbero abbellito lo spazio per i visitatori, il vice governatore Rodolfo Graziani nel 1930 risponde appunto acconsentendo all'eliminazione di tutte le manifestazioni di barbarie che questi eh, indigeni appunto eh, mostravano abitando in un luogo non loro e con la realizzazione del sito archeologico. I siti archeologici quindi erano unicamente destinati ai crociati dalla bellezza, agli escursionisti stranieri e ai visitatori italiani che ne avrebbero potuto godere. Ora, negli anni 30 il valore assegnato, assegnato alle testimonianze della romanità portò ad esasperare, anche dal punto di vista retorico, il tema dell'indigeno intruso. 
La rivista illustrata del Popolo d'Italia, che è una delle riviste principali appunto di questo periodo, scriveva nel 1931 che era necessario far sparire i predoni, coloro cioè che per generazioni camminavano sopra città sepolte, ignorando nei tesori d'arte, in modo da far posto alla solennità e alla magniloquenza della romanità trionfante. La stessa rivista l'anno successivo scriveva che era necessario allontanare dalla romanità i parassiti del passato e far sì che questa romanità fosse appunto ad uso e consumo esclusivo dei crociati della bellezza. Ora, ehm, il tema del parassita, cioè del soggetto locale appunto come intruso nel territorio in cui viveva, questo tema divenne una figura ricorrente nella pubblicistica che convertiva definitivamente al razzismo degli stereotipi diffusi nella tradizione culturale europea, come il disinteresse degli altri, tra virgolette, verso l'arte e la storia e la loro inadeguatezza a prendersi cura dei manufatti. Piegato dalla colonizzazione, l'intruso parassita andava quindi rimosso dai riferimenti ideali e culturali che ancoravano ehm, in colonia la bianchezza e l'italianità appunto alla romanità. L'allontanamento di questo soggetto dagli spazi su cui insistevano i resti della romanità fu un'operazione che ovviamente non riguardò soltanto i siti archeologici ma anche specifiche aree dei vari centri urbani e il caso più noto è quello appunto di Tripoli dove l'arco di Marco Aurelio viene appunto eh, monumentalizzato e isolato, vengono quindi abbattute tutte le, eh, le case, le strutture, le abitazioni che si trovavano prima e che lo avevano inglobato e appunto il monumento viene eh, musealizzato e soprattutto gli viene apposta questa barriera fisica per cui era impossibile ehm, ritenerlo ancora eh, un, un manufatto al centro delle, delle pratiche proprie della quotidianità. A Tripoli accade anche attraverso l'apertura di eh, scavi archeologici e scavi urbani che appunto determinano l'allontanamento di eh, abitanti dai, dai loro luoghi e, e la loro marginalizzazione verso l'esterno eh, rispetto al centro cittadino. L'elemento locale quindi fu ridotto nei termini del pittoresco e del folklore, che rendevano ancora più autentica l'esperienza turistica dei luoghi. Quando fu reintegrato nello spazio delle antichità, l'indigeno lo fu all'insegna dello sfruttamento e della subalternità. Perché? Perché gli scavi archeologici vennero condotti grazie alla forza lavoro locale e a quel sottoproletariato eh, impoverito, nato a seguito della soppressione di molte attività produttive del territorio e più in generale a causa della repressione fascista e dei rastrellamenti e degli spostamenti di popolazione che il fascismo appunto realizzò in colonia per spezzare i legami tra le comunità e la resistenza anticoloniale. A fianco a questa manodopera sfruttata c'erano poi i detenuti i detenuti delle varie carceri che erano stati aperti eh, dagli italiani appunto eh, in Libia ehm, e che eh, venivano impiegati ehm, soprattutto per le indagini archeologiche. Qui non ho fatto la traduzione in inglese ma appunto ehm, penso l'immagine sia piuttosto chiara. Quindi i siti, i reperti, ehm, i musei, gli spazi musealizzati, musealizzati erano anche in questo senso il frutto di un sistema di dominio ed erano la testimonianza appunto di una confisca materiale e simbolica che veniva operata nei confronti dei eh, soggetti locali. Ora, ehm, volendo tirare le fila di quanto vi ho detto finora, possiamo dire che la romanità in Libia è una romanità fruita, consumata, trasformata in uno spazio immaginifico, permetteva di, eh, questa romanità permetteva di esplicitare alcuni processi. Dal punto di vista identitario, appunto, come vi dicevo, i suoi materiali consentivano di dare forma a vari sensi di appartenenza, quella individuale e collettiva di soggetti bianchi e civilizzati, consapevoli di sé e soprattutto delle pratiche sociali e culturali della modernità, quella di una comunità impegnata a ridefinire la propria italianità nei termini rivoluzionari, tra virgolette, del fascismo, e quella di un'alterità condannata irrimediabilmente alla subalternità. Dal punto di vista politico il godimento dei materiali romani rappresentava invece un altro aspetto della conquista del territorio, in uno scenario in cui appunto la preminenza italiana era assicurata dal punto di vista militare, culturale, politico e memoriale. Ciò che caratterizzava questi processi era il loro avvenire lungo la linea del colore, che includeva ed escludeva ponendo limiti all'accesso alle antichità e rendendo possibile o meno la fruizione del passato e delle sue forme materiali. Ora, che ne è di tutto questo? 
quanto di questi processi di identificazione connessi alle rovine, quanto di questa cultura visuale, di questa modalità di fruizione dell'antico attraversa il tempo, arriva fino a noi e in maniera più o meno consapevole continua a popolare in maniera carsica il nostro immaginario della romanità e della romanità coloniale. Quanto resiste dell'archivio coloniale connesso ai resti del passato in un contesto come quello italiano, che lo sapete fa abbastanza fatica a fare i conti con la propria vicenda coloniale, e con altrettanta fatica eh, fa i conti o si confronta con il tema della decolonizzazione dei patrimoni. Non è facile rispondere a questa domanda e io nemmeno ci proverò, però, però vi do alcune indicazioni che eh, ci offrono la possibilità di indicare delle linee di ricerca o quantomeno di discussione relative appunto alla permanenza di atteggiamenti e soprattutto di posture che, che richiamano eh, il repertorio coloniale e che a mio avviso sarebbe molto importante approfondire. Eh, ve ne propongo due, una è eh, appunto quella, anche questa eh, piuttosto nota ma che meriterebbe di essere ulteriormente studiata, che è la, 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 la restituzione alla Libia della Venere di Cirene nel 2008, la Venere di Cirene che fu rinvenuta eh, nei primi scavi in Colonia, trasferita nel Museo Nazionale Romano e, e rappresenta un po' la vicenda della sua restituzione, l'acme la, o l'apice di quello che vi ho detto, perché? Perché la restituzione della Venere avvenne dopo decenni dal momento in cui era stata richiesta e fu fortemente osteggiata, fu fortemente osteggiata all'insegna appunto della, della, del, di una italianità e soprattutto dell'idea che la romanità eh, trattino eh, bianchezza, trattino italianità fosse qualcosa che ehm, riguardasse soltanto appunto eh, lo, lo Stato che se n'era impossessata ed era completamente che la Stato fosse del tutto estranea al contesto di provenienza. Ma è ancora più interessante che 11 anni dopo una uh, importante manifestazione cinematografica italiana in Astri d'Argento assegni il premio speciale documentario per la ricerca storica al filmato Il mare della nostra storia della regista e sceneggiatrice Giovanna Gagliardo. Il filmato cosa fa? Il filmato ripercorre 100 anni del rapporto particolare, cito, intrattenuto dall'Italia con la Libia, il suo bel suolo d'amore, narrando il vissuto di uomini e donne italiani cresciuti in Colonia e tornati in Libia a seguito dell'espulsione voluta uh, da uh, Gheddafi. Anche in questo caso il ricorso ai materiali visuali del fascismo non mancano, anzi le immagini delle rovine vengono um, utilizzate in maniera del tutto uh, aproblematica, soprattutto vengono utilizzate immagini delle rovine che appartengono a tempi uh, del tutto diversi ma vengono usate per testimoniare il mondo felice di cui gli ex italiani eh, di Libia appunto sembrano non provare se non nostalgia. La romanità rimane di nuovo sullo sfondo, uno sfondo su cui l'italianità e la bianchezza intesta a se stessa l'eredità materiale del passato. Del resto non sono soltanto oh, gli italiani a farlo, se pensiamo al Museo della Romanità inaugurato nel 2018 in Francia, a Nîmes in cui l'esaltazione della romanità va di pari passo con quella della vicenda storica cittadina, sfruttando immagini di nuovo giocate sul terreno della identificazione e dell'appartenenza. Siamo qui ovviamente nel campo del, del brand museale, ma se volessimo ampliare il discorso dell'uso della romanità anche da parte di altri paesi come la Francia, che ne fece ampiamente appunto, uso nella sua vicenda coloniale ottonovecentesca, allora forse una riflessione più generale andrebbe fatta e una discussione sulla decolonizzazione dei patrimoni e sulla questione della romanità andrebbe portata avanti. Grazie. I think there's something impressive in this so wide overview of the use of the antiquities during fascism and the, 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 the legacy of uh, a way to think the antiquity that still survives in, in, in our times. I think we will discuss a lot about this. And now, um, thank you, Simona. And now, the Ushile. Okay. 
And now I ask, please, Valentina Porcedo to, um, Porcedo, to um, reach the desk. Valentina is born in Sassari. She has a curriculum of studies widespread along the Mediterranean Sea. She <laughs> studied in Sassari before, uh, and then had this PhD in Storia e Lingua Letteratura Antica in um, Barcelona. Bordeaux, Bordeaux, and then she worked in Barcelona, yes, now she lives in Marsiglia, uh, where works with the, the archaeological deposit uh, of the city for the study of mater materials of the excavation de la, Bruce, de la Bourse. It's interesting to note that Valentina is not only an archaeologist, but is also a journalist, and uh, works uh, particularly on the, po the policy of uh, cultural heritage, and uh, the protection, the, the widespread in the patrimonial of uh, archaeological heritage all over the Mediterranean, the um, Near East. Uh, she will present as a, a speech, Memorie Coloniali, il patrimonio archeologico dell'Algeria dell tra rivanchismo identitario e cancel culture. I don't know if there is still surviving some uh, synopsis, in mean, English synopsis. No? Finished. Okay. Thank you, Valentina. Grazie per la presentazione, grazie soprattutto a Simona e a Beatrice per, per l'invito, sono uh, molto contenta di essere qua perché um, questo convegno mi ha, mi ha dato l'occasione di, um, di ritornare su, su un argomento eh, che fino al, al mio soggiorno in Algeria nel 2012 non, non che non mi avesse mai interessata perché come interesse generale così eh, naturalmente esisteva però non, eh, non, non mi ero mai approcciata alle problematiche eh, della colonizzazione della de decolonizzazione in maniera diciamo come, come interesse accademico scientifico eh, L'occasione appunto è stata ehm, una borsa di studio della Fondazione Ghetti che eh, ho avuto la, la, la fortuna di, di ottenere, eh, dico che è stata una fortuna perché io avendo scavato moltissimi anni eh, in Tunisia e in Marocco ehm, avevo sempre desiderato visitare i siti archeologici del, del Nord Africa, e, volevo dire scusate dell'Algeria eh, che come tutti sapete insomma, si studiano nell'archeologia delle, delle province romane quali, eh, quali esempi no, dell'architettura romana soprattutto eh, Timgad ma eh, l'Algeria è un paese molto, molto chiuso eh, ancora oggi era difficilissimo avere un visto eh, anche solo turistico per, per andare quindi eh, quando la fondazione Ghetti ha bandito questa borsa per Alcuni, alcuni studenti eh, eh, del, dei paesi del Mediterraneo ho, eh, ho colto l'occasione e eh, sono stata proiettata, questo lo, lo, lo dico sempre eh, a chi mi chiede perché non sono effettivamente molti gli, ar gli archeologi della, della mia generazione che hanno avuto occasione di, eh, di andare in Algeria, eh, sono come è stata proiettata in, in un libro di, uh, di storia contemporanea perché anche tutto ciò che, <ride> che viene raccontato insomma, sulla um, violentissima uh, decolonizzazione dell'Algeria la guerra, um, la guerra di, di, di liberazione, la guerra di dipendenza è molto uh, viziato, manipolato eh, e quindi... Mh, Aver vissuto invece per qualche mese in Algeria mi ha dato occasione proprio di, uh, di conoscere uh, di un paese, di, di uh, trovare un paese, uh, lo dico con molta amarezza, uh, ancora traumatizzato, uh, un paese che ha molta, molto bisogno di uh, evacuare uh, tutte, queste, uh, tutte le problematiche legate alla alla decolonizzazione e questo eh, tocca anche a margine naturalmente la eh, problematica del, eh, del patrimonio. Quindi ho avuto occasione di, eh, di fare il, così, un tour eh, nei diversi siti, non ovunque, con grande rimpianto perché eh, intanto non, non tutti i siti dell'Algeria sono eh, aperti al pubblico, sono custoditi sono stati per lungo tempo ehm, 
alcuni, proprio il covo dei, dei terroristi durante la, il decennio, il cosiddetto decennio nero eh, e quindi per esempio non mi, era, non mi è stato possibile visitare l'Ambesi che ho visto soltanto dal, dall'esterno eh, facendo amicizia così eh, incontrando un, un, un pastore del, del luogo ma non, non mi sono potuta ehm, addentrare eh, quindi oggi parlerò ehm, un po' di, uh, di, questa, uh, di questa esperienza e uh, del fatto che in, uh, in, a differenza in rapporto a tutte le vostre comunicazioni e relazioni, specialmente quelle della, della giornata di, uh, di ieri in cui si parlava di uh, decolonizzazione e restituzioni, questo rapporto che è visto più che altro ora da parte europea, quindi quando diciamo decolonizzare il, il patrimonio parliamo no? da parte europea, eh, decolonizzare i musei, restituire, invece in Algeria ehm, questo problema, questa problematica eh, è, si gioca tutta in casa perché la decolonizzazione deve essere fatta prima di tutto dall'interno e soprattutto eh, dall'interno. Quindi adesso farò una, una premessa che poi mi è necessaria per, per parlare della, della situazione attuale dei, eh, dei musei. Eh, come mh, voi sapete eh, le truppe francesi arrivano in, in Algeria nel 1830 quando il paese era sotto il controllo parziale degli ottomani. L'organizzazione amministrativa dell'Algeria, quindi la classica divisione in, eh, in dipartimenti francesi eh, d'oltremare, come si chiamano ancora oggi per le colonie che sono ancora in essere, risale invece al 1848. La conquista termina nel 1902 eh, con l'annessione definitiva del eh, Sahara. Cento anni dopo l'arrivo dei, eh, dei militari in Algeria, quindi verso gli anni, gli anni 30 del Novecento, la colonizzazione veniva ancora considerata come un evento ineluttabile, necessario, addirittura eh, felice, questo ovviamente da parte eh, francese. Per Stefan Gsell, il capofila degli antichisti eh, delle Col d'Alger, membro anche del, dell'Ecole Française de Rome, ricordo che ha scavato anche in Italia eh, a Vulci, la società eh, algerina era per essenza colonizzabile. A Gsell dobbiamo eh, dei lavori che sono ancora oggi eh, una, un, una referenza per chi vuole approcciarsi allo studio Uh, dei siti archeologici dell'Algeria, eh, Monument Antique dell'Algerie in due tomi e eh, l'Histoire uh, de l'Afrique uh, du Nord. Avevano invece un'opinione, uh, perché non va avanti qua? Okay. Sì, sì. <ride> Differente, altri due eh, antichisti mh, che raggiunsero l'Algeria. Eh, Regas, che era uno specialista di eh, preistoria, e Eugène eh, Albertini, che era uno storico e un eh, epigrafista di origine svizzera. Questo nella foto è eh, Regas. Quindi eh, entrambi eh, riconoscevano invece la permanenza del substrato berbero della popolazione dell'Africa del Nord attraverso tutte le epoche e tutte le eh, dominazioni. Qualche decennio dopo la eh, conquista francese venne fondata eh, una cattedra di storia e, e di antichità dell'Algeria in seno a, eh, all'Ecole des Lettres d'Alger, eh, di cui faceva parte eh, Gsell, il quale collaborava anche con l'amministrazione coloniale per la valorizzazione del patrimonio archeologico. Quindi si può dire che la storia dell'Algeria come disciplina accademica, se mi passate il termine, eh, in, nasce in, appunto in, eh, in epoca coloniale e eh, dal colonialismo finì eh, inesorabilmente per essere condizionata e lo è come vedremo mh, ancora oggi. Allora, nel 1838 Adrienne Berbrugger 
eh, un archeologo e filologo, fonda eh, ad Algeri una eh, biblioteca eh, museo eh, nella Bab ehm, Asun. Eh, Berbrugger era il segretario particolare del eh, maresciallo ehm, Closel, eh, quindi qui si, si vede anche questo rapporto che ehm, è molto eh, pregnante nel, nel, nell'esplorazione del, nel, del Nord Africa, nella, nella colonizzazione francese in Nord Africa tra eh, militari e, eh, e archeologi eh, militari che poi mh, diventano in un certo senso essi stessi eh, degli, ar- degli archeologi fanno scavi, acquisiscono come dire, del, delle competenze in, in archeologia nel frattempo che cosa, che cosa succede? Eh, nel, eh, in tutto il paese in tutta l'Algeria cominciano gli scavi gli sbancamenti nelle campagne, nelle città arabe per costruire le nuove, eh, le nuove città coloniali e quindi le scoperte si, ehm, si moltiplicano e una direttiva del, del governo francese ehm, decide che eh, i reperti più eh, interessanti devono essere inviati a eh, Parigi, quindi questo malgrado la fondazione di un museo, <ride> si è bloccato mi sa di un museo uh, ad Algeri. Nel 1840 infatti il capitano Caret uh, scrive la, uh, la Francia tratta l'Africa come Lord uh, Elgin trattava uh, la Grecia, quindi uh, fuori dalle righe la Francia depreda uh, l'Algeria. È in questo uh, periodo che um, il capitano uh, della Mar, quindi un altro militare che però ehm, esplora siti archeologici e fa scoperte archeologiche, ottenne dal Ministro della Guerra il trasporto a Parigi ehm, del mosaico eh, di Nituna Anfitrite eh, scoperto eh, nel 1842 a Cudia a allora, questa è la diapositiva successiva, ma mh, eh, nel frattempo, quindi a Parigi, era stato creato per decisione reale nel 1845 il Musée Algérien. Non corrisponde alla foto perché non ho trovato alcuna foto di questo Musée Algérien, che è un po' un museo fantôme, un museo fantasma, nel senso che è stato chiuso poco dopo, durante il Secondo Impero, ed è stato sostituito dal Musée Africain del Louvre, eh, a cui corrisponde appunto ehm, questa foto. Quindi nel eh, 1842 il mosaico di eh, Anfitrite Nettuno, un, un enorme mosaico di 4 metri per, per 2 risalente al IV secolo d.C., eh, viene inviato a, a Parigi come vedete nella, nella foto anche se un po' piccola a sinistra eh, era stato scoperto proprio durante lo sbancamento di una di queste mh, colline eh, che sovrastava eh, Costantina l'antica, l'antica Cirta e quindi scoperto come la maggior parte dei, dei reperti e delle, e delle vestigia in Algeria per, mh, per via delle eh, delle costruzioni delle nuove, delle nuove città eh, coloniali. Il mosaico ehm, venne diviso in eh, 87 frammenti, eh, chiuso in 87 casse, mandato appunto a, a Parigi, dove però venne ricomposto soltanto eh, l'emblema eh, centrale. Eh, non, non, non risulta, ehm, risultano dispersi eh, gli, altri, eh, gli altri frammenti. Eh, dopo il, il mosaico di eh, Cudiati, che diciamo era il reperto più eclatante eh, inviato in quel periodo a Parigi, continuano eh, gli invii, quindi vengono mandate statue eh, provenienti da, da Cherchel, l'antica Cesarea, eh, da Tipasa, vengono inviati bassorilievi eh, e soprattutto molte, mo, moltissime iscrizioni eh, sia latine che greche e anche, eh, anche numidiche. E, eh, il mh, catalogo del, eh, del museo del, del Louvre annoverava appunto 259 eh, oggetti 
provenienti dalle, dalle varie città della, dell'Algeria per avere un termine di, ehm, di comparazione la Tunisia che era sotto protettorato mh, francese ehm, dalla Tunisia vennero inviati soltanto eh, 117 ehm, reperti quindi questo per dire quanto eh, in quel periodo venne eh, decontestualizzato, depredato e eh, inviato a, a Parigi nel, nel frattempo ad, ad Algeri eh, Berbruggen con, continuava invece la, eh, la raccolta eh, dei, eh, dei reperti eh, che vennero trasferiti in un altro, eh, in un altro locale eh, in un inizio in un, in un palazzo arabo poi in una casa moresca e poi finalmente nel 1862 nel palazzo di eh, Mustafa Pasha eh, Berbruggen diciamo che non era eh, senza macchia perché si sì, ehm, cercava di trattenere eh, in Algeria i, eh, i reperti ma eh, nello stesso tempo ehm, li concentrava ehm, ad Algeri dove le scoperte la titavano perché eh, naturalmente sì, c'erano ehm, all'epoca ancora non non era stata scavata interamente diciamo, nella piazza dei de Martyr, la Place des Martyrs, dove poi sono venute fuori le rovine dell'antico Ecosium, però eh, in quel periodo effettivamente tutto proveniva dalle altre, dalle altre città e quindi benché ci fossero dei musei locali, lui eh, concentrava tutto a, ehm, ad Algeria e questo ha comportato appunto quindi la, 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 la perdita anche del contatto tra eh, le, varie, le varie città e il, eh, e il patrimonio. Eh, locale che è un problema che persiste mh, parzialmente ancora, ancora oggi e, eh, questo eh, museo eh, naturalmente era eh, un museo in cui tutto veniva, eh, veniva accumulato non c'era alcuna contestualizzazione e, e ciò fece dire nel 1890 a eh, Coudre della, René Coudret della Blancher, un archeologo che era stato inviato con la, in, in Algeria, eh, il museo di Algeri in un bel palazzo ma non lo si vede per nulla, occupa il piano terra il cui cortile è gradevole ma le stanze sono buie e le antichità messe alla rinfusa che io sappia è l'unico museo che si visita con la candela in mano, quindi fa anche ehm, dell'ironia per sottolineare appunto le, ehm, le condizioni in cui si trovavano eh, all'epoca ehm, i reperti. Finalmente nel 1897 viene inaugurato eh, il Musée des Antiquités Algériennes et d'Art eh, Musulman in presenza eh, del, del Presidente della Repubblica Francese, ovviamente, Faure. Eh, comprendeva eh, una sezione antica ed una eh, islamica, anche oggetti provenienti dall'esposizione eh, permanente dei prodotti algerini, armi, trofei, eh, oggetti di eh, artigianato e fino al 1905 conteneva anche, eh, conservava eh, i reperti preistorici. Eh, come sicuramente saprete mh, l'Algeria ha eh, del eh, dei siti preistorici molto importanti nel, nel Sahara eh, ci sarebbe da fare una comunicazione solo, solo su questo ma non sono una specialista di, di preistoria però questo per dire che anche eh, diciamo soprattutto in quel periodo le antichità preistoriche non erano eh, minimamente, eh, minimamente considerate e eh, dal poi diciamo che adesso le, eh, le antichità preistoriche sono confluite in, eh, in un altro museo che si chiama eh, Musée du, eh, du Bardot. Nel 1932, quando muore Stéphane Gsell, il museo eh, gli viene eh, intitolato. Eh, ecco qua, nel 1930 viene... Mh, tra l'altro aggiunta questa, questa entrata um, moresca che ancora caratterizza il, uh, il museo della, uh, nazionale di, di, di Algeri che si trova uh, nell'attuale parco uh, della libertà, parco della, della liberté. 
Finalmente nel 1985 eh, il Museo Nazionale delle Antichità, questo di Algeri, questa è la nuova denominazione, eh, acquisisce eh, la, l'autonomia in seno al, eh, al Ministero della, della Cultura e eh, ho, eh, ho messo questa foto perché... Ehm, è una, è una bella foto diciamo, del, del, dei primi, delle, del, del primo allestimento di, di questo museo ma mi serve per dire che non è cambiato eh, molto questa è una foto che ehm, ho fatto io nel 2012 è una brutta foto, ora vi spiego perché perché eh, come spiegherò eh, poco dopo questo mh, ha appunto ancora a, a che vedere con eh, il colonialismo e eh, eh, una difficile decolonizzazione, i musei, negli, nei musei algerini non si possono fare eh, fotografie, eh, neanche un algerino le può fare, nessuno le può fare, almeno che non abbia un'autorizzazione del, eh, del Ministero, cioè non è come da noi che serve l'autorizzazione per poi eventualmente usare la foto a scopi diciamo non, non, non a scopo di lucro e se ne discute molto anche di questo come sappiamo in Italia eh, del, del libero utilizzo delle, delle fotografie eh, ma in Algeria non si può in assoluto e eh, nonostante io avessi appunto andassi in giro con io e altri colleghi borsisti della, della fondazione Ghetti andassimo in giro con una, un'autorizzazione un documento di 5 pagine in arabo che diceva che eravamo autorizzati non, non c'era verso e quindi praticamente a volte eh, riuscivamo a rubare letteralmente qualche, qualche scatto con eh, i telefonini che ancora non erano lì gli smartphone portentosi di, di adesso e, e quindi ecco questa era una delle poche foto che, che sono riuscita ehm, a fare che cosa emerge? Che non è appunto cambiato moltissimo da dalla, dall'epoca coloniale perché sostanzialmente il, eh, l'allestimento è rimasto eh, un allestimento di antica concezione quindi eh, i reperti sono sistemati eh, per tematiche questa è la sala dei marmi quindi la sala delle sculture alle pareti sono appesi eh, i mosaici eh, non c'è appunto alcuna eh, volontà di ricontestualizzare di spiegare da eh, dove vengano questi questi reperti nessuno standard museale è, eh, è rispettato eh, quindi non, non ci sono pannelli didattici le didascalie eh, sono spesso sbagliate sono solo in arabo eh, ci sono anche enormi eh, naturalmente non, esiste non esistono gli apparati multimediali meno che mai il metaverso che ci sarà al Museo Egizio di Torino <ride> eh, e poi ci sono anche problemi di, eh, di sicurezza di sicurezza della struttura ci sono problemi di manutenzione di cura dei reperti le statue eh, hanno degli accumuli impressionanti di, di polvere eh, subiscono incrostazioni di, di, vario, di vario genere proprio perché appunto non sono rispettate le, le, norme, le norme di base e, eh, alcuni reperti sono esposti nel, nel cortile del, del museo dove sono appunto soggetti alle, alle intemperie eh, talvolta ai, ai vandalismi e dove è successo anche che alcune eh, stele che si trovavano proprio nel, eh, nel cortile delle stele eh, ebraiche siano state eh, non si sa se trafugate, nascoste per ragioni eh, ideologiche perché il problema appunto sta, eh, sta tutto qui in Algeria il patrimonio archeologico viene considerato come un retaggio del, eh, del colonialismo Vengono negate quindi, eh, non vengono accettate le, eh, le radici eh, latine, eh, meno che mai quelle, quelle cristiane che sappiamo essere importanti con eh, Sant'Agostino, eccetera. Quindi ehm, principalmente eh, la, eh, diciamo, il fatto che ehm, 
il patrimonio si trovi in, in sia quello museale che come vedremo poi quello delle, dei siti archeologici si trovi in condizioni di degrado e che non ci siano investimenti per la, una, una nuova, dei nuovi allestimenti museali eccetera dipende proprio dal fatto che non c'è stata dopo l'indipendenza del 1962 eh, una riappropriazione di, eh, di questo patrimonio e al contrario è stata costruita una, una narrazione eh, ideologica che eh, ha tentato di, eh, di, di, appunto di, di recidere eh, il rapporto con, eh, con questo eh, passato e purtroppo ehm, ciò avviene eh, sia a livello eh, scientifico perché non, non c'è la ricerca, non c'è ricerca associata ai musei, non ci sono convenzioni internazionali per gli scavi come avviene ad esempio in, in Tunisia, in Marocco e anche in Libia malgrado adesso per la situazione politica venga sempre di meno ma in Algeria proprio ideologicamente non ci sono eh, questi accordi internazionali ma non ci sono neanche scavi diretti da eh, archeologi algerini quindi i musei non possono acquisire eh, implementare le collezioni non possono studiarle ma viene negato anche eh, ai ricercatori stranieri lo studio di, eh, di, questi, di questi reperti e delle, e delle città quindi è una situazione che credo sia abbastanza unica nel panorama del, del Mediterraneo per quanto riguarda appunto poi gli scambi certo è che eh, ci sono anche delle frange estremiste eh, che appunto negano, si presentano alle conferenze mi è capitato proprio di assistere eh, in cui negano che questi siti siano siti mh, romani e eh, che invece eh, diciamo il substrato quindi la, la prima occupazione e anche la prima costruzione di questi siti fosse sempre eh, di, eh, matrice, eh, di matrice berbera infatti se noi andiamo a guardare le carte relative al patrimonio eh, nella carta di Algeri del 1964 si evoca l'esistenza di un regno numidico ma solo dopo aver affermato che il popolo algerino è un popolo arabo musulmano nella carta del 1976 si cita invece uno stato numidico opposto all'imperialismo romano per affermare in conclusione che il popolo algerino si riconosce in una patria araba e che l'Algeria non è un assemblaggio eh, di popoli. Nel 1974 l'Algeria ha ratificato la Convenzione per la protezione del patrimonio mondiale adottata dall'UNESCO ma nei fatti non la, eh, non la rispetta. E questo lo vediamo appunto nei vari, eh, nei vari siti con um, l'organizzazione di, eh, di festival musicali particolarmente eh, invasivi con il degrado della casba di Algeri in cui 550 edifici versano in condizioni eh, disastrose nonostante sia patrimonio dell'UNESCO e, la legge del 1967, che era eh, definita ancora una eh, legge coloniale, venne sostituita nel 1998 da una nuova legge che però ha riportato indietro la eh, situazione, eh, cancellando di fatto l'articolo più importante che diceva eh, che il patrimonio archeologico è inalienabile e non eh, trasferibile. Qui io sono andata poi a vedere qual è la situazione ehm, al, al Louvre perché appunto questi, eh, questi reperti che erano stati trasferiti in Francia in, in epoca coloniale eh, che fine hanno fatto? Non ce n'è quasi traccia eh, nella, nelle varie sale eh, dedicate alle antichità eh, romane del, del Louvre e infatti se andiamo a fare una ricerca nel database online che potete farla anche voi nel, nel sito del Louvre vediamo che ad esempio il mosaico di Nettuno e di Anfitrite si trova nei, eh, nei depositi ma non è eh, esposto così come appunto ci si trovano vari ehm, frammenti di mosaico che penso appartengano appunto alla, alla cornice che abbiamo visto nella, nella foto, eh, foto d'epoca. Stessa cosa per eh, i reperti provenienti da Cherchel, l'antica Cesarea e ehm, per quelli da eh, Timgad eh, Tamugad, di tutto si trova eh, nei, eh, nei depositi, probabilmente sono stati trasferiti, nel, sapete che l'Uvra adesso ha dei depositi, 
sentiti fuori, eh, fuori Parigi e ehm, qua non è specificato se si trovino a Parigi o a Lievan, ma in ogni caso alcuni ehm, eh, archeologi eh, algerini cappeggiati da eh, Nasera Bensedic che è proprio una vera passionaria delle rivendicazioni eh, del suo paese eh, lamentano il fatto che eh, appunto tutto questo materiale non solo è stato sottratto eh, all'Algeria ma non è neanche più eh, visibile e disponibile per lo studio eh, ai ricercatori e eh, agli studiosi algerini questa è sicuramente ehm, una, una battaglia qua non stiamo neanche parlando di restituzioni ma stiamo anche soltanto parlando proprio di eh, possibilità eh, di eh, riapprocciarsi eh, in maniera scientifica a un patrimonio che eh, appartiene al, al paese, abbiamo visto in quali condizioni versino eh, i, i musei, in particolare il museo di Algeri, ma nel museo di di Scirta, di Costantina, che è ricchissimo, è la stessa cosa, è tutto affastellato, eh, le didascalie sono spesso manipolate, appunto mettendo in evidenza eh, l'origine eh, berbera eh, della, della, della civiltà eh, dell'Algeria dell e, e quindi ci sarebbe veramente un grande lavoro da fare se solo ci fosse disponibilità eh, anche da parte eh, appunto dello Stato algerino che non investe poco nel patrimonio, però sono soldi che poi vanno dispersi in attività collaterali che niente hanno a che vedere con, con la conservazione con la, um, e con la valorizzazione. Qua infatti ancora Lambesi, sempre, eh, che Lambesi non è neanche un sito ehm, che, appunto che, che è custodito, non, non è recintato, eh, non, è, non è visitabile, ecco, se uno volesse andare in, in vacanza in, in Algeria, cosa che è ugualmente difficile, però eh, non potrebbe neanche eh, visitarlo. Qua, um, perché vedo che insomma devo presto concludere, ho messo alcune... Um, Alcune fotografie appunto del viaggio del, eh, del 2012, eh, quello che eh, io ho potuto mh, osservare eh, in quei mesi è che ehm, il, eh, gli algerini mh, non hanno una vera consapevolezza di, eh, di, questo, di questo patrimonio eh, e quindi che cosa succede? Che loro vanno nei siti archeologici e li usano un po' tra virgolette come dei, dei parchi, no? del, del, dei posti che li fanno evadere dal, dalle città perché le città dell'Algeria sono molto cementificate, molto molto inquinate e, e quindi quando cercano così un, un momento di, eh, di evasione eh, vanno a visitare eh, i siti archeologici e lo fanno anche però perché questo soprattutto mi è capitato di vederlo a, uh, a Tipasa possono trovare un po' di pace perché voi sapete l'Algeria è comunque un paese eh, ehm, abbastanza come dire con dove la, la pesa molto la, eh, la cultura eh, musulmana quindi le donne sono quasi tutte mh, velate eh, hanno avuto una regressione rispetto agli anni, agli anni 60-70 e quindi ad esempio non è, non è possibile passeggiare nel centro di Algeri per una, una coppia, allora vanno uh, a passeggiare a, uh, a Tipasa eh, o uh, a Gemila. Mm, idem nei musei, uh, sì ci sono effettivamente uh, delle, delle, delle visite anche de, de, delle famiglie, uh, però manca assolutamente anche una, una mediazione, non ci sono uh, visite guidate, non ci sono laboratori, manca tutto, è tutto da rifare uh, dalla, uh, alla Z. E quindi questo provoca anche naturalmente eh, delle aberrazioni perché qui come potete vedere c'è un bar ristorante che è installato nelle terme eh, di eh, Tipasa questa è la situazione nell'anfiteatro di, eh, di Tebessa questo nelle mura eh, bizantine di, eh, di Mila qua c'è una foto che è mh, stata appunto con, con, con un filtro per vedere cosa viene inflitto 
ai, eh, ai rilievi mh, nel, eh, preistorici nel, nel Sahara, questa è una foto, le, le foto precedenti sono prese da un, da un sito Facebook che si chiama Memoir eh, Amperil, che è questo, questa sorta di, eh, insomma, di, di gruppo di attivisti algerini che, di cui fanno parte anche alcuni archeologi ma anche persone della società civile che cercano di tenere alta l'attenzione su quello che succede senza quasi mai trovare sponda né nelle, nelle istituzioni né nella stampa che resta mh, poco attenta a, uh, a queste problematiche e questa è la situazione invece una uh, foto che ho fatto io nella, nella casba di, uh, di Algeri che si trova uh, non è mh, sicuramente la peggiore ma potete immaginare è tutto a questi, uh, a questi livelli e eh, questa è un'ultima eh, diapositiva per accennare a un'altra problematica ehm, che riguarda eh, l'Algeria e cioè alla ehm, eh, l'ideologizzazione dei, di alcuni monumenti ehm, questo è un il basamento di un, eh, di un mausoleo che si trova eh, a una ventina di chilometri da, sempre da, da Costantina, quindi dall'antica Cirta, e, eh, che è conosciuto come tomba di, eh, di Massinissa. Quindi Massinissa, come sapete, è il, il primo re numida conosciuto attraverso le fonti greche romane, è una vera e propria gloria eh, dei, dei paesi africani che si riconoscono appunto in questo re che oppose resistenza ai, eh, ai romani eh, gli scavi furono effettuati da, dai francesi da un architetto francese Bonel nel 1915 eh, venne confermato che si trattava di, eh, di, una, eh, di una tomba ma degli scavi successivi nel 1970 hanno ehm, chiaramente hanno eh, eh, contestato queste ipotesi perché ehm, le ceneri sulle quali sono state fatte le ceneri funerarie delle analisi risalgono a, a un'epoca, a un'epoca ehm, precedente però eh, cosa succede? che lo Stato eh, algerino rifiuta di accettare l'ipotesi scientifica e questo ho potuto constatare che non avviene soltanto per questo monumento a El Krub ma anche in tantissime altre eh, Occasioni, quindi c'è un rifiuto delle tesi scientifiche quando non sono ehm, funzionali alla narrazione che loro hanno deciso di fare del, ehm, del loro paese. Eh, quindi in questo senso c'è un'appropriazione di un monumento ehm, che però ehm, è una, un'appropriazione in debita, nel senso che non è la, eh, la tomba di, eh, di Massinis. E qui la situazione si complica ulteriormente perché è diventato anche un simbolo per la comunità Amazig che come sapete però non è ben vista dal, dal governo quindi ci sono problematiche molto molto eh, molto molto complesse e eh, sarebbe molto eh, interessante eh, continuare a, a aprire un vero e proprio progetto perché non, non esiste, nessuno ha mai lavorato su queste, su queste problematiche perché credo che sia un caso di, eh, di decolonizzazione eh, un po' eh, anomalo. <ride> Grazie per l'attenzione. Thank you, Valentina, for this, this sad story I could find of a fake news in archaeology. <laughs> and uh, and I asked Valen- uh, Simona, please, to come here for the second part of the discussion. And uh, are there questions for the one? Volevo chiedere su questi film dell'Istituto Luce, eh, che sono molto interessanti, non, io non li conoscevo, eh, immagino che ce ne siano tanti altri che raccontano il patrimonio cioè, archeologico eh, nei cinegiornali, no? Ecco, esi- eh, ne avete fatto una mappatura, una catalogazione, diciamo, inter, eh, insomma, specifica? Eh, Ecco, e, mh, 
perché appunto eh, alla luce del, di questo straordinario film che è stato fatto da Mark Hasin sul di marcia su Roma che immagino avrete visto insomma no? questa eh, ricostruzione frame by frame e con eh, tra la metodologia diciamo di riflessione che il Casins ha sperimentato forse eh, sarebbe interessante proprio lavorare in questa linea no? perché quel tipo di materiale restituisce una, una chiave veramente profonda eh, dell'immaginario no? Del, ecco, piuttosto che vedere l'intero film no? a un pubblico eh, preparato per quanto preparato la, il film di montaggio con il, quindi diciamo, smontaggio e rimontaggio credo che restituirebbe una, una bella prospettiva insomma grazie documentary and uh, news reels so uh, ruins became a very important topic colonial ruins a very important topic in the uh, this uh, um, colonial propaganda because they can reach um, a very differentiated public also through images of by institutional users so i think all this material is very very interesting to explore chiedere in italiano sì eh, o, o chiedo in inglese poi rispondete in ah. so um, I have a question for both of you uh, first for Simona um, about the whiteness and the limitation of the spaces is there any evidence that there is um, a difference in class because of course in, uh, in Egypt we assist the same but the high class of course is a different question altogether so Uh, of course, the king, the aristocracy, those connected with the Ottoman Empire uh, can go, and then there is, of course, the differentiation of um, the, 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 the poor people who are not aimed at as being uh, admitted or being a public that you talk to. Do you assist to that uh, the same, or are only the Italian and the white that can go? question that I cannot, uh, it's impossible to see from the sources. But um, it's very interesting the fact that this kind of barriers is a barriers that we, we, we found also in Italy. Yes. I mean, the uh, isolation and the monumentalization of these uh, ruins are something that uh, um, it's uh, uh, at the roots of the patrimonialization. The question is that here there is the racial question. So the barrier, uh, it's a barrier that uh, it's constructed on the line of colors. And I think this, this made the difference between the, yeah. the monumentalization that at the same period we have in Rome, no, exactly. for instance. So, Mali, yes, yes, it's the same. And it's also a question of class, of course. Here, the question of class is uh, intertwined with the question of race. And, and then the, the core is the, the nature of the colonial situation, so the, the domination and the um, asymmetry of the relation of powers. Yes, I will, I will show this afternoon because it happens in Egypt as well, and it's interesting to see, but I will show that it happens also nowadays, done by Egyptians. Uh, and then it's the question for you, Valentina. Um, Uh, there is um, so this divide, which is something uh, that we really have to work on and to realize. Also, going back to what Robin was saying yesterday, so it's not only uh, the museum, but there is also the academic discipline where we still have the roots of colonialism, and there is a divide by from local population and the uh, academic activity is whether Egyptology or uh, classical archaeology that's seen as what the, the colonial powers were doing there. Um, and it's very interesting to see how the same categories are now applied uh, by Egyptians. Um, but the, the main difference uh, to, um, uh, to, to what you showed us about uh, Algeria, I think, is only the fact that 
the, the, the place is still closed. I explain what I mean to say. Um, of course, this is a remnant of colonialism. Of course, the antiquities were used by colonials, either for tourism, for antiquities, or whatever. But then, the change in, uh, uh, in Egypt, and I think also a little bit in Mesopotamia, was tourism. But then, because of the local population, even though we didn't feel connected, but then tourism was the key. They had to take care of the antiquities because people would come and they would bring money. And also then all kind of activities develop. What we also see in, in Italy, in, in Tuscany, for instance, with illegal excavations, even if you're not interested in archaeology, but then you can sell antiquities, antiquity market, illegal, whatever. I think that the main difference now with Algeria is that this connection with an outside world does not exist. And it's interesting to see in Egypt, for instance, how, and I experienced just in my professional life, uh, in the last years, well, there is a main difference uh, that, of course, since the very beginning, even though there was a Cerises Antiquité, there is an Egyptian uh, archaeology, there is an Egyptian uh, scientific development, so they were always involved. And now, well, with the new regime, it's also interesting to see that uh, they uh, use the, um, the cultural heritage, as Mussolini did uh, in Italy, to see the, the root of their civilization. The divide of Islam doesn't work anymore because there is this narrative of the great, ancient, and unique uh, population. Maybe the difference is also that the Roman antiquities, anyway, are seen as a foreign uh, domination there. But I wonder whether, uh, if, to, if you know whether tourism is starting, if we're opening up, whether tourism could be the first key to uh, try to see the cultural heritage as a way to earn money. And as we said yesterday, money, unfortunately, is always the key also in this country. Rispondo in italiano perché sono più francofona che anglofona, poi semmai qualcuno mi, mi aiuterà a tradurre. Eh, sì, hai detto tutto perché non ho avuto il tempo di, di approfondire questo aspetto nella, nella mia comunicazione, ma ad esempio la, la differenza più eclatante eh, tra l'Algeria la, e ehm, la Tunisia e il Marocco, ma Marocco ha meno siti archeologici sicuramente della, della Tunisia e dell'Algeria è proprio il fatto che l'Algeria non è un paese aperto al, al turismo eh, quindi non, non sono mai stati interessati eh, anche diciamo, per convenienza come in Tunisia a, a proteggere e valorizzare i siti archeologici e i musei pensiamo al museo del Bardo a Tunisi che è uno dei musei più, eh, più importanti del, del Mediterraneo eh, uno dei più importanti al mondo per la collezione dei mosaici che è stato anche colpito nel insomma dal, eh, dal, dal terrorismo proprio perché era un luogo simbolico di, eh, di incontro di vari, eh, di vari popoli mediterranei eh, preso d'assalto chiaramente dai decroceristi e dai viaggi organizzati quindi in Algeria tutto questo non c'è stato perché fino eh, insomma da, subito dopo l'indipendenza c'è stata eh, che già mh, insomma era eh, è stata una, una guerra sanguinaria con tutte le, le conseguenze del caso nei rapporti con, difficilissimi con, con la Francia e con altri paesi europei eh, e poi c'è stato il cosiddetto decennio nero quindi in, in, in Algeria nessuno usciva di casa perché rischiava di essere eh, ucciso per strada quindi figuriamoci se qualcuno poteva permettersi di andare in, in Algeria in, in vacanza e ancora oggi rimane un paese chiuso ad esempio è uno dei paesi che è rimasto chiuso per più tempo ehm, durante, dopo la pandemia cioè io ho amici algerini eh, a Marsiglia che non sono potuti tornare a casa due anni, per due anni perché mentre tutti gli altri paesi avevano riaperto le frontiere l'Algeria no quindi è di fatto un paese che non ha mh, 
una eh, così una di già di per sé eh, una, un'apertura I, i turisti chi sono i turisti dell'Algeria sono i cosiddetti eh, sono i, eh, gli algerini della Francia che ritornano eh, in, in, nel paese durante le vacanze ecco però non c'è una vera politica turistica e quindi penso che sì hai ragione dipende molto da, da questo dal, dal fatto che eh, non, non avendo anche eh, non essendosi sviluppati da quel, dal, dal punto di vista eh, turistico sono rimasti più indietro rispetto agli altri paesi del, del Maghreb quindi sono una situazione che si associa ad un'altra e che rende veramente complicata la il rapporto anche con, con, con la ricerca, eh, con, con, con gli scavi, con la ricerca sul terreno di, europea. Beh, ci sono la, la, colleghi, la maggior parte degli, degli, degli studiosi eh, algerini eh, studia nelle università francesi, ecco. L'Algeria è ehm, ricchissima di università, però ci sono molte università private, molte università americane, eh, che però sono concentrate su altre discipline, sulla letteratura, sulla medicina, architettura, eh, ci sono anche la facoltà di archeologia, non è una facoltà prestigiosa ecco anche l'istituto nazionale del patrimonio in Algeria è meno sviluppato di, del, del, dell'istituto del patrimonio tunisino quindi no non è anche da questo, da questo lato hanno molte difficoltà hanno molta difficoltà ad uscire ad avere dei visti eh, quelli che risiedono in Algeria non, non possono partecipare ai convegni perché il paese non dà loro eh, i visti necessari per andare ai convegni quindi eh, sì, è una situazione difficile. Scusa, posso chiedere sì. perché i siti islamici sono tutti bene? Sono, si prendono cura? Dei... Eh, beh, non... Allora, eh, diciamo che di, di islamico sì, le, le, non è che, che ci siano grandi... Eh, grandi siti, uh, grandi monumenti tra le, le moschee eccetera, però molto è stato, è stato distrutto e, e quindi non è che si identifichino, hanno costruito molto più che altro, hanno dei monumenti che ne so, il monumento uh, dell'indipendenza e martiri dell'Algeria che è come un sito, possiamo paragonarlo a un... A sito archeologico, a uno dei nostri siti archeologici, non lo so, è loro eh, è il sito che attrae più visitatori in Algeria, eh, questo monumento con un museo annesso che è un museo che racconta in maniera molto molto faziosa la, eh, la guerra di indipendenza eh, calcando la mano appunto sul martirio eh, eccetera quindi ehm, sì li tengono sicuramente meglio ma ad esempio tengono malissimo eh, il, tutto il centro storico di Algeri cade in pezzi perché sono tutti con, sono degli edifici straordinari di architettura liberty che sono lasciati che non vengono ristrutturati perché eh, sono il retaggio della città coloniale Are there other questions? No? Simona? In the, uh, it's uh, um, for the question of tourism. It's, uh, it's true that uh, tourism mattered. And uh, in Libya you can see this when uh, Gaddafi, for, uh, for whom the uh, Roman heritage was a symbol of colonialism, Uh, in the uh, 80s, uh, changing completely his, his uh, approach to these kinds of ruins, uh, and these sites became UNESCO sites. And it was uh, a tourist reason. So. Okay, now it, there is the break for the lunch, and we will be back here at uh, 15 o'clock. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the um, chair of this uh, last session. Uh, we have Professor Simone Sisani here. 
He is a professor of uh, in Roman history at the Università dell'Aquila, where he teaches. And he worked on the phenomenon of Romanization in the Italic area. And lately, he had dedicated himself to the study of local administrative structures of the Roman Empire, with particular regard to the institutional structures of the colonial areas in the middle and late Republican age and the ideological aspects of Roman colonization. So, Simone, thank you for being here and chairing this session, and the floor is yours. Aspetta che ti devo passare questo. No, ma non penso di avere necessità di lasciare. Ma dobbiamo, per chi ci sta seguendo in streaming, dobbiamo, devo chiederti di usarlo. Bene, cominciamo la... Uh... Questa sessione pomeridiana e di chiusura di questo, di questo incontro, anzi ringrazio le, organizz le organizzatrici per l'invito a presiedere a una parte di esso. Mi scuso se non ho potuto eh, essere presente all'incontro stesso, ma avevo purtroppo impegni didattici. Eh, bene, eh, direi di, eh, di cominciare. Abbiamo come primo relatore di oggi pomeriggio William Carruthers, della University of East Anglia, è dottore di ricerca dell'Università dell di Cambridge, vanta numerose fellowships ed è in particolare autore di una recentissima monografia, Fruited Past, che riguarda proprio il, il tema di cui ci parlerà oggi con una relazione dal titolo Making Southern Archaeological, UNESCO's Nubian Campaign and the Recolonization of Archaeology. E cedo subito la parola al nostro relatore. Ok, well, thank you Simone, uh, thank you also Simona, Beatrice, everyone for being here. Um, is this, yeah. Okay, I'll just get on with it. Um, so, as controlling water uh, through irrigation enables the creation and control of economies, so that act enables the creation and control of futures, pasts, and the relationships between them. Across the 20th century, Egypt and Egyptians, a country and population first under British control, but then defined by nominal and actual independence, witnessed and took part in the construction of two major dams in the southern city of Aswan. The first of them, uh, the Hazan Aswan, or Aswan Dam, was built from 1898 to 1902 and heightened twice, from 1907 to 1911, and again from 1929 to 1933. The second, Saad al-Ali, the Aswan High Dam, um, was built from 1960 to 1970. This is the front page of Egypt's major newspaper, Al-Ahram, the pyramids, the day construction started. So this is 10 miles and at a much larger scale to the south of the first dam, uh, and in the process that extended the flooding connected to the structures into a newly independent and previously Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. So beyond their place as steps on the road to perennial irrigation in Egypt, uh, which was subject to the Nile's annual flood previously, uh, these dams have become emblematic of two things. In the case of the first Aswan Dam, the structure denotes the way in which British irrigation policy sought to harness the strength of the River Nile to grow cash crops and pay down Egyptian debt. In the case of the much larger High Dam, The structure has become emblematic of Egypt's, and particularly then Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser's role in the Cold War, um, ultimately part funded by Soviet money and built with the aid of Soviet experts. Britain and the US famously pulled financing for the High Dam after Nasser's policies of neutrality, and 1955 arms deal with Soviet proxy Czechoslovakia angered them. So there is, of course, more to the story of the two Aswan dams than this. Today, though, I'm going to talk about one story that often seems to go unmentioned, um, even in critical accounts of work on the structures, and which, sorry for the plug, my book, which is out now with Cornell University Press, available from all good booksellers in three weeks' time, I believe. Um, so my book, Flooded Pasts, UNESCO, Nubia, and the Recolonization of Archaeology, takes this story up. During their construction, the two dams helped to mobilize temporal and territorial moves whose ramifications were far-reaching, yet consequently became strangely uncontroversial, at least to those people whom that process didn't affect. So as I will relate, 
um, the discipline of archaeology forged in the imperial crucible that helped to make modern Egypt and Sudan proved central to that move, as did the post-war institution of UNESCO, which is obviously the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. More particularly, however, the 20th century imbrication of archaeology, tourism, and irrigation engineering at play here formed a potent brew. So I'm going to speak about the consequences of that mixture and also underline how those consequences speak clearly to current academic conversations, such as they are, about decolonization. So speaking today, it seems clear, at least to me and others, I know that decolonization has become an academic buzzword. But remember, too, that as I just related, the history of the two Aswan dams straddles not only Egypt's interwar period of nominal independence, but also the period of Anglo-Egyptian, although mostly Anglo, control of Sudan, and the era of formal decolonization in which Egypt and Sudan both became independent nation states. These are the free officers just after the coup in 1952 that sort of cements that process pretty much in Egypt. What happened in and around Aswan happened in a period when what was functionally meant by the word decolonization, at least in English and French, uh, was being defined. However, as the historian Elizabeth Leake has noted uh, in a recent collective article in History Workshop Journal, quote, as a scholar whose work is rooted in histories of decolonization, I'm struck by the fact that decolonization as a historical phenomenon is currently conspicuously absent. So Leek emphasizes that, quote, there is little discussion or reflection on the processes of empire and its ending, even though these are historical forces that have been absolutely crucial to the world we live in today, end quote. So in this talk, by addressing the Aswan dams, their colonial genealogies and post-independence consequences, I will draw attention to the processes that Leek highlights. Um, I will therefore emphasize how decolonization as a practice has never really been neutral and what that situation means for the people most affected by the two dams construction today. So in Arabic, of course, setting aside that it's not the only language relevant to Nubia, which I'm going to speak about, the word decolonization doesn't really exist. The word tahrir or liberation uh, is being used to describe the historical events in question it carries a rather different anti-colonial emphasis this is uh, yeah, formerly Midan Ismailir in the middle of Cairo, which is renamed Midan Tahrir, right? So decolonization is a historically contingent and overtly managerial term. As Stuart Ward has discussed, decolonization, as he says, was made in Europe as part of a major realignment of metropolitan assumptions and expectations with an ever-encroaching post-imperial world, end quote. It's what that process of management enabled, enacted through new international organizations like UNESCO, sometimes unwittingly, sometimes not, that concerns me, in addition to the colonial genealogies that powered these events, and the way in which newly independent nation states and their populations grappled with these conditions. More particularly, I'm concerned with how those populations were forced to grapple with water. Um, building the Aswan dams caused, as was to be expected, floods. Um, deluges of water filled the reservoirs that now coalesced in the region to the south of the structures. So this is a map stolen from the University of Chicago. Um, at increasing levels with each act in the two dams construction, those floods submerged the settlements where the people of that region, Nubians, lived. Uh, here you can see one just behind a temple being dismantled. There's a reason I'm using this photo. Right? When the first dam was built and heightened, many Nubians, while complaining vociferously about their incorporation within this project of the Egyptian state, moved their homes and fields away from the flood to higher ground. Many Nubian men, meanwhile, moved north to Cairo and Alexandria to work as servants, leaving their families behind in order to support them by sending money from the city's home. Um, with the construction of the high dam, however, moving to higher ground became impossible and Nubian migration took on a new, significantly wider reach. As the first Aswan Dam rose, its floodwaters stretched as far as Egypt's poorest border um, with what was then the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan at Wadi Halfa, sort of in the top right of the map there. Building on a steady stream of colonial tourism through Nubia, meanwhile, the Egyptian government sponsored a series of archaeological surveys that consti constituted an image of Nubia as one of a sort of racially backward but picturesque flooded ruin. Um, the view from the decks of tourist boats enabling a predictable focus on the ancient temples. Uh, here's Philae, just south of Aswan, uh, still partially standing in the region. 
even as those quote-unquote ruins had often been and continue to be reused, with contemporary settlements, as here, uh, Kalabsha built around them. When, in the late 1950s, it became clear that the Aswan High Dam would be built, so this depeopled view from the boat, as I call it, took on a doubled importance. So the High Dam's floodwaters, extending to a much higher level, would wipe out all trace of Nubian settlement and any hope, really, of moving the re region's remaining homes nearby. Uh, likewise, the size of the new structure meant that its deluge would extend significantly further south than Wadi Halfa. So the High Dam's reservoir, uh, in the end, reached as far south as the Nile Cataract at Dal in Sudan, which is 170 kilometers to Wadi Halfa's south. The reservoir itself in Egypt is called Lake Nasser. In Sudan, it's called Lake Nubia. Um, as initiatives to preserve the region's remaining ruins gathered pace, so it was the depeopled colonial vision of Nubia that governed what now happened, not only in terms of what was preserved, but also in terms of the forced migration of the Nubians oh, themselves. <laughs> that wasn't meant to happen. Right. Yeah. That's very strange, isn't it? Okay, um, yeah, so the forced migration of the Nubians themselves. Um, so if ever a place exemplified how the imbrication of colonial engineering, touristic infrastructure, and archaeological work might easily become tied to the post-war era of decolonization then, it was Nubia in the 1960s. And it was the touristic part of that entanglement I think is particularly important here, because the view from the boat became integral to how the archaeological and resettlement work that ultimately happened in the region might be carried out. So building on the interwar archaeological surveys of Egyptian Nubia, and after the Egyptian and Sudanese governments had made official requests of the organization, in March 1960, UNESCO launched, launched its international campaign to save the monuments of uh, Nubia. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> Um, the Nubian campaign, which, like many UNESCO actions, was reliant upon the financial generosity of the organization's member states, called for archaeologists, engineers, and other experts to descend on Nubia from around the globe and salvage the region's remains. Most famously, perhaps, the campaign, which lasted until 1980, uh, led to the cutting up, lifting, and reassembly at a higher level of the pharaonic era temples of Ramses II and Nefertari, sculpted into the rock at the site of Abu Simbel, near the Egyptian-Sudanese border. Uh, obviously, lots of temples then also moved around the world. There's one in Shirin, as we know. Um, at the same time, however, UNESCO felt free to ignore the plight of the Nubians themselves, an action which has come under repeated question in the following years. There are several reasons why UNESCO took that route. The first and most obvious being that as member states of the organization, Egypt and Sudan would have needed to request assistance from UNESCO if they'd required aid for the Nubians. Those requests were not forthcoming, because the two countries instead promoted essentially top-down plans for Nubian migration away from the high dam's floodwaters. So to Egypt's al Nuba al gadida or New uh, Nubia, um, this is uh, just this is a picture from an Egyptian illustrated magazine at the time of the um, time of the migration, sort of, it's like, um, sort of a very positive account of this, and that's what usually you would find. So New Nubia was located at Komombo, about 30 miles north of Aswan, uh, and then the Nubians also were forced to move to Sudan's Hashem al uh, which was a land reclamation scheme located hundreds of miles to the southeast on the Atbara River. Um, so effectively nationalizing their respective Nubian populations, and also they've long been racialized, right? In a quest for modernization, the resettlement destroyed the possibility of regular cross-border interaction that Nubians, whose personal and family ties did not necessarily respect the Egyptian-Sudanese border, had previously enjoyed. Um, so Egypt and Sudan also connected these plans to quote-unquote ethnological surveys grounded on functional notions, making Nubians the objects of applied anthropological work whose major goal was to make the management of their migration easier so if management exemplified the way in which European countries 
dealt with the move to decolonization, and sometimes, and unsurprisingly, I think, exemplified the ways in which newly independent nation states dealt with their populations too, particularly populations living on the borders. It also made casting Nubia as an unpeopled archaeological terrain significantly easier, an action that took on particular importance on the Sudanese side of the Nubian border, and one whose roots lay in the new country's colonial officialdom. Um, as had been the case in Egypt, in the decades before the construction of the Aswan High Dam started, officials in the country's pre-independence antiquity service, first British and then French, of course, men, uh, they're all men, um, became alarmed by the threat the potential new barrages flood posed to the ancient remains they thought were located in Sudanese Nubia. They also, probably not unreasonably, thought that archaeological work in Sudan had suffered by comparison to the survey and digging that was undertaken in its northern neighbour. So even as overseas interest uh, in Egypt had started to wane in the years surrounding World War II, hordes of Euro-American institutions had once jostled to carry out excavations in Egypt, as we know, uh, a situation which had not really been echoed uh, in the Anglo-Egyptian condominium, as it was known, whose resources for such work were limited. So the end of the condominium had arrived in January 1956, after a referendum uh, held in 1953 had seen a majority of the Sudanese uh, vote for self-rule. And in 1954, between referendum and formal independence, came self-government and the increased Sudanization, as it was known, of government posts. Um, in early 1955, Peter Shinney, who was Sudan's Oxford-educated commissioner for archaeology, as he relates, quote, was succeeded by the distinguished French Egyptologist John Vakuta on the grounds that a Frenchman being quote unquote neutral in the political issues then facing the Sudan was acceptable. So these jobs didn't always go to Sudanese people immediately, right? Um, having dug in Egypt after the Second World War, Jean Vakuta had overseen the French archaeological mission in Sudan since 1953. So Vakuta put that experience to work, using the print venues at his disposal to become what we might call a virtual witness to the fact, previously highlighted by Shinny, that Sudanese Nubia constituted what well, the phrase that was used was an archaeological terra incognita. Right? So whereas due to the previous surveys of the region, Egyptian Nubia, was considered almost entirely excavated before UNESCO's Nubian campaign began, in Sudan and Sudanese Nubia, it now became vital to claim the opposite. Almost immediately upon his appointment as director of the Sudan Antiquity Service, Fakuta made use of a variety of publications to highlight that Sudan would repay urgent archaeological excavation. So those publications included his department's relatively new journal, Kush, uh, first published in 1954, and the older Sudan Notes and Records, which had been established by the British administration in 1918 as a means of creating, quote, an encyclopedia of scientific information on the country and its people. That encyclopedia was thought necessary in order to ease Sudan's governance as an entity separate from Egypt, whose 1919 revolution and later nominal independence uh, declared by Britain had made that outcome necessary. There's a lot of ideas about the unity of the Nile Valley that are sort of doing the rounds at this time, coming from Egypt. As Bushra Hamad notes, uh, within the Sudan notes and records, quote, the British resorted to the diffusion of knowledge about the Sudan, especially from archeological sources, end quote, in order to counteract Egyptian claims over the country. So the pages of Sudan notes and records therefore made the importance of increased archeological survey in Sudan clear a point emphasized then by the appointment of the Oxford-educated archaeologist and administrator, Anthony Arkell, as the first commissioner of archaeology and anthropology in 1938. As the likelihood of Sudanese independence grew, editorial policy changed to balance anthropological and archaeological articles alongside pieces relating to the natural and social sciences. Such articles were thought to provide a basis for the enactment of modernization policies that the possibility of self-rule seemed to make realistic. So archaeology and anthropology, however, continue to be represented. So um, despite later being appointed as a, a quote-unquote neutral administrator, Jean Vakuta built on this earlier work. In his editorial notes in Cush's second volume, uh, Shinny, the former director, had suggested that the problems involved with understanding Sudan's past are as immense as the area involved. Only the most accessible parts of the country have yet been examined by the trained archaeologist, and even in these areas, the examination has been, in most cases, superficial. So Vakuta then later echoed this argument. 
In his own editorial notes to Cush's fourth 1956 volume, he noted that, quote, the best way we can show him, and he means Shinny, our gratitude is to carry on his work, end quote. This effort would involve, as he said, the help of all those scholars who take an interest in the archaeology of the Sudan, which is so complex and yet so little known. So in the next year's volume of Sudan Notes and Records, he then suggests a portion of Nubia on the Sudanese side of the region's border, quote, is always difficult of access, um, sometimes even impossible, except on foot, and consequently it is little known archaeologically. It is probable, therefore, that the real number of sites is greater than those noted on the map, end quote. So to a cohort of English language readers, Vakuta became a virtual, and they sort of mattered at this point, Vakuta became a virtual witness that Sudan, and in particular Sudanese Nubia, constituted potentially productive archaeological ground. Consequently, and rather unsurprisingly, Sudan's terra incognita became a matter of fact among certain British practitioners interested in the development of archaeological methodology, for whom access to the country continued at the time to be relatively simple. Those archaeologists themselves published their judgments about Sudan in key journals. So in 1954, and not for the first time, the British archaeologist OGS Crawford, oh, no, get there later, um, who was editor of the influential journal Antiquity, used the inauguration of Kush to describe undertaking fieldwork in Sudan, aimed at demonstrating, as he said, that the methods of field archaeology employed in Britain could be applied with equally good results in another and very different geographical environment. Reviewing this contribution then in 1955 Sudan Notes and Records, Crawford's archaeological compatriot Oliver H. Myers, who had excavated in Egypt, suggested that there seems to be nothing particularly confined to British archaeology about these methods. Still, it's not now the large spectacular Near, East, near Eastern excavation of the old type that is required, but careful survey and small-scale, carefully selected excavation of stratified sites. This point was especially true, he said, because Sudan is a fruitful field for the adventurous archaeologist. So readers of these journals thus witnessed and virtually verified the pertinence of a debate about the vast untapped archaeological resources of a country whose north was about to be flooded by the high dam. They also confirmed the way in which Sudan might be seen as experimental archaeological ground, a status which came to play a role as specifically archaeological documentation came into being there during the Nubian campaign. That they did these things, meanwhile, only aided the steps now taken by the Sudanese government in the face of the new dam's construction. So, after a military coup in 1958, Sudan's leadership changed. So, no longer under a parliamentary system and Prime Minister Abdallah Khalil, the country was now led by General Ibrahim Aboud and the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. As in other areas of governance in Sudan, that change in leadership, however, did little to alter archaeological policy. Yet strategies for dealing with Nubia started playing a role similar to other development schemes taking place in the country. In the early years of independence, Sudanese officials, who, as all the historian Alden Young relates, are concerned with balancing their budget, had realized, quote, that the enormous contribution of cotton to Sudan's national revenue meant that according to the logic of accounting, uh, the Gazira scheme, and this is taken from a promotional film made about it in the mid-1950s, uh, it's, which was uh, the Gazira scheme is a massive sort of British era irrigation project located southeast of Khartoum and as uh, Young relates a few other prominent irrigated schemes could credibly stand in for the territorial economy as a whole that move also as he says rationalised the decision of officials in Khartoum to ignore vast areas of the country and quote so archaeological work in Sudanese Nubia was sort of not the same as such schemes even as it's under even as its undertaking constituted the result of an irrigation project started in Egypt. Archaeology, though, uh, did play a similar role vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between newly independent Sudan's regional and national priorities. So, submitting its uh, an annual request for funding under UNESCO's participation uh, program, which is sort of the way you can request funds as a member state from UNESCO, in January 1959, the Sudanese government made use of the image of Sudanese Nubia as an untapped archaeological territory, while also characterizing the existence of that territory as explicitly Sudanese and intimating that it had the potential to contribute to national aims. Writing on behalf of Sudan's Commissioner for Development, 
Hilary M. Poole of the Development Branch of the Ministry of Finance and Economics in Sudan enclosed a request for three different projects under the headings of one, uh, museums and monuments, two, extension of library services, and three, promotion of education and enlightenment among the workers. So the museums and monuments project was top priority and incorporated not only a request for a chemist specialised in object cleaning, but also an expert in photogrammetry who was simultaneously an expert in air photographs. Um, Paul requested this expert because the government, uh, as was also the case in Egypt at the time, had undertaken a complete aerial survey of an important archaeological area lying between Faras and Kosha, Sudanese Nubia, in other words. And I think it's worth sort of noting that OGS Crawford, who I mentioned earlier and was the editor of this journal Antiquity, is considered to be one of the sort of pioneers of uh, aerial archaeology. So there's a theme running through this. There's a thread. What that survey revealed, meanwhile, was telling in terms of how Sudan's government now understood its developmental priorities. Um, prefiguring and attempting to ease the coming forced migration of the Nubian population, the report described the area as having once been, quote, very much more inhabited than it is today. Indeed, ancient settlements with formerly cultivated areas have been spotted. Existence of former cultivations has been checked by excavations, end quote. Paul therefore requested an expert in air photographs, not only uh, because they were needed, as he says, to spot the ancient archaeological sites, but also, again, quote, to determine the extent of formerly cultivated land. So Sudanese Nubia was not simply of local interest. Instead, it was of national and perhaps even international concern. Archaeological work in the region was going to be connected not only, uh, as they said, with the preservation of cultural heritage, including uh, in these reports they were asked for the establishment of a national museum, which eventually happens in the early 1970s, but also, as Paul noted, with the um, arid zone research, itself sponsored by UNESCO, taking place in Sudan. So British officials in Egypt have perceived the building of the first Aswan Dam and the possible destruction of ancient monuments by its floodwaters as collateral damage in the resurrection of pharaonic era engineering schemes and a once great civilization. We see similar sort of rhetoric in Egypt today. Um, in a post-independence echo of such thought, Sudan's request for international expertise now linked the coming destruction of ancient remains and Nubian homes to the development of national preservation infrastructure. It also linked that process to UNESCO's arid zone program, um, itself, as these things always were, developed with the collaboration of former colonial officials. So doing so would aid both the development of the country's agricultural productivity and also make Sudan a crucial node in what was known as the international battle against deserts that the arid zone program constituted. So the development of archaeological work in Sudanese Nubia could stand in for the development of Sudan more generally. Simultaneously, the country and its officials could stake out a role sent, yeah, in an international effort centred on what was known as the climatological Middle East, a quote-unquote desiccated area stretching from Morocco to India, which not uncoincidentally incorporated countries involved in the nascent non-alive movement uh, with whom UNESCO wanted to curry favour. And there was a strong non-aligned um, vein throughout the Nubian campaign. So the Archaeological Survey of India, for instance, comes to excavate in Egypt, uh, tries to excavate in Sudan, it doesn't work. Um, so the UNESCO major project on scientific research on arid lands had been launched in 1952, becoming uh, a major cross-departmental project for the organisation in 1956, after several years of preparatory work aimed at countering the threat of what was known as global desertification, the idea, and as, as people now will tell you, uh, scientific fiction, um, that, quote, because soils, vegetation, and climate were interdependent, human-induced deforestation and soil erosion could desiccate the environment, turning forests into savannas and prairies into dust bowls, end quote. At the same time, the project promised, as in the case of Sudanese Nubia, future agricultural development, which would enable UNESCO to establish, as the historian Perrin Selsa relates, its competency over the great underdeveloped regions of the world. The scaling up of that competency, though, also allowed the newly independent countries involved in the work to assert their own national priorities. Um, how am I doing? Okay, all right. 
that's all right. Okay. Um, thanks. As Perrin Selsa notes, um, quote, elites from developing countries needed to cultivate productive, loyal citizens, end quote. So like Egypt, Sudan now made the bet that Nubians, too, could best be socialised elsewhere in the nation-state. At the same time, the region that had once been their land might be used to power the high dam, helping to develop the nation through the division of flood water and other benefits specified in the 1959 Nile Waters Agreement that enabled, ultimately, the new barrage's construction. So this is a cross-border uh, legal agreement. Despite its forthcoming submersion, that Sudanese Nubia might, in addition, provide a possibility of national agricultural, uh, what seemed like redevelopment, only strengthened this strategy. So Sudan's request for an expert in aerial photography and aerial archaeology not only played into the growing popularity of such work in the discipline of archaeology, it also therefore represented a similar strategy to the Arid Zone program's own methodology. Um, what were known as integrated surveys developed for the scheme sought to trace, as Celsa relates, historical relationships between environmental factors rather than the separate characteristics of soils, climate, relief, and vegetation. Um, consequently, instead of thematic maps of particular, elements, of particular elements, integrated surveys began with intensive study of aerial photograph mosaics to identify what were known as recurring patterns that represented what were then called land units. In Sudanese Nubia, the use of and problems associated with similar photo mosaics, coupled with bodily experience of desert terrain, lent the archaeological survey that ultimately took place there a quality closer to arid zone research. So there, the US uh, archaeologist William uh, Adams, known as Bill Adams, uh, was employed as a UNESCO consultant, ultimately, to carry out this work. As part of this process, he created a huge sort of documentation center, as it was known. He also stitched aerial photographs of Sudanese Nubia into photo mosaics, which unfortunately I don't have a photo of, um, and used them to mark site positions after those sites had been located during the on-the-ground survey work that he directed. So the object of investigation was ultimately reduced to one recurring pattern, the desert, the sand that constituted it, and the archaeological sites that it seemed the only work in the desert could reveal. Looking for archaeological sites on and in the desert ground, Adams reinforced a perception of the featurelessness of so much of the desert terrain that had been produced during the difficult work of attempting to stitch together photo mosaics. As he noted, the desert, as colonial era officials had themselves suggested, in fact held a significant number of archaeological sites. So Sudan's archaeological blank slate came alive, even as Adams characterized its landscape as desert-like and exotic. So the Sudan Antiquities Service thus became the owner of a photo mosaic of the material remnants of its own visible but invisible antiquity. After more work than expected, the photo mosaics made a Sudanese past legible, even as the high dam's floodwaters submerged its remains, something from what had seemed like nothing. Simultaneously, the Sudanese government prepared to move the population that lived among those remains much further to the south, strengthening the perception that such remnants existed within an otherwise, at this point, barren desert. So Sudanese Nubians found themselves as disaggregated from antiquity as Egyptian Nubians had become from the ancient remains among which they too had lived. And even as those remains took on a specifically Sudanese aspect. Um, and I guess in conclusion, I think what this history reveals, and I've tried to stitch together and compress two different talks here, so hopefully this has worked, um, is first of all, I think the need to think about specifically um, material consequences, of, as this conference suggests, uh, suggests of colonialism and its practices that sort of live on through material practice. But also to ask the question, who is any of this discussion really for? So in Sudan, um, colonial experts, foreign post-colonial experts, I guess, uh, experts of the Sudanese state, but also the desert and water ultimately become spokespeople for what's going on here, never the Nubians. And I think that this is like a sort of recurring situation in the history of archaeology, essentially. And I, again, I think this is really a question of if there's a solution to that. And I'm not sure I have an answer, and I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Thank you.
ringraziamo William Carruthers per questa bella ricostruzione di questi intrecci tra archeologia, società, economia e eh, è adesso il turno di una, della seconda relazione di, di oggi, chiamo al tavolo Nora Shalabi, eh, dottore di ricerca alla Freie Universität di eh, Berlino, eh, attualmente eh, postdoc diciamo alla Humboldt Università sempre di, eh, di Berlino è eh, un archeologa che ha all'attivo diverse campagne di scavo in, uh, in Egitto e uh, ci parla, uh, ci presenta una relazione dal titolo di Abydos Paper Archive Exploring Early 20th Century Egyptian Antiquity Service Ledgers. Prego. So thank you all for coming today and thank you for the organizers. Uh, so today um, I want to talk a little bit about the Abydos uh, Paper Archive, which is a project I've been um, part of for a few years now. Uh, I'll begin with a brief introduction about the archive, uh, what it is and how we found it, um, and what kind of documents it contains, uh, and then talk a little bit about our project. Uh, in terms of uh, the sorting and organizing of the paper that we've been doing. Uh, and then I'll go through some of the interesting content that we have in the archive uh, and look at how uh, the study and documentation of this material can offer uh, fresh perspectives when thinking about the history of the discipline of Egyptology um, and bring to light aspects that have until now uh, remained quite hidden or invisible uh, in the traditional narrative that we often hear read about when it comes to the history of this, uh, the field of Egyptology in general. Ah, okay. So um, the archive was uh, first discovered by Ayman Domoroni, who's an antiquities inspector working in Abydos. Um, this is, you can see where Abydos is. Uh, he was carrying out uh, documentation work inside a closed room uh, in the Sedi temple in Abydos. And while he was there, he noticed that there was a bunch of paper uh, lying around in uh, bags and in heaps on the floor. Uh, when he looked a little bit closer, he realized uh, that these were documents that belonged to the Egyptian Antiquity Service. Um, and they were basically the written record uh, of the inspectorate of Abydos. So um, he found letters, ledgers, notebooks, and all sorts of other documents, uh, mostly written in Arabic, uh, with the earliest dating to uh, the early 1880s. Um, and the authors of these documents were uh, people from both uh, inside and outside of the Egyptian Antiquity Service, including uh, Egyptian inspectors, bureaucrats, archeologists, guards, um, and all sorts of government officials. So Abydos is quite an important site, uh, ancient Egyptian site, and today it's located in the modern governorate of uh, Suhaeg, which is about 600 kilometers uh, south of Cairo. So around the late 1800s, the Antiquity Service, which was then uh, run by the French, had set up inspectorates uh, in most of Egypt's governorates. So these are offices uh, that would oversee and manage all the archaeological uh, sites across the country. And Abydos was administered by the Suhaeg Inspectorate, which also fell under the jurisdiction of a larger inspectorate of Middle Egypt, and that also saw, uh, oversaw several other inspectorates in the area. 
And over the course of several decades, the Abidus Inspectorate's written records, so basically all the bureaucratic paper that had been amassed uh, over the years, had been collected and then stored inside uh, the Seti temple as a temporary measure, and then uh, apparently it was uh, forgotten about until uh, Ayman stumbled upon it. So the archive hadn't really been properly stored, as you can see on the slide. Uh, the documents had just been placed directly on the ground, forming these large uh, chaotic heaps. Um, so it was in quite a bad state. But uh, with the start of the project in 2017, uh, the team slowly began the process of organizing the documents and moving them into a better and more uh, suitable storage location and carrying out a preliminary uh, sorting process. So they were first cleared from the room that they had been originally found in and they were placed into an adjacent, uh, better equipped room uh, also inside uh, the slaughterhouse of the Sadi temple. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of work to deal with, a lot of dust. Uh, some of the paper had reached quite a deteriorated state uh, due to decades of uh, really bad and inadequate storage. Um, and then we started an initial sorting process at the beginning of the project uh, during our first season of work, uh, just so we could get a sense of what type of documents uh, we were dealing with, uh, what the different topics uh, we had in the uh, documents were. Um, and then through like this initial assessment, uh, we came up with these general uh, key points about the archive's contents. Uh, so the date range at the moment is between uh, 1883 to the 1960s. Um, although we think we might find earlier documents as more of the archive is um, documented. Uh, it's difficult right now to have a final count of the total doc number of documents that we have, but they're definitely in the tens of thousands. Uh, the records are for the most part written uh, in Arabic, but we do have uh, a number that are in English and French. Um, oh, you can't see the rest of the slide. But, uh, and while the documents uh, deal primarily uh, with the site of Abidus and other sites in Suheg in general, we have a lot of material from other uh, sites like the Kharga and Dakhla oases um, and also sites in Asyut, Minya, and Fayum, uh, so both north and south uh, of uh, Abidus. Um, so when we first started, the, the archive that we had acquired uh, was the one belonging to the Vitus Inspectorate. Well, of course, we quickly realized that other inspectorates probably had similar paper documents uh, that they had likely also uh, stored away somewhere, um, so similar to what ha the Vitus Inspectorate had done. Uh, and because we were worried that uh, the archival material would perish if it was left as we had found the Vitus archive, uh, we started to ask around. Uh, to see if other inspectorates had paper documents as well. Uh, and we actually found that several of them did actually have a similar situation as that of Abidus. Uh, and these include the um, inspectorates of Baliana, which is the modern city or modern town where Abidus is located. Uh, we also uh, found uh, um, paper documents in Suheg itself uh, and in Luxor which is south of Abidus, and then this one, which you can't see, because uh, I don't know, I can't, the entire slide isn't showing up, but uh, this is uh, Tuna Gabal at the bottom here, and this is located to the north of Abidus. Um, so in agreement with these other inspectorates, we were able to transfer all these documents uh, to Abidus, where they can now be properly stored uh, and preserved, hopefully. Um, and after carrying out a quick examination of some of these documents that we had acquired from the other inspectorates, we found that we could match up a lot of the correspondence between the different inspectorates. So letters that were sent from the Abidance Inspectorate were found in the Tuna Gabal material and vice versa. And the same with other locations. Uh, so they had obviously all been interconnected in the past and then connect, connecting them today would really help us paint uh, a more complete picture of how these inspectorates had been operating. Uh, so where is all this material being stored? Um, at the moment, uh, some of the material is still in the same part of the temple where it had originally been found, but of course now arranged properly, stored on shelves. Uh, but at the same time, uh, recently we acquired an abandoned building uh, near the Seti temple uh, and belonging to the Ministry of Antiquities, uh, and we've refurbished uh, parts of it uh, in the hope of turning it into a suitable long-term storage facility uh, and workspace for the documents. 
and eventually creating a central repository for similar archives uh, found throughout uh, Upper and Middle Egypt. Uh, so we've already moved the Tuna Gabel archive here, and we're waiting, waiting to refurbish uh, more of the building before uh, we move, remove the remainder of the, of the documents. Uh, so what are the kinds of documents that we have? Uh, we have lots of different types. Um, so the largest category uh, so far is this loose paper, uh, which is basically standalone documents that were not found inside any files or bundles, uh, and they're just mostly different types of letters that were sent back and forth between inspectorates and other offices around the country. Uh, and then we have ledgers, uh, and these are books of entries of the inspectorate, uh, where any document coming in or going out of the inspectorate was recorded. It could be formal or informal, uh, and they usually contain a summary of the letter's contents. Um, and ledgers are really insightful because we get a window into the day-to-day -day of the inspectorates and what the main issues were that the antiquities employees were managing and how this was changing over time. And we'll look a little bit more at the ledgers later on in the presentation. Uh, we also have registers, uh, and these are books that um, have detailed lists of land uh, that was owned by the Antiquity Service, uh, like this one, for example, dates to 1950, uh, and it records the name of that's given to the plot of land, its number, dimensions, and where it's located. Uh, we have also indices, which is this uh, list type um, that record the number of particular files in connection to employees in the antiquity service, different sites, uh, encroachments, uh, guards, uh, and other topics. And it's basically the bookkeeping and archiving of the inspectorate. Um, and then there are files um, uh, where uh, they, some particular files are, we found that are, um, they're related, or documents that are related to one another have been collected and uh, placed inside files. So for example, uh, several files have the documents, uh, all the documents that belong to a specific employee, and they can contain things like his or her inspection reports over the years, their drawings, uh, personal yeah. records, um, anything they wrote uh, or did, basically. And then we also have uh, a variety of uh, maps and other types of illustrations, and some of them are annotated. Um, in terms of the type, the content that we have in these documents, it's difficult to, um, often quite difficult to categorize uh, just one topic or one item because there's usually a, a lot of overlap uh, in one document, um, uh, but we've uh, narrowed some down and these are some of the um, broad uh, list of broad topics that we use in our documentation system. Uh, so for example, official, unofficial letters, things which are uh, more official coming like from the um, ministries like circulars, memos, reports. We also have uh, permits, lots of permits for different types of activity, uh, tickets, uh, to visit archaeological sites, uh, telegrams, and all different types of communication that would take place, forms, uh, legal documents, uh, financial documents, and uh, receipts. Um, so what uh, we really hope that this project achieves over the long run um, is to bring to light uh, some of the stories and histories of Egyptians and their involvement in the field uh, during Egyptology's formative years, um, histories that have been missing from uh, the traditional narrative of Egyptology and how it developed as a dis discipline. So rather than the focus being on the history and contribution of Western scholars and their institutions um, and their work in Egypt at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century and looking at the development and accumulation of knowledge about ancient Egypt through their viewpoints and perspectives, we want to highlight the roles of other individuals in the story who have kind of been left out and are just kind of shadows in the background. And that although there has definitely been a noticeable increase uh, in recent years in the number of studies that are attempting to look at things uh, differently and which are incorporating uh, non-Western Western accounts into the narrative or examining the colonial legacy of the discipline or looking at problematic histories of artifacts, um, not just in Egyptology, but worldwide, there, are certainly, there certainly still remains a lot of work to be done. And I find, for example, that a lot of recent studies on the history of Egyptology uh, quickly slip back into this familiar and tired narrative of Western heroes and Western achievements without casting a critical eye uh, into, onto any of these histories. Uh, so I think what is important as well, when it comes to the Abidus archive, is thinking about and adopting uh, wider definitions of what exactly constitutes Egyptology and what it means to work 
in Egyptology. So it's not only about the archaeologists and the excavations and the finds, but includes many more issues that make up the entire Egyptology landscape, uh, like encounters with local residents, for example, living next to archaeological sites, um, and the histories of these encounters, or uh, negotiations with uh, other state bodies, or the transformation in people's relationship with their land and with the dirt on archaeological sites. And to view all this um, through the heritage institutions of the time and also to attempt to highlight uh, the main actors that were involved during this time period. Um, so in the next part of the presentation, uh, I'd like to present some examples from the archive and examine the ways in which they can enrich our current discourse uh, on the history of the field. So, um, sorry. Um, so what have, uh, some of what we've been looking at recently uh, is trying to uncover the lives of people who worked within this institution. So for example, uh, we traced the career of someone uh, whose name we kept coming across in a lot of the documents we were recording. Uh, his signature was everywhere, uh, but we didn't know who he was or what his exact role was. Um, and after examining about uh, 500 documents uh, with his signature, uh, Joseph Musawar, and these date from uh, 1910 to 1930s. We discovered that he started off as uh, started off as a nazir or principal of the Egyptian Antiquity Service, and he was based out of the Cairo Museum. And then in his final years, he became uh, the director of an administration. So it was interesting to learn about this person, about his responsibilities as uh, the head of the administrative matters in the Antiquity Service, and just and to see how these responsibilities has changed over time. Uh, and then we also examined uh, a ledger belonging to an antiquities inspector by the name of Taufiq Boulas, uh, and it dates to 1914. Um, and it contained copies uh, of all the letters uh, Boulas sent to his colleagues, other inspectorates, government officials, um, about everything involved with his work as the inspector of Abydos. Um, and we learn a lot about him, what he was dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis when it came to uh, the archaeological areas that he was responsible for, uh, what problems he ran into with guards, with local residents, uh, the bureaucracy, uh, his foreign supervisors, uh, and so on, um, and how he tried to solve these. Uh, so basically we have what we can think of as these invisible records, so a large number of reports and documents to, uh, related to the administration of heritage that usually remains hidden uh, from public view. And finally, um, the last person, Hassan Husni, were able to trace his career. Uh, and he's interesting because he initially graduated uh, from Ahmed Kamel's short-lived school for Egyptian Egyptologists uh, that ran through the Boulet Museum between 1822 and 1885. Uh, and even though we hear about him briefly in Maspiro's service reports uh, and in both the uh, Petrie and Reisner archives, he seems to disappear afterwards, and once one gets the impression that he had been dismissed from the service. Uh, but from the archive, we were able to confirm that he uh, continued to work, monitor, and inspect archaeological sites for a long time before he retired in 1925. So like Bolas, uh, he had a role in the administration and management of uh, hundreds of heritage sites during his time as an inspector, and a role that was documented through the paperwork that he produced on a daily basis, and which has now given us a chance to shed light on the type of work he was carrying out during the discipline's early days. Um, but it's important uh, to say that we're not trying to explore the lives and stories of the ind these individuals to try and glorify them and present them as the great forgotten Egyptian Egyptologists, because if we did that, we'd just be replicating the uncritical biographies of Western approaches to the subject that we're trying to critique. Uh, we're simply trying to bring attention to the space that these individuals occupied in this newly emerging uh, field of Egyptology, and more specifically in administering the archaeological sites of the country so that we can try and write a more holistic history of the discipline that enriches the story uh, a little bit. Um, we also, other types of documents uh, that we have are those uh, that deal with antiquities dealers. Um, so the sale of antiquities in Egypt was legal up until 1983, um, and from the documents in the archive we can get a glimpse into this practice. So we uh, get the names of the different dealers and the regulations um, that were set by the antiquities service. So we have letters, for example, that outline the new instructions and regulations that dealers had to abide by. So we have one from Pierre Lacot that dated to, uh, dates to 1921. 
And he instructs dealers, for example, to add a new column uh, to their books in order to record the name of the person who purchased the antique, his or her address, uh, and the object that had been purchased. Uh, in other letters, um, we learn the names of the antiquities dealers, such as uh, Riyad, Riyad bin Yamin, uh, who was renewing his license in 1922. And then we have Khairi Shahid Faltas, an antiquities dealer in Akhmim in 1947. So again, these documents uh, can bring to light more information about these practices and influence they had on the discipline during its uh, early years. Um, so another sub a project we have started working on recently at the archive uh, is a more in-depth examination of the ledgers and how the purpose and content changed over time. So um, as mentioned early, earlier, these ledgers were office books of entries that logged all incoming uh, and outgoing correspondence of an inspectorate. And each uh, entry in a ledger had a serial number, a summary of the contents of the letter, uh, the, and reference numbers to other related correspondence. So they present us with a unique source of information uh, for reconstructing in detail uh, the inner workings of local administrative offices um, and the role of local antiquities officials. And so by focusing on the basic categorization of the transactions, we can begin to identify general trends in the administration of the inspectorates during the first half of the 20th century. So um, we can see differences, for example, in, uh, in the ways in which information was recorded uh, from 1884 to the 1930s. Uh, in the earlier ledgers, like the ones we see here, um, the entire letter, uh, both that, that was received and that was sent, was written out uh, in full. Uh, but later, in the 1930s, only uh, single line summaries uh, were written, like you can see here also, on this N-word and outward pages. So this likely signified an increase uh, in the activity of the inspectorate, which now had a lot more work and people involved uh, and less time to record everything uh, meticulously as before. Um, so as part of the sub-project, uh, uh, 19 letter ledgers have been, which have been translated uh, from Arabic to English and we're still in the process of examining their contents. Uh, the earliest ledger we have uh, dates to 1883 and belonged to an inspector called Ahmed Atay from Abidas and it only contains 11 entries. Um, the latest uh, in date is an outward ledger uh, from 1929, and this, in contrast, contains 346 entries. We do have several gaps. Um, for example, there's a 40-year period uh, where ledgers are missing um, for, from 1921 to 1928. It's still not clear uh, if we haven't, haven't found them yet or they never survived, so we still have some gaps um, between these dates. Um, for one year, for example, in 1896, uh, we were lucky to have both the inward and outward ledger, and so we're able to look at the back and forth correspondence that took place between the Suheg or the Abidus Inspectorate um, and other government institutions during a 12-month period and what types of issues they were dealing with. So, for example, here from the entries, we know that the, the inspector at the time was someone called Muhammad Afandi Ahmad. Uh, on August uh, 22nd, he was asked to look into a request uh, of a foreigner by the name of Franco who wanted to purchase a plot of land in the site called Nag Hamedi in order to build a sugar factory. Uh, and then you see, you, have, you see these entries that continue over the course of several months uh, with Muhammad Effendi visiting the site several times and recommending that test pits be dug um, prior to any handover of the land to the factory because it was close, obviously, to an archaeological site. And then in the end, you get by December 12th that the issue had been resolved and the land was handed over to the sugar factory. Um, so we also hope uh, to examine uh, through the analysis of the ledgers um, and to see whether there is a shift in the frequency of topics mentioned over time and how they relate to the broader changes that were taking place in Egypt maybe changes in attitude toward the country's heritage or the new antiquities laws that are being issued. Um, so for example, in the graphs here, uh, you see the, the first one is the number of types sebech, the times that sebech was mentioned uh, in all the ledgers that have so far been examined. Um, and there appears, it appears to be a peak from 1895 to 1905. Um, and then after that, it's mentioned a little less frequently. So we 
would, would be interesting to look as well, to why. Um, also, illegal digging uh, is another matter that the inspectors of the antiquity service uh, were constantly uh, grappling with. And you can, you can see here on the graph that it was a frequent topic in most ledgers over time. Um, so how can these shifts in uh, frequency of topics be connected with political or cultural changes uh, that were taking place at the time or to the inner workings of the antiquity service? Um, we'll also uh, be looking at the frequency of archaeological sites that are mentioned over time. So for example, here uh, between 1896 and 1899, the site of who uh, seems to have had several problems. It's indicated in orange on the graph, uh, but the years before and after it hardly gets any mention. Um, and then in, uh, another analysis is to trace the um, social history of people connected to, with the antiquity service, such as, for example, this uh, individual called Abdul Khaliq Gadarab. Uh, and he began as a temporary rafir in um, a site called Sheikh Hamad uh, in 1905, uh, but then we see through examination of the ledgers, that by 1925 uh, he had been promoted to a Sheikh Rafir or Sheikh Guard uh, in Soheg. So it's interesting to trace uh, these histories. Um, so in the following slide, I just want to highlight some of the topics that we encountered uh, in some of the ledgers. So in this one, for example, um, it's ledger number. Uh, it dates to 1883, um, and uh, entry number 10 outlines the scientific work that was carried out by the first Abidus inspector we know of at the time, Ahmed Afendi Tayyib, who I had mentioned earlier, um, at an archaeological site in Naga Awled al Sheikh. And it's actually the earliest instance we have of such an undertaking in the archive. Uh, so the inspector has sent a short report about his efforts to the main office of the Egyptian Antiquity Service in Cairo, and he writes a letter to His Excellency, the Director of the Historical uh, Antiquity Service, uh, based on the letter you issued on the 17th of October. I went to Naga Awled al-Sheikh with the necessary paper. I copied the writing that was on the statue, the columns, and the temple. I also measured its length and width with a wool thread. Uh, one of them was the long thread for the height of the statue and the other for its width. And here are 12 printed papers or drawings enclosed and with them are the two pieces of measured thread for your inspection. Um, in uh, ledger three, which dates to 1883, um, an entry in the form of, the tab of a table list the artifacts that had been found in the sebeh that farmers were using for fertilizer. So sebeh is this decomposed mud brick of ancient structures and archeological sites, and it was used as agricultural fertilizer uh, during this time. So although it had been accessible uh, to farmers and locals living next to these ancient sites, and who had been free to remove the quantities they desired, uh, whenever they needed to, uh, regulations to control this were gradually taking shape as Egypt began to monitor and manage its heritage sites more closely. So um, how this process was initiated and the gradual steps that were taken in order to police and oversee this activity becomes clear in the ledgers as one proceeds from one year to the next. So the text from ledger three uh, is the first example we have of these regulations beginning to take hold. And you can see it's um, a list of antiquities that were found by the guard in the farmer's uh, sebeh or uh, by the inspector, and he lists all the different uh, types of objects and their number and the description. And one of the things we would like to do um, is to connect these entries that we have in the ledgers about sebeh um, to the countless loose documents and file we have in the archive that deal with the issue of sebeh. Because Sebech removal is such a common practice at the turn of the century, and it continued to, to be so for several decades, it's actually very well documented in the inspectorates. And we have tables that list the names of the archaeological sites where Sebech was being removed, uh, the date of the removal, the name of the guard who monitored the removal process, and the amount paid to the inspectorate for this activity because uh, you had to give money to the inspectorate to remove this, uh, to this dirt. Uh, and each guard who provided in this activity, for example, had to sign a pledge stating that he would hand over any antiquities that were found during the removal process. So um, the records we have show just how widespread the practice was across the country and which sites were more severely affected um, relative to others. 
So we can track uh, how the archaeological landscape changed over time due to this practice and alternatively how farmers and locals were affected over time as policies became more and uh, more stringent. Um, in Ledger 130, uh, which dates to 1892, uh, it contains numerous entries that has, had been sent to various police stations requesting that police officers assist in certain districts to uh, arrest antiquities, thieves, and looters. And this type of correspondence signals the early collaboration that was taking place between the Egyptian Antiquities Service and the Ministry of, Inter of Interior in a new objective to secure and guard heritage sites from local residents who as, can, who, as can be seen from the correspondence, were regularly reviewed with suspicion. So in this entry from Ledger 130, um, a plea is sent to a police officer of the town of Bardis um, near Abydos, and he says, um, this is a letter to the deputy police officer of Bardis in response to the letter that was sent from um, Radwan Raga from Beni uh, uh, Gamil, who was hired to safeguard the new antiquities that were found between El Mamra and Beni Gamil. He explains in his letter that the residents broke something uh, while digging for antiquities uh, in, the in the aforementioned areas and in the adjacent areas. And due to the large number of residents, it was impossible to stop them without a force. Uh, it was necessary to inform you, and I would be grateful if you do the necessary to help according to the law and to stop the residents who are trading in antiquities. So a few years later, however, it seems that the relationship between these different state bodies was no longer on very good terms uh, because the inspector of, uh, uh, of Abydos writes in a later ledger in 1899 uh, that the police are no longer to be trusted are in, and are in fact collaborating with the looters. So he, he writes, uh, I wrote to you previously concerning um, renting the piece of land uh, in an archeological site called Hu. And the current situation is as follows. Uh, when I went to the area to inspect the land about which you sent this letter, I found the piece of land uh, which I mentioned at the beginning had been rented and planted, and parts of it were being prepared for farming, and ancient, ancient structures were being trimmed and removed. When I asked the Umda, or like the mayor of the town of, of this area, how this happened, he said that this land was rented to the deputy officer of the Nega Hamedi police station. Even after the Onda had objected to the deputy uh, that it was not permissible to rent this land because it contains antiquity, antiquities, but he was unable to stop him. Uh, so please look into this and carry out what is necessary, given that the police stations do not care about preserving archaeological sites at all, but in fact hand over antiquity land to the residents either to rent or own. So it's interesting to see how uh, relationships between these different state bodies were changing over time and who was trying to assert their control over um, archaeological sites. Um, finally, um, uh, uh, from this ledger, number 10, dating to 1896, uh, it was sent by the Antiquities Inspector of Abydos to the director of the antiquity service requesting funds to excavate ancient remains that had recently been discovered in a nearby locality. So he writes, I was informed that an ancient cemetery was discovered uh, in the eastern mountain between Hamr al dum and Gabal al tarif in Naga Hamedi. I went to inspect this cemetery and found small tombs in the mountains. Uh, some of the residents of Farshut were digging here and uncovered coffins with mummies. I hired the necessary guards to protect the cemetery. Please send money in order to uncover the cemetery. So it's interesting to trace how many of um, these relatively unknown sites were being uncovered and excavated by the inspectors of the antiquity service over time, and which ones, if any, eventually form part of our current knowledge of uh, ancient Egyptian history and its process of rediscovery. Um, alternative wood sites have faded into obscurity along with their main protagonists uh, and the context in which the events uh, unfolded. So with, with such anecdotes now made available to us through uh, the, the archive, we can explore how such additional knowledge uh, might alter our current perspectives on the history of uh, the discipline. So. Um, Finally, uh, the project hopes to continue uh, the documentation of the thousands of records that remain and which we have recently acquired as well and uh, so that we can ultimately add to the social memory of the archaeological sites of Soheg and further afield. 
uh, and established bottom-up narrations that involve Egyptians and the ways in which they were engaged with their heritage during this time period and essentially shed light on those who have too often been sidelined and marginalized. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. You can, I think you, her, some water. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can stay. Bene, grazie a Nora Shalabi per questo saggio di, di quello che è uno scavo non archeologico ma all'interno di un archivio che credo prometterà eh, ancora molte, molte novità. Bene, direi di dare inizio alla, alla discussione, forse non, forse non ha senso dividere eh, nettamente insomma, tra le due relazioni, per cui se qualcuno vuole intervenire sull'una o sull'altra relazione che sono un po' diciamo quasi speculari perché abbiamo un nel caso della relazione di William Carruthers abbiamo una, come dire, una, una presenza esterna che sollecita l'archeologia c'è già qualcuno? Prego, sì. Ah, perfetto. Avviene lei, sì. Thank you both, it was fascinating. Thank you. I just have a question for Nora. Uh, because you told us, and that's a fascinating project, that your aim is to trace the histories of encounter, the people's transformation with lands, and so the other side of the archives. And my question is, when I was seeing your images, the, the papers or the archives that you found, they were inside folders, right? And the folders were already organized and classified according to a specific order. So there was an order of the archive that is colonial in a certain sense. Because I didn't see very well, but there were some French terms, English terms. So the ways in which the documents were put inside the folders was according to, let's say, a colonial order of the archive. So my how, and also not only the, the ways in which the papers were put inside the folders, but the ways in which also how the information was inscribed inside the sheets of paper, because you have lists, and it's, they were listed as, a tab, as tables. And to inscribe information as a list, and to list as a table, <laughs> it's a Western way of storing and producing knowledge. And so, there is an epistemological question here, isn't it? I mean, because you are dealing with a way of uh, keeping knowledge, producing knowledge, that is Western, and it was framed in the Western ways of classifying, ordering, whatever. And, and of course, you have a certain side of information. You have also some silence, no? <laughs> this is, I, I think it was really fascinating to read this and to, I had a lot of questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right because obviously we're dealing with an institution that was, um, it was French-led and it was um, during the colonial periods and it was established by uh, the West um, and it, but it was um, staffed mostly by Egyptians, which I think some people forget. Um, and uh, they were the ones who were running the institution, at least at the lower levels. And of course, yeah, we are, we are dealing with a institution that's definitely colonial, but I think what we can try and do is, um, because we're, the language is Arabic and the people who were employed were Egyptian, there's ways to try and get at certain stories that um, can tell us a little bit more about what was happening during this time period that's not just uh, handed to us through um, like the Western uh, structures. And I think that's, yeah, that's what we're trying to get at, like. Well, 
thank you both. I have a question for Nora. It was really fascinating, your lecture. And I think the material you are dealing with is so important also for the history of protecting and safeguarding cultural heritage by, um, by the Egyptians, which, uh, well, in the history, many people tend to forget, but what the, the four role that the Egyptians had in all that. Um, I have a question. Uh, it was very fascinating seeing how well the Taftish, and it's a role that is going on till today. I mean, how many forgotten heroes there are, even during the revolutions, that really fighting for their life, protected the necropolis. I myself working in Saqqara, I don't know what, how important the, the, the Taftish was working for protecting. Um, you say that many times you find uh, of um, information about Sir Hag and Nag Hammadi saying uh, the necropolis are endangered uh, and then uh, the, the inspectorate has to intervene. Do we have news of what happens to the objects? Can we also trace back if the objects then entered local museums or went to Cairo at the end? Thank you, actually, it's a very uh, good question because we've been struggling a little bit with that because we do get many uh, documents which say we found these objects and, we, and they list them and then we found these objects and there's so many, but we, we haven't been able to know afterwards where, where they've ended up. And we're hoping that with the, after acquiring these different other um, archives from different inspectorates, that we can maybe find a paper trail that will lead us to some destination where the objects would have ended up because uh, Abidus wasn't the main inspector, it was under the jurisdiction of uh, the one in Middle Egypt, which, and Tuna Gabal has actually, the one we got, the, in, uh, the archive we got recently from Tuna Gabal has a lot of, a lot more information which we discovered uh, when we acquired it, and we think that we could be able to trace where some of these things ended up and like, you know, follow the the correspondence, but so far it hasn't. We haven't been very successful in knowing where all this stuff ended up, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> I know you may not. This may not be an easy question to answer, but what do you think? Uh, you know, one of the issues with writing, doing projects like this, is the conditions of archival access in Egypt today. And so with my book, I got lucky, I got access to some archives. I, you know, I'm not sure how I did it. There's a whole load of security stuff. What you have is an archive that is still in an extent, to an extent delimited, I guess, by security considerations because it's the ministries. So you have like seasons of work, which, you know, speaking as a historian is something that's now like, it's, it's a funny term to me because you just go work in the archive. Yeah. Um, and I just, like, wonder how you see this, like, not necessarily limiting, but, like, shaping the work. And it goes back to Nelia's question about these are archives that are, you know, the ledgers are fixed in a certain way, the... the, the the nomenclature, the, all of this, the categorizations, and like, how does that still sort of shape what you're writing? Because I think for me, which is like, I couldn't really have talk about this, like, it, it shapes it. Mm -hmm. So I wonder with a project like this, which is really important, how, how that happens, basically. <laughs> you don't need well, to. <laughs> no, I mean, you're, it's, it's true about, um, Archival access in Egypt is very difficult, and um, uh, there's it's very difficult to access anything in Egypt, especially with the current military regime and this oppression we're all living under. And this, um, at the moment, I mean, with the Abidus archive, why we're lucky is that um, the Ministry of Antiquities doesn't see any value in it. Um, for them, it's just paper, and they actually. Uh, when it was discovered, they were in the process of burning it because it had. You're, after 100 years, um, you're, you can burn uh, government paper apparently, and uh, they were going to do that, and they were going to do that with the rest of the inspectorates until um, Ayman was very successful in stopping them. And so they they really feel that this is just it's, since it's not um, uh, objects, it's nothing pharaonic, temples, mummies. 
to them it has no value. Uh, so that's why we're able to work uh, freely and, um, and you know, they don't give us money. Obviously the money comes from funders from abroad, which is another problem as well, um, because we depend on, uh, on, on the West to be able to, uh, to fund our, our seasons. Um, but this is the situa situation we're in now. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I, a lot of people that I speak to who are historians are always uh, very fascinated by the fact that we have access to this material and we can have seasons and it's in a kind of, it's curated, but it's not curated because in a way, yeah, the archive itself had, had its own um, uh, process of um, archiving and so, but at the same time, it's not held under um, the, a governmental employee who decides what I can see and what I can't, but everything is accessible. So in a way it's also, it's, it's fascinating that we can do that. Um, and I just, I think it really helps us write a much bigger and broader narrative than we had envisioned for ourselves in the beginning because everything is there and we can um, explore lots of different things which maybe you're limited with what the access to the types of material you can you're that's able to that's see that's yeah you end up writing you know what what you could get to at the time what security permit allowed you yeah. to look at and this mm -hmm. yeah if there is or there was a decolonization of the recolonization that you talk about us. A colonization of yeah. I mean, I think that, yeah, I, mean. <laughs> uh, I think that's essentially what's going on, yeah. Like, I mean, it, it's, it's, um, I think, I don't really know how else to, to answer that, actually. I think, like, recolonization is, is sort of, I mean, ultimately, I think it's sort of slightly, that campaign that that book is about is, I don't think anyone really, a lot, again, it goes back to the fact that like, people in museums, let's say, don't have bad intentions. I don't think archaeologists have bad intentions a lot of the time either. A lot of people were very serious about the work that was going on. They thought they were doing this for like, you know, this is like a positive action. Yet yeah, like the end result of this um, is this sort of entanglement of things that's going on that creates this recolonized, decolonized <laughs> sort of set of conditions. And I think that's really what we're still living with today. You know, after this campaign, you know, this is really part of the rise of development in the post-war world, the rise of modernization. The 60s were the decades of development. That's what Kennedy calls them. So after this, you kind of see the continual reoccurrence of development money, um, sort of flooding into these disciplines. And it's sort of stuck within this, this catch-22 almost. And I think what we see now with the, the dialogues around decolonization is sort of the same thing happening. And I'm not sure, it's not something that's very easy to escape. And so that's why, you know, I'm quite gloomy and negative <laughs> about it, but I'm a glass half full half yeah, half empty person. I'm not a glass half full per person at all. I'm a glass half empty person. Um, I'd like to be a bit more positive, but I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Lascio allora la parola e l'intero tavolo, direi, alla, al keynote speech che sarà, uh, cui protagonista è una persona che non ha in realtà necessità di grandi presentazioni, Cristian Greco è direttore del Museo Egizio di Torino dal 2014, se non ricordo male, ha curato numerosissimi progetti espositivi in, in diversi paesi dall'Olanda al Giappone alla Finlandia e via dicendo e 
eh, collabora peraltro con numerose università mh, a cui contribuisce con corsi di eh, egittologia, eh, ci presenta eh, adesso una relazione dal titolo Decolonize Egyptology. So, um, it's very difficult to wrap up what we've been talking about uh, the past two days, and uh, I, I will try to wrap up and to sum up some of the issues. I don't have answers. Maybe I will add some more answers and, and see, and try to see, uh, I would like to go a little bit further from where Robin left us yesterday concerning well, is the epistemological and ontological crisis of museums, but is also the epistemological or ontological crisis of our disciplines and of Egyptology in particular. Let's say that Egyptology has many different curses. Well, the first curse is Tutankhamun. Uh, not because the curse of Tutankhamun exists, uh, the opposite, but because of what you see here. This wonderful, the, you see here the external anthropolo anthropological coffin in Cairo, the intermediate coffin, and this gold and treasure hunting to which our discipline has been linked at. This year we are ce celebrating the centennial anniversary of the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun that happened on the 4th of November 1922. Uh, thanks to the uh, archives and the photographs made by Barton and preserved at the Griffith Institute in Oxford, we are able to go back and uh, look at the history of the discovery, where we are confronted with many colonial issues. How was the discovery done? Who were uh, the main people or taking part of? And as we see, are always the people represented, Lord Carnarvon, Howard Carter, uh, Lady Evelyn, and we forget all the time the Ruaza, the chief workman, and the workman up to 100 who did the real work. And do not forget that at the very beginning, Howard Carter was only collaborating with them, and the Ruaza were the ones who had the expertise to go inside the tomb. We've been uh, talking this morning about uh, how archaeology, when we were seeing the Mesopotamia, could have been linked to the way that um, linked to Western media and the way it was uh, communicated. Well, the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun is one of the most or the first excavation completely in hands of Western media. Uh, Lord Carnarvon thought to be very clever in uh, closing a deal with the Times. And it created, of course, one of the most important diplomatic incidents in archaeology that ever happened. Can you imagine the first tomb discovered almost intact, which is another myth, by the way. And that is not true, because the tomb of Tutankhamun was plundered twice in antiquity. But then the rights and the copyright, we would say, of publishing whatever was coming out was given to the Times, creating, of course, a lot of protests by uh, the Egyptians, even Egyptian journalists, who were not allowed to go inside the tomb. And also, in the narrative that we have, in the way we talk about 
uh, whole card, we tend to forget a lot of given facts, like what we see here in this door, that we know that it went inside this room, the antechamber, on the 26th of November um, 1922. It only entered the burial chamber in, uh, uh, in February of 1923, officially, but, uh, of course, on that night, on the 26th of November 1926, it went inside. We have letters, we have uh, the witnesses of Alfred Lucas, and we know what happened. Christina Riggs just devoted uh, two books uh, to uh, the discovery of Tutankhamun, one of which, Photography of Tutankhamun, uh, she, put, um, she analyzes how all this put in stage and this colonial way of presenting the excavation is something that we got accustomed to and completely familiar with. And so we accept this kind of photograph. This is the tomb of Ramses IX, which is just in front of the tomb of uh, Tutankhamun, where, of course, as you see, the uh, poor archaeologists were having uh, lunch and dinner uh, regularly. Of course, the discovery we are talking about the material culture and the effects that the material culture has and the impact that has today are the objects, sorry, um, objects leaving on uh, uh, Dacoville every year to go to Cairo and completely disrupting the museum in Cairo, who was not meant to host so many objects arriving. And so the, we have a complete disruption of the museum itself. We have political issues. For the first time, the excavation was stopped in 1924. We have, for the first time, the Le Services Antiquité that says to Howard Carter that the laws of the country must not be discussed, but must be obeyed. And for the first time, that an inspector uh, has to be present, and those excavating there has to submit a list to be approved by the Antiquity Service in order to solve all of the problems. During the suspension of the excavation in 1924, uh, they go to a legal uh, transaction, and, well, we are still in the colonial period, so there are not Egyptian authorities deciding about it, but the so-called mixed courts, where there are foreigners and Egyptian, decided at the end that um, there was an administrative um, error and that Howard Carter could start again excavating. We are all familiar, and if we look at the literature now, and the lectures that are given, and the touring exhibition, and the museum that is going to open in, uh, to open in Cairo, we are still linked to the very moment. The treasure, the pharaoh that discover, the first pharaoh that is discovered, the gold, the magnificence, that very moment where Howard Carter, and as Christina Rick says, well, a very staged, uh, of course, photographs, uh, of course, is not the very moment when Howard Carter opens it, it has been already open, has already seen what is behind it, but it's set in scene to have the photographs and to realize that the internal shrine was uh, still closed. Well, and then we know the lift, the, the um, uh, lid was lifted, and finally, the word for the first time could see uh, an external anthropological co uh, anthropoid coffin, an intermediate anthropoid coffin, and then still covered by linen. And for most of the people, the story is hands here. Well, we see pictures of Hoakata cleaning, and uh, we have the pictures of the internal coffin with the gillands of flowers, the mask. 1st of November 1925, the beginning of the, the opening of the internal coffin and the taking out of the mummy. And for most of us, the story ends here, in the beautiful mask of Tutankhamun that since 1983 cannot get out of the country, which is a symbol of national identity, to whom a whole new museum will be devoted. But actually, we tend to forget the reality. And... How can we decolonize this discovery? How can we win the syndrome of Tutankhamun? How can we win the syndrome of gold and treasure hunting? Well, I wish I had an answer, uh, but I want to try you 
a trial that we could make. We are doing, at this moment, at the Museo Egizio, um, we try, we said yesterday that it is one of the means that we have sometimes to use contemporary artists to set the questions. And we have a wonderful artist, Salah Salam, who is exhibiting now some works of her in a, a show curated by Paolo Del Vesco, who you met yesterday. And I want you to read now a few words to comment on, on what I want to say or how actually the discovery ended. My right eyes in the evening boat, my left eyes the morning boat. I still remember when you first opened my coffee. First, the first two lines is a part of a prayer which is written on the interior of the mask of Tutankhamun. The rest is Sarah Salam trying to interpret the mummy of Tutankhamun in the very moment where Owa Carter is going inside. I still remember when you first opened my coffee, I heard you say it was a great day in the history of archaeology, and we're still there in that great day of the history of archaeology. I was not sure what that meant, but your voice was full of excitement. After all, you had spent two years working your way into my tomb, two long years of me wondering anxiously about your intentions. You opened my coffee, and the first thing you said was, we have to free the royal mummy. I could feel your grip on my defenseless body as you struggled to lift me up. And I tried to say that I wish not to be freed, I wish not to be freed, but my voice could not be heard. You were disappointed that the resin my family had put into my body was protecting me. The pitch-like material, as you described it, was keeping me attached to my coffin, frustrating you, for you couldn't get hold of my golden mask. And so you dragged my coffin out of my tomb, and you hoped that the heat of the sun would soften my raisin. And here we get the first part of the story. They took out, there were 10 men who had to take out the intermediate and internal coffee, and the coffin, with the mummy inside, was put in the sun, in the Valley of the Kings, 50 degrees, hoping that the raising would melt. It did not melt. The only thing that Carter wrote in his diary is that he could smell again the resin, uh, the, the, the perfume of the raising. You waited and waited, but the sun wished not to betray me. For a brief moment, I thought you would give up and I could return once again to my blissful slumber. Instead, you made the first incision across my chest and began removing layer upon layer my wrappings, wrappings which were once soaked by the tears of those I had left behind. My eyebrows are those of the gods, my forehead is that of the jacket-headed god of the dead. And well, these are again the words of the mask. From feet to my shoulder, you bear me down to my skin. The sound of the tearing and ripping of my linen still haunt my dreams. With every cut you made, I could feel the coldness of your blade. Along with my wrappings, you moved all of the sacred objects that were keeping me safe in my sleep. You labeled, measured, and described them in a minute detail in your journal. And shortly after, you did the same to my bones. But what was not enough, that you, for you were still eager to see my face, a hammer and a chisel. How could you that thought even cross your mind? And I'm, am I to be grateful that you reconsider because of the fragility of my bones? When I saw you hitting your knives, the heat, I could feel the heat, and the knives that were scratching my coffin and scraping through my mask and back of my head, I prayed for the raisin not to melt, but the heat, it could not refuse to comply. And so you finally freed me out of my coffin and out of my mask. And finally, I looked at you looking at me. You did not flinch when you began to cut through my neck. My severe head you held in your hands. You propped it upright, mounted in a wooden plank, and began to make it a new, undignified death mask to me. Refine and culture, you wrote, as one of your last remarks, before leaving me for a year, unwrapped, alone, and alienated in my now empty tomb. I closed my eyes and continued to pray. My right eye is the evening boat, my left eye is the morning boat, my eyebrows are those of the gods, my forehead is that of the jackal-headed god of the dead. The back of my neck is that of the falcon god of the sky, my fingers are those of the wise god of the moon, and the locks of my hair are those of the creator god, maker of all things. So this is again, is the prayer inside the mask. What we understand and what we know is that it couldn't get rid of the of the body. The, 
he tried uh, pouring wax on it to try to unwrap it orderly. At the end, he had to not only to dissect uh, Tutankhamun, but to dig it up. And when we go to the Cairo Museum, and we all do, and I do also, also all the time, we're completely flabbergasted by the wonderful jewels we see in that, and it's one of the most beautiful objects that has remained from, uh, uh, from antiquity. We forget that there's meant this, this memory of Tutankhamun. We forget that their arms has to be taken apart because otherwise all the jewels could not come back. We forget that it was decapitated and we have photos of the head of Tutankhamun on a pedestal as if it was a statue and also Barton the year after was so ashamed of what had happened that um, he wrapped in linen the neck so that nobody could see that it was unwrapped. And then, according to Howard Carter, the mummy had to go back and finally rest in peace. But when the Second World War broke out, tourists did not go to Egypt anymore. In the, from 1942, in Gurna there was a pandemic of malaria, and then probably some people we don't know went inside the tomb and violated the mummy again. So when it was opened in 1968 for a, a BBC documentary, there were parts of the body of Tutankhamun who could not be found anymore. And the mummy was put inside again. Um, it was recomposed, but it didn't, it, shouldn't, it didn't have the rest one wished it could because when scientific analysis came in, DNA came in, um, MRI scan, X-rays, and so the poor body of Tutankhamun is still there. Is the curse of Tutankhamun over? Well, well, I'll come back to that at the end of my lecture. So the first problem in Egyptology is the syndrome of Tutankhamun and how can we get rid of it somehow and put it in the right place. The second problem that we have is what Ian Hoder calls entangledness. Uh, I take this uh, picture from the book of uh, Hayen Hoder, Entangled. This is a place, Lepinski Vira in the Balkan, is uh, a place of hunter and gatherers, where you see the, how people interact, of course, in their society, but there is a disruptive element, which is a piano. How could a piano be put there? How could a piano function in a um, hunter and gatherer society? There is a problem of time, of succession of objects. And the problem of time is something that we have to deal with all the time in our museums and in archaeological sites. So when we see uh, we are in Karnak, we see different layers of belonging to different periods. Here we are from the temple of Khonsu. We are looking north and we look at the column of Taharq of the 25th dynasty. On your right, we have uh, the first pylon uh, made by Ptolemy VIII. On the other hand, we have the uh, first uh, pylon of Nectanibo. When we look at the rediscovery by the west of Egypt, um, sometimes we overlook important things. Like here is a table of the description de l'Egypte during the, what we should call, military campaign occupation of Egypt, uh, special military operation, we would say nowadays. Um, is it right that we call it campaign only, the Napoleonic campaign? We never stress the fact that it was a military occupation. And what we tend to forget when we see here, because we have the syndrome of the objects and the syndrome of the pharaonic object that have to be detached from the rest, we forget that here we still see the medieval Luxor. And we see it even clearer when we look at the a photograph made by Maxime Ducamp in uh, um, 1848. From 1848 to 1850, there was the first photographic expedition to Egypt led by Maxime Ducamp together with Gustave Flaubert. And they went uh, to Egypt to document what they saw. And here we see clearly within the temples and around the temples antiquities much uh, later of the medieval times. And when we look around the temple, we see that there are still 
uh, pieces written in Latin like this. There are 300 texts in Greek of Prosnecunis' texts, so paying respect to Amun and to uh, uh, Caesar. We forget that the name Luxor is the plural of Caser, and that Caser is a Roman name, Castrum, uh, and that is, means, means a military camp. We forget that it was a military camp of the time of Diocletian, and Wilkinson documented in the um, first half of the 50s, of 200, uh, in the 19th century, the uh, wonderful frescoes that were decorating the inside chambers. And when all of this has gone, but has gone because of Egyptology, because of these frescoes, which were the largest frescoes of late Roman time, uh, belonging to the 301 and 302, were detached by Egyptologists in order to find what was below it. And what was below it was, of course, the decoration of Amenhotep III. So here it starts already the pharaonic value of ancient Egypt above all the rest. But the, in the entangledness in something, of course, that goes on to our days. This is taken from the Temenos of um, the um, temple of Karnak, looking south, and we see the rest of the sphinxes among the living people. When we cross the river and we go to western Thebes, this entangledness between antiquities and modernity was very perceivable. Modernity, 200 years of history, where there were the documentation of the Hajj, the sacred journey to, uh, uh, to Mecca, documented outside of the tombs. And I was there in 2006, where Samir Faraj ordered that Luxor had to become the first and most important open-air museum, where there was a huge problem for an open-air museum. You couldn't have modernity, you couldn't have Egyptians living in there. And I was assisting at the moment where Egyptians were asked to take out all their belongings from the houses to wait until a bulldozer will come over and destroy their, um, their belongings. And so when the revolution came and rubble was all around and uh, it took years before the Egyptian authority authorized the American Research Center in Egypt to take out the rubbles and to, um, uh, to, to, uh, to document, actually, through the excavation of the rubbles, what has been destroyed. And the people were literally deported 10 kilometers to um, the north. When I went around to my, uh, with my, um, one of my uh, chief um, collaborators when I was working at Epigraphic Survey at the Rental Institute of Chicago, uh, Badawi Abdurazu, we were looking around where his house was and his memory was, which is gone. Because this was the image of Guna in 2006, and this is the image of the village now completely gone. And it was interesting that while this was happening, nobody would talk about it, but there were meetings and symposia held in Luxor with the title Conservation and Managing Egypt's Cultural Heritage. There was only one critical voice in the New York Times, and I want to read you, with you some passages. The long avenue of sphinxes that connected Luxor and Karnak Temple is being excavated in great haste, even where it passes under major areas of the city. Many of the sphinxes are so badly damaged they are unrecognizable, raising the question as to the value of the whole operation. This excavation has necessitated the destruction of yet more buildings and the relocation of even more people. And well, not many sphinxes like this were found. The question in the minds of many concerns the real cost of all these changes. Certainly, tourism is a very important part of the Egyptian economy. Certainly, facilitating the flow of tourists is also important to the generation of revenue. But what is left of a southern Egyptian city when you rip out the houses and shops to make traffic flow more speedily and the process of touring more efficient? The sound of bulldozers and wrecking machines can be heard every day as they go about their business. How this massive campaign of destruction affects the life of neighborhoods seems not to have been taken into consideration. It seems that some idea of modernism has ruled. For whatever reason, one can watch and see how old Luxor is disappearing, and now it has disappeared. I will come back to Luxor in a moment. 
let's go to museums because problems is not, of course, only on sites but on museums. We've been discussing a lot in the past few days how can we decolonize museums and what is the root of the modern European museums. In 2009, I was then enthusiastic when I first went to the British Museum to see the opening of the Enlightenment Room, where uh, it was shown how in the well, beginning, actually, of colonialism and imperialism, the need to create a universal museum where the material encyclopedia of the past generation could inform how one should ask the right question about human existence. In museum, it has happened very often that Egyptian objects have been isolated completely from one context. This is a wonderful uh, noise museum in Berlin with the um, work of uh, Chipperfield as an architect and Professor Wildum was responsible of the uh, new um, exhibitions uh, galleries. But what you see here is Egypt is art. Egypt is art and Egypt is as the core of our civilization because normally in a museum, Egyptian and Mesopotamian antiquities are put before Greece and Rome, so the very well celebration of the West. That's why, and we discussed it yesterday, it's very problematic to talk about ethnographic museum. Why has been Egypt admitted into the Antiquities Museum while Mesoamerica and uh, African antiquity and Asian antiquities cannot find their place there? Because, of course, it's a celebration of our own identity, of our own culture, where Egypt is the four or foremost part of it. Egypt appropriated by the ancient Greece, Greek, already remember Plato in the, the Legibus, Plato in the seventh letter to um, Dionysius, where he says that Egypt has to be respected and Egyptian art has to be admitted because it is highly allegorical and so very ancient indeed. And Plato says it's already 10,000 years old. In the attempt to have a shift, an epistemological shift, we're not talking mostly of museum of ancient Egyptian culture. We're talking about museum of ancient art. And we see, the, uh, for instance, uh, the very beginning of the museum in uh, Munich, where we don't even see uh, Egyptian und Papyrus Sammlung, but we read all art as being contemporary. Very interesting indeed. The word art does not exist in ancient Egyptian, and we do not know names of very very few of ancient Egyptian artists. We don't have artists like in Greek vascular uh, painting saying epoise or egrapse. It was indeed in Turing that the father of Egyptology, Jean-Francois Champollion, in this gallery said, well, an history of ancient Egyptian art exists. We tend to forget though that in our view of Egyptology, we are focusing on people who are trained as classicists and approach with their view as classicists to ancient Egypt. And they created the myth of ancient Egypt. What do we do nowadays when we do an Egyptian exhibition? And these are some pictures from the Museo Egizio in Turin. In the very moment when we put the coffin of Bute Amon into a showcase, we are doing a huge epistemological interpretation. We don't need to add a label. We are saying that that coffin is a work of art. We are forgetting what that coffin was. We are not transparent. We do not say that the reason why we have funerary material culture in our museum is because Egyptologists were interested in finding precious objects because we have the curse of Tutankhamun. We wanted to find the gold and precious objects. And where did you find them? In tombs, in tombs which were built of stones, while um, everyday architectures was of perishable material. And we forget to say that what we have in museum represent less than the 2% of the elite population of ancient Egypt. We forget to say then that we are presenting material culture coming from the elite necropolis, and from ba based on that, we have the arrogance to say we are presenting Egypt. 
We have presented a partial view of Egypt. I always tell my students, how would it be if in 2,000 years from now, an archaeology would excavate only the archive of Vatican City and based on that would recreate the history of Rome? Would that a true history of Rome? But why are we not so transparent? And then we're even uh, doing um, a kind of, um, we are springing, we are obsessed by material culture because we have so many objects, but then we do as if we are not interested in the material culture and we use them as means in order to interpret what we miss, which is the life and mind of the ancients. Has been wonderfully shown uh, before me, and um, I really thank Nora for her wonderful uh, presentation. But unfortunately, in our museums, most of the time, the way the Egyptians are represented is only this the, the Egyptian are the workman force. And as Stephen Kirk said, they are the hidden hands whose name we do not mention. We only mention the name of those who we excavated, and we do not mention them. Then there is another huge problem which is the problem we tend to recreate context, but objects are separated. I give you only one example that we have of a tomb. We have two layers of a tomb using the Romicide period, reused in the Roman period, and we have this tomb discovered in 1819 dispersed all over Europe, including the small mummy of Petamenophis, housed in Turin, his aunt is in Leiden, his grandparents are in London, his parents are in uh, Paris, and his siblings and cousins are in Berlin. And of course, the tomb is in Egypt. So, and this is what we are facing all, all the time. The scattering, what we call the Zecta Membra, happened in the past, but it's going on now as well. Also because of the huge development of uh, new museums in Egypt, in, in Egyptian museological landscape, and I'll come back to that in a moment. I go very briefly uh, through this, because it's been presented yesterday by Paolo, but of course we have the huge ethical issues of human remains. We uh, prefer not to present um, this is material from uh, the National Museum of Antiquities in Leiden. Uh, there are the very beginning of the formation of the collections where all museums have. Uh, we also have in Turin, you have piece of bodies where people would go inside the tombs and for instance, detach hands to bring them back because they were uh, jewels or detach heads because you had this golden covering or having the first uh, <coughs> fakes like on the 21st of August 1771, where the first unwrapping of a mummy in front of the royal court in The Hague took place, but then, uh, well, it was already a fake and people were very disappointed. Do we think that from the very beginning everybody was so impressed by Egyptian art? Well, not really. Uh, Johann Winkelmann in the Geschichte der Kunst der Altersums says, and, and, and Goethe, already Winkelmann says that he, uh, he was really against Egyptian art because it was primitive and it, was, it had not the value of Greek and Roman art. But Goethe said, Ich hasse die Ägypten und alles, was mit ihnen in Zusammenhang gebracht wird. And well, in the late 18th century, you have these depictions, this is the Monument Egyptian from antiquities present in Rome, and you see how Egyptian antiquities were shown. Uh, it, it, it seems like reading uh, Plutarch, uh, those Egyptians were worshipping the animals, and those animals are so wild, and in the meantime, in the anatom anatomic rendering of the statues, we have this classical glass they are wearing. Let's go back to Napoleon, to uh, the, um, his military campaign or occupation in Egypt, and his documentation. We uh, go to Luxor, we are seeing the Temple of Dendera, Edfu. Oh, no, we went a little bit too quickly. Let's me, let me go back. So now you already know what's coming. Uh, so, uh, temple of Philae, and well, of course, La Description de l'Egypte, which uh, the first volume published 
in 1809, who became a kind of bestseller, and many museums bought also this kind of furniture, which is a reproduction of the Temple of Dendera, where uh, has to house the knowledge of ancient Egypt. We all celebrate this year the 200th anniversary of the decipherment of hieroglyphs uh, and the lecture of uh, Jean-Francois Champollion on the 27th of September 1822, um, um, which was then published as a lettre à Monsieur Dacier. Um, we also have um, uh, a little notebook of Champollion when he when was 17 in the way he tried to understand hieroglyphs. In that very time, our image of Egypt was finally formed. Orientalism, look at this picture. This is a, a painting of Angelelli, house in Florence, where we see seated Champollion and standing Ippolito Rossellini. It's the time of the Franco um, Tuscan um, expedition to Egypt. Their words concerning Egyptians were terrible. Egyptians were, were the ones who were destroying their cultural heritage, but we tend to forget that was um, Champollion and Rossellini who decided from the, the tomb of Seti I, found intact, to cut out part of the reliefs who were uh, there to bring them, one in Paris and one to Florence. But they write in their diary, among the first visitors to Egypt were collectors who found that the population at the time, for religious reasons, held little regard for the relics of its pagan past. The dispersion of uh, cultural heritage in Egypt is something that has been going on uh, for a long time. Only with the UNESCO Convention and the 1983 uh, subscription by Egypt, antiquities cannot leave the country but Egypt has been pillaged uh, in the last 200 years. In 1891, one of the big cachettes was found. Uh, we know two major cachettes, one found in 1881, the one of Deir al-Bakhri with the tombs of the pharaohs, and in 1891 was the cachette with the um, coffins of the high priests of Amun and their families. We only have two drawings uh, made by Layard that show the very moment it's very nice to know that the Egyptian population in the village, while the coffins were being transported into the Nile, they came out to salute their kings that were leaving the valley for the last times. And this is uh, some drawings made by Lady Blockerhaus, who was present during the discovery. Lady Blockerhaus, who wrote in her notes that the dealing with antiquities and taking out antiquities from Egypt is forbidden but it gives us kind of an excitement when you succeed in bringing them out and bringing them to Europe. And here we see dressed in green Lady Blocker House at the very moment of the unwrapping of uh, the mummies of Abba Gazus uh, in the museum with the um, anatomy pathologist Philippe Poto. And uh, because of that unwrapping, we lost all the mummies. Now we have only some bones that have been found back in some crates at the hospital of Kazar Aini. But I wanted to show you this because we have a list of dismembering of uh, what has been found because the collection went to 17's museum. In 1893, Helmi, Helmi Habas II was crowned king of Egypt and all of those who went to the crowning were given a gift by Egypt, among them Italy, uh, and every country was given 104 objects. Nowadays, we not only have 17 lots of Baba Gazus, but they are divided in more than 44 countries in five continents. And uh, I don't want to go back in details because we discussed yesterday about what should we do with human remains, but all Egyptian collections are dealing with human remains, either in display or in storage, and when you put them in storage, you do not have uh, solved the solution. The ICOM uh, code of 2004, signed in Seoul, gives some instruction about how one should acquire, research, conserve, study, 
and uh, put in storage human remains, and also the fact that every museum should deal with a policy concerning human remains. How, and we heard yesterday from Robin that um, a museum is a means which is not so useful maybe to deal with the information, to put research and education at first and to share knowledge with the public. I want to show you some uh, example of a museum which is not a, an Egyptological museum, but is one of the most important museums in Sweden, in Stockholm, housing um, objects, uh, well, the treasure of the Vikings. How do we deal with human remains? Well, in a kind of different way, they want to really bring the message right away and to put the bones together with photographs of nowadays living uh, sweets of the same age. And to me it was one of the most, uh, well, one of the museums that really made me think for the first time because all in a sudden you relate what you see to an age, a face, and uh, uh, professionally family bounds. We all make typologies and typologies, and then we write books in saying pots are not people. But do we really tell this to the public? I was wondering many times, how can we tell that we find objects that belong to different periods, belong to different strata, that give us chronology, but this not necessarily tell us the evolution of humankind. Well, the first museum I found that was very successful in doing this is, again, the same museum in Stockholm, where often showing this axis, they show brushes and toothbrushes and cleaning brushes and saying, can we classify based on that nowadays Swedish? No, we can't. And it's the first museums that really put out very clearly something that every Egyptian museum should do, uh, the following text, who tell us about the things we do not find, the things that our archaeologists have saved in the museum's collection say more, perhaps, about those who collected and sorted them than about those who once lived with and used these objects, who chooses what is to be kept. Is it, for example, more important to collect weapons than everyday objects? This room forms a representation of the gaps in the museum collection. All those things people have chosen not to save or that were not preserved in the ground. Those responsible for collecting and sorting have throughout history more often been white, well-educated men, most likely with both money and status. How can these be seen in the collections? The empty room represents all the things which barely exist in the collection. There might be organic material or that which belong to children, women or the elderly. There might be ordinary, everyday things, the possession of the poor, the ugly, the insignificant materials, that which is seldom prioritized during excavation and collection, or that which we do not understand or cannot relate to. And how can you explain that? Well, with an empty showcase. And an empty showcase sometimes is what we should do. And we should stop saying how big our collections are, how representative we are of a, on an ancient Egyptian civilization. We shouldn't stop to say that in a museum you meet Egypt. You meet a collective memory done by the museum based on the limited material culture that you have at disposal. And this is the message we should give. There is a museum, in my view, who has addressed the problem of contexting um, material culture and colonization in the most wonderful way. Literature talks uh, profoundly about it and is the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg. In a very significant way, it makes you realize what it means, what Apartheid means, what it means to have a colonial structure, and it does in a very simple way. When you go and buy the ticket, you can have two tickets, blancas of neat blancas, white or not white. And when you have a ticket for not white, and you go inside the museum, nobody tells you anything, but when you ask, 
you try to go to the toilet and they stop you. And if you have a not white ticket, you cannot go inside. Or you want to go to the cafeteria, and if you have a not white ticket, you cannot go to the cafeteria. Or you want to sit down, and if you have a not white ticket, you cannot sit down. That's a very hard lesson that for the visitor only lasts for one hour, but it makes you think of what apartheid could be. Of course, uh, now I give you some images of uh, the uh, Freedom Park of Pretoria, the largest museum is a legacy of, um, um, of the late president, that uh, Mandela, that wanted to show and to reverse perspective. The center of the world is South Africa, and from here the civilization developed worldwide. How can we have another view? It's also significant because till the Grand Egyptian Museum will be finished, the Freedom Park in Pretoria is the largest museum in the um, African uh, soil. It's still interesting though, uh, because as we reach then the solution, is this the perfect, the colonized museum? I was struck while visiting South Africa to notice something. In the Freedom Park in Pretoria, all the people work are of color. But there is the Fort Trekker monument in Pretoria, the monument of the pioneers, where all the people working are white. So even the story you tell is still a divide within the museological landscape, something to think about. And of course, is the celebration of the occupation of uh, the Buren, or what the Dutch have done, and uh, till the uh, development. Going to conclusion, I would like to ask ourselves, are we moving away from the Enlightenment um, taxonomic museum where we do typologies in order to have specimens of all categories so that we can better understand and have informed information? Are we trying to make a, a museum a research and education uh, place where learn, remember, and act are means in order to uh, increase our cultural knowledge? Are we really making the museum participatory, like Nina Simon asks? Uh, are we really putting the matter of making museum at the center of our discourse? Well, some doubts. We tried. We tried in 2019 in, trying in, in Kyoto to approve the new definition of museum that I want to reread because it was not approved. Uh, the head of ICOM had to resign and now we approved another definition, which is quite far from what was written here. But let me read it to you. Museums are democratizing, inclusive, and polyphonic spaces for critical dialogue about the pasts and the futures, acknowledging and addressing the conflicts and challenges of the present by hold artifacts and specimens in trustful society, safeguard diverse memories for future generations, and guarantee equal rights and equal access to heritage for all people. Museums are not-for-profit, they are participatory and transparent, and work in active partnership with and for diverse communities to collect, preserve, research, interpret, exhibit, and enhance understanding of the world, aiming to contribute to human dignity and social justice, global equality, and planetary well-being. Museum, in other hands, should not be seen detached from society. Museums have to address social inequalities. Museum is a place where equal rights and equal access to culture and cultural democracy and cultural participation has to be enhanced. Museums have to take into account how the demographic and the community is built. The museum has a role in a new society. Well, after the lecture of Robin yesterday, we might wonder that, but when we might wonder whether the new society and the new model, the model of uh, society is really in crisis and our epistemological means maybe should be reconsidered altogether. The museum, and we have seen yesterday, Robin has showed us, cannot be any way detached by environmental sustainability and the questions that comes from uh, society. And then I want to use this word that might be, seems uh, harsh, 
but it's what museums are doing. They are using the past to build the future, and let's say to build the, the present. We shouldn't be so naive to think that we do not have an agenda. We have an agenda. Sometimes we don't know to realize what our agenda is. Yesterday we heard many times what is the economic agenda. In this country, in Italy, the economics have been at the basis of the development of museums over the last few years. Has been We have uh, over and over again read in the news and the newspaper that museums are the oil of Italy because the museum will solve the economic problems of the country. So economics and involvement of society Moreover, involving foreign tourists who can come and pay is the agenda that we have. And this agenda is used nowadays, of course, also in Egypt, and we have seen not only in Egypt. So it's something that from the West is going elsewhere, and so we are using the, the past to build, first of all, a present and to build a vision of future. Hali Sherry whose um, um, work of art you see here on your right, on your left, um, has been, uh, is a Franco-Lebanese um, artist, has been criticizing very often archaeology and museums. He says that museums kill the objects. Yeah, you see the pharaoh eagle on the pass is hovering over objects coming from the uh, eastern part of the Mediterranean, from Anatolia, Syria, the Levant, Egypt, Cyprus, Indonesia, and Peru. They've been bought on the legal market in the past few years, and they're exhibited in a light table. The light table kills the, uh, the contest, kills the biography of the object, detach the object from uh, the environment they come from and deprives us of the possibility to be informed. Nowadays, in Cairo, uh, there are full preparations for what will be the most amazing, the greatest museum in the world, the biggest museum in the world, the Grand Egyptian Museum, is indeed a pharaonic building. When you go inside, even Ramses II, taken from Madame Rassis, um, well, is almost disappearing in the hugeness of this building. And money also here still play, plays a role, of course. Uh, we, uh, Egypt is expecting millions of tourists to come back. A new airport has been built next to the museum, so that tourists do not need to go to Cairo. They can land there, go to the museum, take a plane, and go back to Hurghada or Sharm el Sheikh or wherever we're having holidays. You see the Egyptian flag, of course, but also the Japanese flag, because Japan has given one billion dollars to Egypt as a loan for uh, the building of this uh, museum. The museum that will have a monumental star case of 32 um, steps with the kings of Egypt, and at the end of this staircase, you will look at the pyramid. So is pharaonic Egypt and this importance. This is happening to the most important museum, which will be built in Egypt and to the world, most awaited museum. Probably head of states and crown heads of all the world will be invited for the inauguration because is um, it will be a event like the um, was the opening of the Suez Canal. But what's happening on the ground? Because we have museums, uh, we have material culture, but we have the monuments. I told you, I showed you at the very beginning what was happening in Luxor. How is it Luxor nowadays? The Sphinx Alley has been finished. Now you can go paying twice a ticket from Luxor to Karnak, you can walk on, you can take the train to go through. A lot of the sphinxes have not been found. Please look at this, so you see the avenue completely cutting into the city of Luxor. Imagine what it means for people living there. But look at this avenue, and I will show you the same place how it was in 2006. Here there was the minaret the oldest minaret of Upper Egypt of the 9th century, which, and I show you again, has been demolished in order to make way to the path leading Luxor and Karnak, because what counts is pharaonic ancient past. I even devoted an exhibition to that, 
to um, to make people think how um, what is cultural heritage and what we have to divide. We were discussing this morning with Simona. It happens everywhere. Isolating the monuments has happened, of course, uh, in uh, um, Italy, has happened in Luxor very recently. And in creating this avenue, you are putting away the local population and creating a place for tourists. Tourists want to see pharaonic ancient Egypt. Well, of course, then it was rather disappointing because not so many sphinxes turned out. And so now when you walk through the alley, you start seeing a strange object. And then you approach it and it becomes even more strange. It's a reconstruction of the bark of Amun, which was built, uh, which was put in there and was used during the inauguration at the present of His Excellency the President. While we're wondering whether a museum should still exist as an epistemological means, in the Emirates, they already opened and built the Museum of the Future. I went there two weeks ago hoping to see how the museum will be in the future. I can tell you, well, you will have to go and have a look. There is no, not an answer for the time being. You, only, um, you are more in a Star Trek environment and you uh, wake up in 2071 and, uh, and you can reach the moon, all this kind of thing. It was something else I was hoping, given that this museum was uh, cost one billion. In Abu Dhabi, they are working hard to build the Zayed Museum. They opened the uh, Museum de Louvre, they are, open, they are building the Zayed Museum with the House of Abraham, uh, they are opening the uh, cranes on the right are the cranes for uh, the Guggenheim and uh, next to the Louvre also the Museum of Natural History will be developed. We have a new museum insel which has just been built in front of our eyes. Jean-Luc Amsel, uh, who is a cultural anthropologist, French cultural anthropologist, has been heavily criticizing the experiment in the Louvre. And I want to end showing you what Walid Rad did about it. A work of art where it says, does it make sense nowadays to build again a universal museum? Is a universal museum a symbol of imperialism and colonialism? Why do we want now in the region to build universal museums? And what is that you want to project? Why and who is why do we build these museums? Is again a showing off of money, thus power, and who is, who is the kind of visitors we want to have? It was very interesting to read a um, interview of the director of the Louvre in Abu Dhabi because he says that his uh, what he wants to see as visitors are foreigners and Emiratis, but in the Emirates, we also have more than 7 million uh, workers that work there from Pakistan, from India. Are they part of the museum? Not in the official policy. Is this new colonialism, a new segregation, a new development of a cultural uh, way of thinking? Well, Walid Rad and Jean-Luc Amsel really criticized the uh, idea, and Walid Rad made in a, a very iconic representation what happened. He says, actually, that the works left the Louvre in Paris, arrived in uh, Abu Dhabi, and once they opened the crates and took out the objects, the objects changed shapes, because the objects did not realize where they were anymore. Well, we still have to work and think what the museum of the future will be, there is a long way to go for our field of Egyptology. I think that the only answers that we have, the only means that we have, is research. Um, research in different fields, not only uh, research, of course, in archaeology, art history, and architecture, but it's also in social sciences and philosophers and historians are those figures that we do need in museum in the near future. And something that the museum lacks completely is to be transparent 
and to say that actually in the museum you don't find a representation of an ancient civilization, you find the construction of memory given by the objects kept in museum. Thank you. try to, to learn from each other, and I really hope that these two days um, w w was, a, was a tentative to, to, to sow seeds, and that uh, in the future there will be the possibility to, to have uh, new exchanges and to have new confrontation, because what we have tried to do is to problematize the question of uh, using object, interpreted history, and uh, especially uh, constructed in relations uh, about and through objects. And I think uh, this was um, the themes uh, of these two days. And um, I really want to thank you, uh, and I was very happy to, uh, that you have the possibility to join us here in L'Aquila, and uh, I hope there will be, in the future, a uh, new possibility of exchanges. Yes, that's definitely the start of a conversation, I hope. Um, between different um, scholars from different um, disciplines, but also, I would say, um, professionals like museums, curators, and directors. So we're very happy that we, we could bring all these different uh, scholars and researchers together. And yes, that's definitely the start of something, we hope. And thank you so much for being here and um, bringing the conversation to new new levels and new uh, perspectives. So thank you so much again. Um, I think we can maybe stop the streaming now because we will give some information about dinner. So <laughs> thank you so much also for listening uh, online.